Good morning, uh, or good afternoon, or perhaps good evening, depending on where you are uh, viewing uh, today. Uh, to ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for um, coming here or tuning in to this uh, event at the Hudson Institute uh, in coordination with the Free Nations of Post-Russia. Uh, this is the sixth, and the sixth uh, Free Nations of Post-Russia Forum. Uh, this time here in the United States, it's the first uh, event of its kind here in the United States. And we have quite a day lined up with a wide range of, of speakers. So it's going to be uh, a marathon, uh, not a sprint, uh, as we uh, have different points of view, uh, different opinions, different policy prescriptions, different ideas from a diverse set of individuals um, across the, uh, the Eurasian landmass. Uh, so it's a, it's a great honor to welcome the speakers and the participants of the sixth uh, Free Nations of Post-Russia Forum. I understand that after a couple of days here in DC, uh, the forum will continue um, in Philadelphia and then in New York City. So that's a, a fantastic itinerary. Uh, I, I, of course, wish you the best of luck with that. But here we have serious business to, to deal with. Um, my name is Luke Coffey. I'm a fellow here at Hudson. Uh, I will be speaking later this afternoon. But I will first, um, before we kick off, I would, I'll first be turning over the microphone to my colleague, Kennedy Lee, who is uh, our assistant here. And she will explain the, the rules, the ground rules for uh, today's event. Uh, Kennedy, over to you. Thanks. Thank you very much, Luke, and welcome everybody to the Hudson Institute. So here are our few ground rules for this morning's event. First of all, there will be four speakers in person on the stage at the same time. So after these four in-person speakers go, we will switch and have the next four in-person morning speakers take the stage. Second, I have a timer here on the moderator's table. You should be able to see it, but if you have any issues, please let me know. Third, I will hold up this yellow paddle when you have five minutes left of your presentation. Each speaker gets 15 minutes, and I will hold up the red paddle when you have two minutes left. <laughs> and for our online speakers, um, our Hudson team will message you in the chat when you have five minutes remaining of your talk and two minutes remaining as well. And then also, if there are is time left in the 15 minutes for each speaker, we will be taking questions and answers from the audience, and I will um, assist as the moderator for that as well. So please just raise your hands, and we should get your questions in. Um, but with that, we will begin this morning session. Our first speaker is Janusz Bagos Bagoski. Uh, he is a senior fellow at the Jamestown Foundation here in Washington, D.C., and author of the book, Field State, A Guide to Russia's Rapture. Janusz, thank you. You have 15 minutes. Okay, I better speak fast. Thank you very much. And thank you, Luke. Uh, thank you, uh, Hudson, for organizing, for getting everybody together, uh, both in person and virtually. Uh, as I've only got 15 minutes, I'll try and, I'll try and be as brief as possible. Uh, I titled my comments, uh, Seize the Historic Moment, uh, to reflect what I believe are, are crucial times we are now witnessing and in which we can all play a vital role. Russia's failing war in Ukraine and the increasing isolation of Moscow's imperial regime from Europe and the rest of the democratic world provides, I believe, a unique opportunity to make sure that the empire never strikes back and never rises again. And I'm gonna outline four points about this historic opportunity and why it is imperative to manage the rupture and disintegration of the last empire in Eurasia. First, Ukraine's victory is imperative as a trigger for Russia's imperial collapse. The conditions for state rupture are exacerbated by war as young men die unnecessarily for the regime as military losses reveal the incompetence and corruption of Russia's ruling elite, as the economy contracts and is increasingly throttled by international sanctions, as the budget tightens and defense expenditures suck money and resources from the regions, and spending on essential social services, wages, and pensions will plummet this year. Public grievances will intensify over sharp, sharply rising poverty levels, stark socioeconomic inequalities, 
and deteriorating local infrastructure. Additionally, in the National Republic's anger will be fueled by intensifying Russification and the destruction of ethnic identities. Moscow is an exploiting colonial metropolis that has failed to provide either security or welfare to its subjects. Ukraine's military victory will also demonstrate that Russia's claimed borders are transient. The invasion demonstrates that the Kremlin does not respect the international borders of neighboring states, but this imperial policy will boomerang on Russia itself as the country's external and internal borders become increasingly disputed by numerous republics, regions, and neighbors. The loss of occupied Crimea and three Ukrainian oblasts officially annexed by Moscow will symbolically and practically demonstrate that Russia is losing territory. Other regions can also free themselves from Moscow's control as re regime capacities weaken in holding together the diverse and unwieldy Russian state. My second point, I only have four, so this is my second. Societies and nations seeking freedom from Russia must accelerate their activism both at home and abroad. On the international arena, it is crucial for independent voices beyond the narrow Moscow-centric liberal opposition to bring their message to America, to all European states, and to all countries that will acquire new neighbors, including Turkey, Georgia, Azerbaijan, Kazakhstan, Mongolia, Japan, and Canada. As the Free Nations Forum expands, it will require offices in several capitals to accommodate representatives from numerous republics and regions. The local chapters will need to connect and advocate at all levels, with governments, legislatures, civil groups, diaspora organizations, business, media, religious organizations, and educational and cultural networks. My third point, the key message to Western leaders is that encouraging regions and republics to cooperate in designing a post-Russia will help minimize the violent disintegration that many in the West fear. The regime in Moscow may promote violence, but the nations trapped inside Russia want to live in freedom and in peace with each other. Preparations to recognize the independence of new states seeking freedom, democracy, self-determination, and international cooperation are fully in line with Western values and interests. The Free Nations Forum must focus its message in Western capitals on the positive outcome of Russia's rupture. As Moscow turns inward, its capacity for foreign aggression will diminish. A shrinking Moscovite state under intense international sanctions with a collapsing budget and escalating internal pressures will have severely reduced capabilities to attack its neighbors. Its ability to entangle Europe in energy dependence, to engage in political corruption, to spread disinformation, they will all be cur curtailed. NATO's eastern flank from the Arctic to the Black Sea will become more secure and enhance economic development, business investment, and regional cooperation. Ukraine, Georgia, and Moldova can regain their occupied territories and petition for EU and NATO integration without fear of Russia's reaction. Without the heavy hand of Moscow, Belarus can, Belarus secure, can its secure its independence, build a democracy, build a democracy and, develop and develop productive relations, relations with its neighbors. Above all, Above all with open with support, open from, support the West, from the West for pluralism, for pluralism, democracy, and the sovereignty of republics and regions, Russia's citizens will realize that they are not globally isolated. Families will no longer have to send their sons to die for the Kremlin's ambitions and watch their living, watch their standards, living standards plummet. Citizens also need information that Moscow suppresses, especially the advantages of forming new states that cultivate peaceful and productive relations with all neighbors. And my fourth and last point, I would say the most effective way to prevent any imperial resurgence by Moscow is for is Western, for states, Western to states to recognize the, re the independence of all republics and regions that seek statehood. Emerging states can become new allies for Western and Eastern democracies, whether across the Atlantic, the Pacific, or the Arctic Oceans. 
American leaders American should, leaders not, should fear not fear the collapse of a failed, failed empire, empire, but embrace, but embrace it, as it as an opportunity to, in, to in, intensify multinational cooperation, cooperation to open, new, open markets, new markets, and to help emerging, to help emerging democracies, democracies develop. to develop. Transatlanticism, Transatlanticism can embrace, can embrace Ingria, Karelia, Karelia Kuban, Circassia, Ingushetia, Chechnya, Dagestan, Kalmykia, Astrakhan, Tatarstan, Bashkortostan, Udmurtia, Kuvashia, Mari El, and other republics cry and oblast that seek independence and inclusion in Western multinational institutions. Transpacificism can embrace Primorsky, Khabarovsk, Amur, Saka, Buryatia, Kirkutsk, Tuva, Sakhalin, Kamchatka, Chukotka, and other republics, krais, and oblasts, and okrugs, seeking close and independent diplomatic, political, economic, and institutional ties with the states of the Pacific Rim. Transarcticism, can embrace Nenetsia, Komi, Yamala Nenetsia, Kantimansi, Evenkia, Sakya, Chukotka, and other republics, Krais, Oblasts, and Okrugs, seeking to establish direct diplomatic, economic, and cultural ties with the Arctic states and with substates, including the United States, Canada, Nunavut, Greenland, Denmark, Norway, Sweden, and Finland. I'll end on that. Thank you all. Uh, for coming. Thank you to forum participants. Thank you for the organizers. And I do believe that the time has come to seize this historic moment. Thank you. Thank you, Janusz. We have about seven minutes for questions. Any questions from the audience? Yes. Actually, there's a mic coming. Look, uh, I'm Ilya Panamarev uh, from Congress of People's Deputies. So uh, my question is the following. Here in this town, there is a great fear of collapse of Russia. Uh, and uh, for uh, many people, I would, uh, I would have to say uh, this uh, idea of collapse in Russia looks even a greater evil than uh, the uh, military victory of Ukraine uh, at, at the field of war. Uh, people are really scared of the chaos and uh, instability and the nukes and, uh, and the China and uh, everything, you know. Um, uh, to my mind, all those fears, they are way exaggerated, uh, uh, but uh, nevertheless, they should be dealt with. Uh, you are one of the uh, few of us, you know, who is uh, inside one of the most influential think tanks. What do you think about those fears and how to approach them? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the fears are real, but sometimes uh, one fears something, uh, one fears a major change, major revolution. Uh, and, uh, you know, sometimes a change in a revolution isn't as uh, threatening to one to oneself as one imagines. So, so I think it's that apprehension anxiety that we may be witnessing something that we cannot handle. Inevitably, I would say a lot of politicians in Washington tend to think in terms of status quo. I remember the same situation when I first came to Washington in the 80s, just before the collapse of the Soviet bloc and then the collapse of the Soviet Union. There was the same apprehension that we should be very careful, uh, we shouldn't push too much, we shouldn't necessarily recognize any of the new countries because that would spark some sort of reaction from Moscow that would involve us. And the biggest fear, I think, is, is of course, as you mentioned, Ilya, is nuclear weapons. The idea that somehow as a result of an internal... A breakup of Russia, one that Moscow would use nuclear weapons internally, <laughs> presumably, which it, to me does not make a lot of sense. Uh, secondly, that they'd use it against the West, which also doesn't make a lot of sense. Why would they accelerate their own destruction? And thirdly, that somehow these nuclear weapons will fall into the hands of newly emerging states, which I think is also uh, a very unlikely that they will be, have the capabilities, they'd have all the codes and, and, uh, and, and resources to be able to use them. And then who, what would, who would they use them against? You know, to, to fire it within Russia would be self-destructive, would be suicidal. Uh, that these are countries that would want to be recognized uh, diplomatically. Uh, they'd want their, their independence recognized. Why would they engage in some sort of nuclear blackmail? Uh, they would want to, and I think the forum here is a very important uh, element of the forum, is to show that the emerging states 
are peacefully minded, they want to coexist with each other and also with neighbors. So I think it's, it, the fear is overblown, but I can see it because I saw it 30 years ago. Um, this is why the organizations like the forum uh, events uh, that the forum is organizing here in, in America is very important to show people, relax, look at the alternatives, look at the positive alternatives. And this, I think, is a very important message from the forum, that we can do this peacefully. Moscow may react. We must be prepared also for the fact that they could engage in violence, but ultimately, independent, peaceful states will emerge from this empire. Thank you. Any more questions? Yes. Movement for NATO enlargement of Austria and Ukraine and Kosovo and Bosnia. My question to you is about um, the NATO summit upcoming in uh, Vilnius. Do you see a movement in America to support NATO enlargement for Ukraine now as part of a peace settlement? Uh, there is a movement, but I don't think it's reached the highest levels of this administration. Um, also remember, even when our administration is supportive of NATO membership, there are other countries in Europe that have to be convinced of this. There are some holdouts still. Uh, certainly, if you left it to the Central East Europeans, those countries that face directly the, the threat from Moscow, they would immediately accept uh, uh, Ukraine as a member. Let's face it, Ukraine has qualified. It's qualified in the most important way, in combat. Uh, in dealing with, in, in integrating and using the weaponry that NATO has developed, in demonstrating to NATO that it can defend the alliance against presumably what used to be the second strongest army in the world. So the arguments against, against Ukraine joining are very weak, but there's still this hesitation at the very top. And part of it is, to follow up to Ilya, part of it is this fear of provoking Moscow. I don't know what we fear that they'll provoke Moscow to do what? Invade Ukraine? They've already done it. So what's there to fear? Thank you. One last question. Yes, in the back. Hello, everyone. Uh, Mogamet Tarif from Ingushetia. I have a question. Uh, you know what the problem? problem is, I think that it's not a decision of United States, European Union, or Ukraine to collapse Russia. And it's a decision of Putin. And he takes this decision on 24 of February uh, 2022. And actually, what they're doing now, how he uh, managing with Russia, what he's doing inside of Russia, it's uh, no way to avoid collapse. And unfortunately, we can afraid, we can be brave, we can expect that something will change, and we will try to again build democracy. But no, unfortunately, it's impossible. I think uh, last chance was when Yeltsin decided to occupy part of Moldova with General Lebed and the 14th Army of the Russia. It happened after five months when Russia was officially democratic and independent. And we saw a result. My question, people understand it or not? That it's Putin doing, you know? It's not a problem of European Union or United States. Thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure if I fully understand the question. Is, is Putin doing what? Putin is contributing to Russia's collapse. Yeah, but it's not just Putin. It's, it's the system that has been created over the past 20 years. Uh, it's it's uh, this hyper-centralization which cannot ultimately deliver either the security or the welfare um, that people come to expect. Uh, it's a number of factors, which actually my book, which was published just before the war, the, the full-scale attack on Ukraine began, I, I outlined these factors even before the war started. I think the war has accelerated all the internal, if you like, in the old communist vocabulary, the contradictions within uh, the Russian Federation, um, the grievances, uh, the... Uh, the, the problems that they simply cannot solve, and they're getting worse. They're going to get worse because of the military defeat and because of the economic coming economic squeeze, which Thank you. could even lead to an economic collapse over this over this coming year. Thank you very I'll much, Janusz. Uh, we will now move on to our next speaker. Our next speaker is Aida Abdurakmanova. She is the Deputy Prime Minister for National and Religious Issues in the Independent Government of Tatarstan and a member of the League of Free Nations. Aida will be joining us virtually. Uh, hey. Uh, hello. 
Uh, Welcome, Aida. You have 15 speakers. minutes. Oh, okay. Uh, good afternoon, speakers, expert, and uh, guest of the sixth form of the uh, Free Nation of Post Russia. Uh, my yes, name I'm is Abdul Aida. Aida. I am a Prime, Prime Minister, Prime Minister of, Independence of Independence Tatarstan, Tatarstan uh, headed by, by Prime Minister, Minister Rafis Kashapov uh, for, for national, national and religious, and religious uh, issues. issues. Uh, at, the at the moment, moment our government, government of, of Independence Tatarstan is the only, only representative, representative organization, organization of the Tatars of the free, from free from Moscow, uh, protecting the rights and interests of, of the Tatars. Tatars. Mm. Tatarstan has, has never been part, part of Russian, Russian Federation. Federation. Aida, we are issues having issues hearing, you, hearing you. you. If you want to just pause your remarks. Pause your remarks. Uh, one second. One second. Thank you. Thank you. We can hear you fine. fine. The five? The, the online, the online people, people can hear you fine. fine. Okay. Can you hear me? Uh, Tatarstan, uh, Tatarstan has, has never, has been, never part been part of, of the Nation Federation, and at, at the, the uh, legitimate, legitimate referendum, referendum of 1991, 1991 which was which attended by, by uh, three, three observers, observers of America. Of America. More than 61% uh, of, of the population, population of Tatarstan waited for. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I need to, while, we, while we figure out your technical issues, issues and, and to, hope bring you to bring, bring you back with sound, sound. I think we will move on to Inal, um, who is here, um, with, here with us in person. So, Inal so, Sierra is the Minister, Minister, Minister of Foreign Affairs for the Government of the Chechen Republic of Echkeria in Exile. I thank you for being here with us, Inal, in your 15 minutes. Hello. Mr. Speaker, Speaker ladies, and, ladies gentlemen, and gentlemen, I would like to thank the organizers, the Hudson Institute, for inviting me to this country. It is great honor to be amongst the speakers, and it is very significant that I was invited as the acting foreign minister of the government of the Chechen Republic of Chechnya. Visiting uh, the United States is always special for me, and visiting Washington, D.C. is even more. Washington, D.C. is unique among American cities. Fateful decision is affected the life of people in the United States and the whole world where they made here. This beautiful and amazing city attracts people from all uh, over the world with a spirit of freedom and equality. It was here in the whole of this great city where this idea that everyone is created equal and that everyone is born free come to be. It was here where the founding father laid the beacon of freedom. And since that day, America destiny has been to take the lead in the free world and the bear the heavy responsibility the responsibility on these shoulders. I am a Chechen, and Chechen same as American, believe in the ideals of freedom, equality, and justice. Freedom has been an essential component of the Chechen collective identity for centuries. For us, freedom is not fictitious. For us, freedom is of, of, our, of part of ourselves. When we meet, we greet each other with the word, come free. 
and our favor translate as go or stay free. Wishing a quick recovery, we say may God give you freedom. As we can see from this example, freedom for Chechen is integral part of social culture. And this culture is transmitted from generation to generation. It is because of this culture, our hero as those who fought and died fighting for freedom against Russia since the 17th century. It is because of this culture, the Chechen struggle for freedom did not stop even when the Chechen lived under totalitarian rule of the Soviet Union, the world's superpower. 83 years ago, in 1940, my great-grandfather, Meyer Bek Sharipov, and Hassan Israelov lead Chechen in the anti-Soviet uprising. Fighting the Soviet in the mountain of the Chechen, uh, Chechnya, she, these people supported the Finnish nation that was defending against the aggressors of the Soviet Union at that time. Here is a quote from Israelov addressed that example they motive. It's been 20 years since the Soviet government started waging a war against the Chechen people. The Soviet Union turned into a prison of nations. We realized that it will be dif difficult for the Chechen and the other nations to free themselves from the red imperialism, but our strong belief in justice inspires our fight. Right now, the Finns demonstrate that even a huge empire is enabled to enslave small but freedom-loving people. We support our Finnish brother and promise that in the Caucasus you will have a second Finland. The other oppressed people will follow as soon. All the participants of this uprising, including my grand grandfather, were killed. Only one member of this uprising, Hasuha Magamadov, survived so and fought, and fought against, against the Soviet the Empire, Empire alone, alone for more than, for more 35, than 35 years. years. According, According to, to, the to the KGB, Hasuha Magamadov Magamado organized, Magamado 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 organized 190, 190 full attacks, full attacks and killed more than 30 representatives representative of the, of the, of the Soviet, of Soviet government. government. He was killed he was in, killed in 1976, when he when was, he was 70, years 70 years old and severely ill. Uh, he, he dies in a cemetery, in a cemetery when he comes to dig his to own his grave, own and KGB, KGB informant notice Hasuka, Hasuka in the cemetery, in the cemetery and, and soon and the whole detachment of the special forces, forces surrounded him. him. He did not he surrender. Did not surrender. He, did not he did not give up. He fought, he and, fought died and died in the battle in inscribing battle his name in the list of the Chechen hero. Hero. Hasuha Magamada Hasuha was, the was the last soldier, last soldier of the anti-Soviet anti war. With, war with, with Hasuha, Hasuha death, the Chechen, death, struggle, the Chechen for struggle for independence was, was disrupted, disrupted, but only, but only for, 14 for 14 years. years. In 1990, in 1990, Chechnya, Chechnya declared, declared its, independence, its independence, and four years, and four years later, later, in 1994, a new, a new allegedly democratic, democratic Russia once, Russia once again, again attacked, attacked the independent, independent Chechen, Chechen, Chechen Republic in order in to order suppress to freedom. freedom. Chechen, victory Chechen victory in the first war the first did not bring not peace, bring and the, and the second, war second war followed shortly. Follow shortly. We lost more we lost than 20% of, of population in these wars, in this which wars, is more than 300,000 people, 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 including, including 42,000 children. children. In the past, in the past, past 30, 30 years, all five of our presidents, our presidents have been assassinated, have been assassinated by, Russia. by Russia. We do not, we do not just believe just in the ideals of freedom. of freedom. We pay for we it pay for with the life of life our of best our sons. Best son. Therefore, it's, Therefore, it's a, great, it's a honor great honor and privilege, and privilege for me to stand me before, to stand you, today before you today in this great, in this city, great city, which is connected, which is connected to, the to the ideals that Chechen church. I want you, I want to, you understand to understand that we will not we stop, will fighting, stop freedom fighting freedom until we win and, and justice prevails. prevails. Today, the today, detachment the of the Chechen, of the Chechen Republic of Hichkir are, are, are participating in the war in, the war in Ukraine, Ukraine as a part as of a the part Ukrainian of the armed forces. forces. And this is and proof this is of proof our, determination our determination to liberate, to liberate our, our homeland our from homeland occupation. occupation. Some, days ago, Some days ago, I asked myself, I asked myself 
if my great grandfather Meyer Beck Sheriff could imagine um, um, that 83 years after he raised people raised against people the Soviet, against Union, Soviet Union, Union, his great, his great grandson, grandson Minister of Foreign Affairs of Chechen Republic in Chechnya will be here in the United States, in Washington, D.C., at the conference, the conference, the decision about the collapse of Russia. And could he imagine that Russia will be recognized as a terrorist state State by the world by the community, world will, community come. will come. Could he imagine could he the Russian, the Russian uh, could, he uh, imagine could he imagine the international, the international um, um, criminal court criminal would court put would the, president the president of Russia, of Russia uh, on, uh, international on international wanted, wanted list and, and issue a warrant, a warrant for his arrest? For his arrest. Probably, not, Probably because not, because years, years ago, years ago I could not imagine could not this. Imagine. We live in the moment of history when everything, when everything changed, so, changed fast so fast that we cannot, that we realize. cannot realize. And I tell and you, I tell um, you um, why, by why quoting by the quoting president the of the United States of America, States of America uh, um, John F. Kennedy, John F. Kennedy during, his during his inaugural speech, speech in 1961, 1961, he said, he said we shall pay we any shall price, wear any burden, any meet burden, any hardship, any hardship support, support any friends, friends oppose any force to, to assure the survival, the survival and success, and of, success liberty. of liberty. And this and quote this tells quote exactly, tell exactly what every free Chechen feels in his heart. In his heart. Thank you very much, Thank for, you very much for your attention. Thank you, Inal. And now we have and some time for questions from the audience. Yes. Yes. We have a microphone coming for you. One second. One second. It's okay. Okay. You are for independence of Chechnya, right? Right. What's going to be your answer to so-called Moscow opposition, who's like imperialist, like, for example, Mr. Ilya Ponomaryov? They've got like imperial view of Russia, you know? What's going to be your answer to that? Well, I, I, for me, surprised that Ilya is imperialist. I hope. Uh, okay, okay. <laughs> and, uh, and uh, anyway, we anyway, we know we this. Know uh, this uh, if we were talking about the North Caucasus, if we were talking about Chechnya, uh, we uh, fight uh, against, against the Russia, Russia since the 17th century. century. Uh, uh, and, and I said and, and I we, we 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 lost. We lost uh, uh, in the last 30 years, 30 years uh, around the 200,000 people, and, uh, and uh, including 42,000 uh, uh, children. Uh, children. It's mean, it's mean uh, uh, we, for we, us, for us this is, this we, is we, two, we just two, two ways, two this ways. freedom it's or freedom death. death. And of course, and of we, course we, choose we choose freedom, and we will fighting we will against, against this uh, way we uh, win. win. And in this and why this our, our, uh, uh, our uh, people and people our and soldier, our soldier right, now right now in, in Ukraine. In Ukraine. Uh, uh, if if I, understand I understand this, too many, too many people, people in Russia, in Russia do, not do not understand, understand what's going what's on, on, and the people, they, people do not realize how these people will live without Russia. Of course, we know this. Because also because in the also North Caucasus, many, uh, uh, many people do not imagine, do not imagine how the how life with, without, without Russia. Russia. Um, um, but it, the problem the is, problem I think, it's more fiction. It's because, the, like, the, like, like, like uh, uh, Janos said, said, this is, I think, the problem is. Uh, uh, like, uh, like, like tools, uh, like of, tools propaganda. of propaganda. <laughs> I think this I is think part this of, propaganda of propaganda because uh, uh, if, uh, we if we remember 30 years, 30 years ago, ago the, before, before the, Ro the Soviet Union, Union was collapsed, collapsed. this was so, was so same situation. Same situation. 
and and nothing happy. Nothing happy. All all uh, all, uh, all, all, all country around the around Russia, the Russia was, happy was happy without happy Russia. Without Russia. And I think and I this think we it we is just, it's one, just way. one way. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, one last question uh, one from, last the from the audience. Yes. yes. Minister, Minister, I'm Peter Fellinger from Austria. Austria. My Austria. question is about the human rights abuses of the Russia against Chechen citizens, citizens in, the in the European Union. Union. We may have targeted uh, uh, contract killings, killings in Germany and Austria. Austria. And my and question my is, question how do you see how that? You how do you see, you see the reaction the of the Austrian government, government, government concerning, concerning these contract these killings by the FSB in Vienna? Thank you for Thank the, you this for question. question. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, of course, uh, the, of course the, the, these people the, live in, uh, in, uh, in, in Europe, Europe and, uh, the, and also and I'm also Belgium citizenship. citizenship. These people uh, probably was, uh, the, uh, the Austrian citizenship, Austria citizenship or in Germany, Germany. And, and I think and the I government, think government take uh, 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 his, responsibility his responsibility for investing for this, uh, this, this problem. And we know that it's uh, any, uh, any 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 opposition from who will will uh, again the Russia will, will have problems. Same like like Ahmed Zakai, our premier minister. Same because they he uh, uh, working against the Russia more than three uh, twenty years. Probably he outside of Russia. And uh, uh, we have this problem, uh, but. Uh, 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 it's part of this big problem because what I said, where the last five our president was 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 assassinated by Russia, it's it's, it's officially legal president. It's not not because the like example Aslan Maschada was legal uh, president of the Chechen Republic of Ishkiri, and even uh, Yeltsin was congratulation was. As in support for Aslan Mas to, to Aslan Maschado in the beginning, uh, he's 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 he, he's working, and, and in this case, uh, I think th this is of course this part, and we can do this because this is part of government on this the problem of this government of this country, uh, uh, to 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 take defense of these people who work again the the in, who opposite for for Russia. And even for uh, for a Chechen government, also because we know the uh, big problem of, of human rights in Chechnya. We know how it's terrible, terrible situation right now in in, in inside the Chechnya. It is. Thank you very much. Thank you, and now we will now go to our next in-person speaker while we continue to um, figure out some of our, our technical issues and hope to go back to Aida soon. So our next speaker will be Pavel Ivlev. He is the director of Ingeri Maya based in Narva, Estonia. Pavel, welcome. You have 15 minutes. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. And um, uh, yeah, it's good to speak in person because uh, there are less difficulties, but nowadays, you know, everyone so accustomed to be online, so hopefully it will work uh, shortly and all the online speakers will join us. And at least I hope uh, everyone can hear us via the stream. And thanks to the Hudson Institute who is hosting us here in DC. Uh, yes, I think I need to talk more about what actually INGRE is. Because not me, I mean, compared to uh, the Chechen Republic of Echkeria, which is the very well known thing, at least among us uh, who, who, who follow what's going on in Russia, uh, Ingre is a very different creature, and then the, its name is not very much uh, common name. So, what is Ingre or in Germanlandia? That's the full name of the country. Well, um, first is territory, of course, where it is on the map. It's uh, currently Leningradska Oblast. So it's uh, the city of St. Petersburg, the second largest city of uh, Russia. And it's surrounding territory, which is on the, mainly on the uh, coast of the Baltic Sea. And on the west, the border of Ingermanlandia is Estonian border 
uh, border be, now between Estonia and Russian Federation. And on, to the north of it, or, or northwest, we have uh, Finland, uh, so another European country. So you can see, I mean, if you can visualize a map in your um, mind, uh, it's, it's a Baltic state, basically. It's uh, that close to um, to Northern Europe, and uh, it's it's really it's not okay. Let's call it Eastern Europe, which where it belongs. Uh, so that's where it is located. That's in Germanland. Why it has that name, not uh, something else? Well, because uh, uh, it had that name 300 years ago. Uh, at um, that 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 piece uh, of of uh, Today, Russian Federation was uh, acquired, won in the war by Peter the Great in the beginning of uh, 18th century. Um, and before that, it was the eastern province of uh, Sweden Kingdom. Uh, and uh, the name uh, belonged to it historically. It's not S Swedish kings who gave that name. The name is much more older, and um, uh, it's, there is no you know, fixed theory, there were legends that uh, the, the the land was named after the uh, Swedish princess, Ingegard, uh, who was the daughter of Swedish king in, uh, I believe it's 11th century, and uh, she married to uh, Yaroslav the Wise, the, the um, duke, uh, the leader of the Moscow at the time. Oh. Okay, <laughs> you're right, guys. Thank you. And and of course he was uh, and he was uh, also uh, uh, let's say close relative to the uh, Swedish uh, dynasty because he was uh, the accessor of Rurik. So the the marriage was quite logical for the time. Um, the, the, that was the beginning of Christianity. So there's no much separation at the time for. Um, um, Orthodox Church, Russian Orthodox Church, and uh, Catholicism were uh, well before the um, uh, Martin Luther times. Uh, so it was quite normal, and uh, Yaroslav the Wise gave uh, basically. Again, the, the, the story is not clear, but the, but the it looks like the land was. Uh, uh, a contribution of Yaroslav to acquire such an uh, important uh, wife to his uh, family. And then the marriage was quite successful, I would say. There were 10 children, and many of them were then the leaders of different parts of, okay, how to call it, Kiev and Rus. Uh, or the, and the daughters were the uh, mm, uh, queens of uh, various um, countries in, in Europe. Uh, so that's a little history. So the name is quite historic, and I would say, uh, at the you know at the turn and when, when Soviet Union collapsed, uh, people of uh, Germanland, people of uh, Saint Petersburg and, and and the Oblast, they uh, almost voted for the renaming of the Leningrad Oblast into in Germanlandia. But then the, the, the year 93 happened, and uh, basically Yeltsin administration started to uh, limit the freedoms in the country. That was that old. So the name had never been changed, and we have such a strange uh, phenomena in, 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 in Russian geography at these days where we have Leningradska Oblast, named after Vladimir Lenin, as you can uh, well, conclude. Um, so the name is 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 basically obsolete and, and not needed. And even you know the Finn, uh, the no Russian Federation, if that would be a normal development uh, in the 90s, it would be changed. It didn't. Um, so talking about the people of Germanland, are they? What's the ethnicity? Well, historically, there were local uh, people with their languages, which were mainly close to you know, Finnish and Estonian. I would simplify that. Um, they 
almost all gone. You know, the Soviet Union, Stalin regime, they dealt with them harshly and they pushed them out or, or killed them. So there's no language associated with this land. They all speak Russian. Uh, and uh, that uh, ethnical minority is really, really, you know, close to the mathematical error, I would say. That just maybe a couple of thousands of people who associate themselves now with their original um, p ingenious people of that land. Uh, in Germanland, Finns, who are connected to Finland. Uh, Ijora, historic uh, Vorten, and uh, probably no more, uh, or something, very limited. So the, 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 the land is populated by Russian speakers, especially now. Uh, there is Lutheran Church, the Church of Engermanland, which has some influence, but uh, it's, it's, it's not hard, it's not big, only in, in the smaller, uh, you know, smaller towns and villages to the uh, uh, west from St. Petersburg. However, the population of the territory of Engermanland is estimated to be around 12 million people. So it's quite big. Uh, most of this population resides in St. Petersburg, which is the second largest city in Russia. I think officially it's about 6 million population. People say that's around 10 million in reality. Uh, and the rest are spread around the, the territory, which is, uh, again, I need to do better math, but I, let's say it's a bit similar to the state of Massachusetts in the United States, which has a big city and then the rest to the west of it. Um, so it's, it's a big country. It's uh, larger than the uh, combined population of Baltic states. So free Baltic states, they have less population, more territory, I guess, uh, than uh, in Germanland. Um, economically, it's even more promising because it's very well developed. St. Petersburg is traditionally a big center of uh, Russian industry. The transportation is good, the airport, and, which is more important, uh, Putin regime invested a lot of money into that region now. They built new ports. So basically all the export of Russian resources is going now. I mean, of course, now it's much more limited, but the whole infrastructure been built. New terminals, uh, and in addition to that, the uh, North Stream pipelines North Stream gas comes to Ustluga. It's just 50 kilometers from Narva, which is Estonia. Uh, and then the pipe goes in under the Baltic Sea to Europe. Okay, it's not functioning now, but all the infrastructure is there. Uh, and um, because of you know the, the, the target put by Putin years ago to make this land a free port for a Russian export, that been done infrastructurally, and, and it will never, you know, of course it can collapse if nothing's, nothing's happening, but because of the population, because how the export is structured, uh, and how it flows uh, from Russia to, to the West, it's basically inevitable. Whatever happens with the whole country on this particular territory, whether in Gerbanland be independent or not, but the economically it's, you know, logic tells us that, that it should go on. Um, politically, of course, we, we can talk much more about the political situation there. There's no demand, we should admit it, uh, of the local population to be much independent. You know, the, the, the population, as I said, is very uh, Russian, Russian leaning and uh, the Moscow centralism is, is predominant uh, way of thinking for the locals. There are a few who, who've been uh, um, you know, uh, keen to, to the idea of uh, in Germanland is a big thing and, and an independent state, but there are not too many. Predominantly in St. Petersburg, where more educated people live, and uh, again, if you Google in Germanland, you will see 
uh, symbols of it, the flag, the, uh, even the, the, the anthem. Uh, it's, it's, it, it, so the symbols are there too. Uh, it's just, you know, takes time for us and takes our efforts to bring to them the idea of uh, uh, the fact that, that uh, in Germanlandia can be free and independent. And I'm uh, ready for your questions if you have them, but uh, we can discuss these issues much more. Thank you. A quick question from the audience. Yes. I represent um, Ukrainian Crisis Media Center. And um, if you can, if you have this answer, like how do you, like is there a plan to g gain independence? Is it gonna be like military means or you plan to do it like politically? And if you say there's no demand and no understanding that, like how do you gonna explain people? What are the benefits of being independent? Like what is the, your vision of how you are gonna get there? Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, the, 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 I, I believe I, talked a bit about the benefits and then the historic uh, logics behind the independence of this land. Uh, it was independent. It was part of Europe, clearly. It's uh, because of its location and the, the level of uh, development, it's already can and easily can be one of the Baltic republics on the stage with them. Um, the, how to, you know, bring this this knowledge to the local people and make them agree that this is at least the doable option. Well, that that's I believe we are still very much in the beginning of that process. So we we need to educate them. We need to uh, not just by telling them here's the Ingerman, here's its history. Well, it's all known, they can do it. They normally don't want to. But we have a great help because of, you know, the, the good uh, branding position of Ingermanlandia. Uh, it's already in, 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 you know, in music, Oxymoron, uh, seeing his, his rap about um, Ingermanlandia and to be free, and the very popular cartoon about Masania, you know, all Russians like to, 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 to uh, and enjoy it for many years now. Well, there was a, 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 an episode dedicated to Ingre with, uh, you know, colorful uh, Masania figure, you know, telling <laughs> former friends that uh, they now live in free in Gerberland, which is independent, so that's the uh, future. Uh, that's where we are. Okay, let's take the one more question, maybe. Okay, one the, last question. Let's go here, Ilya. In the short. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, first of all, uh, neither Lenin's name nor Peter the Great name uh, would no longer fit uh, Saint Petersburg, right? So, are you planning to return to Nian Shans? name or, or something else, so what's, what's the vision, first off. Secondly, uh, uh, the independence will inevitably raise the question of the border with Finland, because there is part of the annexed territory from Finland. What is the uh, uh, vision of uh, your movement? And thirdly, how you assess the awareness of the current residents of St. Petersburg and the region uh, of the idea of uh, in German land and even the brand awareness. Uh, okay. Uh, very quick should answer, be Very please. quick. Uh, the borders should remain. As a lawyer, you know, th there's no question to me. So the, the whole borders, whatever wrong they are now, they should remain. Only the agreement between the countries can lead to the, the change of territory. Peaceful agreement. No war. Uh, St. Petersburg name, I believe, could remain because that's the city built by... Peter the Great, and uh, there's nothing wrong in that name, to my belief, compared to Lenin's name for the for the region. Uh, and um, the last question: Well, we have I believe we have all the options, all the abilities. We could use modern techniques and the, not propaganda, but the marketing tools. The current state is uh, better than it was a year ago, which is a good thing. So we are moving forward. 
Thank you very much. We will now go back to our online speakers and we will see if we can pull up Aida and um, smooth out these technical issues. So let's again welcome Aida Abdurakmanova. Thanks. Uh, good afternoon, speakers, experts, and guests of the sixth forum of the nation of post Russia. My name is Abdurakmanova Aida. I am the Vice Prime Minister of Independence Tatarstan, headed by Prime Minister Rafis Kashapov for national and religious um, issues. Uh, at the moment, our government of independent Tatarstan is the only uh, representative of the organization uh, of the Tatars from Moscow, uh, protecting the rights and interests of the Tatars. Tatarstan has uh, never been part of the Russian Federation and at the um, uh, leg um, legitimate uh, referendum of 1991, which was attended by uh, the observers uh, of America. More than 61% of the population of Tatarstan waited for the creation of uh, their own independent state. Uh, what is the uh, organizing principle of the sovereignty in international relations? At the moment, I want to highlight to the future of Tatarstan. The first uh, thread is if Russia wins the war against Ukraine, this the current Russian government, then the Tatar nation will end uh, its uh, existence. Uh, it will not exist. Uh, since Moscow has already prepared the basic for this, the Tatar language has been eliminated. Uh, this is one of the main signs of the identity of the nation, degraded institutions of statehood such as the Constitution and the Constitutional Court, as well as any form of mention of the independence of the Tatars, have been abolished. The second threat, uh, threat uh, the, is uh, what Ukraine will win, but Russia will remain within each border with 1991, with the replacement of the political ruling class. It doesn't matter what kind of doctrine uh, they have, liberal, wealth, democratic, and ours. The uh, threat is uh, what the Russian imperial itself remains with its Russian chauvinistic thinking about the destruction of everything non-Russian. Here, as a member of the Free Nations League, which uh, united representatives of uh, different nations of Russia. I want to note what none of representatives of the nation of the Russian uh, under emperor agrees with this option. Representatives of the Free Nation League openly declare on our political platforms uh, what we are ready for the collapse of Russia and the liberation of their territories and nations of uh, uh, nation from the uh, central old oppression of Russia. And the third most dangerous uh, external uh, threat is China. Tatarstan is becoming independent from Moscow and we understand what the uh, expansion of China will not only not stop, but will increase significantly. And the Tatars will have a choice to be with the West or with China. We, the independent government of Tatarstan, consider Tatarstan as an anti-China project. China's uh, start um, ide um, ideology uh, ideology is uh, communism. Communism was uh, on our Tatar land uh, for more than uh, 70 years in the form of the USSR. The USSR destroyed our subculture, turning the Tatarstan into a socialist Soviet man. China preaches uh, the some communism uh, ideology, but only more aggressive. 
China for us, but in the Tatars, uh, is an existing, existential uh, threat. Uh, since China is very highly developed uh, techno technologically, informationally, militarily, and uh, it is absolutely ideologically uh, hostile to us, to the Tatars. An example of what will happen to us, uh, to the Tatars, uh, most of them associate uh, themselves as Muslims, uh, is the situation of our country, Uyghur uh, people in China. And this, uh, as an already established fact by many international organizations, is uh, transnational repression and absolutely totalitarian ideology disguised as social benefits. Uh, exporting its uh, internal model of governance and uh, genocidal uh, operation. Unlike the rest, these qualities um, such as personal, political, economic, social, and religious freedoms, the Vatatars living in the European part of Russia uh, choose the West as the uh, strategic or uh, long term partner with existing legal institutions, and we see our service only as part of NATO. Example of such uh, successful cooperation for us are the Baltic countries, Poland, and Turkey. Uh, also, Tatarstan, being an independent state, uh, can participate in a large project of Turkey status, which can uh, consolidate their uh, forces to counter the Chinese uh, threat. Uh, since the problem is the Chinese threat, it uh, is common to all Turkish countries and countries of the Western world. In America, there is a true chamber law, public law, 8690. Um, regarding territory of idle euro. Tatarstan is uh, part of the idle euro. We have created a platform college free idle euro, which unites a representative of the nations of idle euro in the struggle for independence. Many of the countries what um, specified is this law up to the territory of idle Europe have already received freedom from communism imperialist regimes. And now it's our turn of the list. Uh, therefore, we believe that we will receive the support of America in the struggle for our independence. Thank you. Thank you, Aida. Any questions from the audience? May I? Yes. Okay. You know how to address Aida. Um, uh, okay. I hope she she can hear me. Okay. Um, Aida, my name is Pavel Ivlev, and here I represent uh, Ingria. Another hopefully in an independent part of today's uh, Russian Federation. And um, the, the, the question is, you know, Tatarstan, of course, is uh, big enough and uh, uh, industrially developed, uh, but still it's very deep into the, you know, um, to, to the east from, from say, Europe. Uh, and uh, uh, it's, uh, again, the, the good thing, uh, it's, Tatar's population is the majority, uh, but again, there are others who, who live and, and the connection to the other sides and other regions of Russian Federation is uh, very deep and the interconnection is deep. So the question is, uh, where do you see Tatarstan uh, is really the, 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 like the country by as itself, very independent, or it will be a part of the wider um, say, um, Volga River um, Federation or Confederation of, of 
your neighboring um, re today regions of Russia. Извините, пожалуйста, вы могли бы на русском языке спросить вопрос задать? Окей, okay. хорошо, да. Я мог бы, я тогда задам вам короче. Просто ваш вопрос все поняли присутствующие, и теперь я должна понять да, я. Да, я хотел спросить вот с учетом того, как расположен Татарстан, да, и его, в Ашкирии, там, по русскими республиками. Насколько вы видите, Татарстан в будущем совсем независимой отдельной страной или частью какой-то, скажем так, по русской федерации или конфедерации? Ну, прежде всего, в Башкирии как будут складываться отношения? В первую очередь мы считаем, что каждая республика она должна стать независимой она должна стать независимой страной, и только после этого каждая республика будет решать, вступать ли ей в конфедерацию или федерацию. Но, как я уже сказала, у нас есть на данный момент проект Идель Урал. Мы э, очень тесно общаемся с представителями э, свободных народов э, и заключаем договора. И буквально неделю назад мы заключили декларацию э, с представителями э, Башкортостана, и там есть пункты, которые соответствуют взаимоуважению друг друга. Это было очень большое достижение, потому что до этого такие декларации еще не подписывались за последние 30 лет. Thank you. Next question. Gunther? The microphone is coming. Society, and I was very pleased uh, to hear that Tatarstan wants to join NATO and the European Union. Kosovo wants to do the same. My question now to the representative of Tatarstan: What will be your foreign policy once you are uh, free and independent? Uh, we have heard that you want to join NATO and the EU. That's very welcome. I support that. But will you also recognize Kosovo? Thanks a lot. Mm -hmm. Вас нет возможности перевести, да? Окей, я, okay, я переведу вопрос, Маида. Вопрос касался того, какой будет будущее, ну, как будет строиться, как вы предполагаете, будущая политика независимого Татарстана в отношении, ну, прежде всего, Косово, да, и как признаваться Косово как страна, что вот Гюнтер, который задал этот вопрос, это его больше всего, наверное, волнует, как человека, связывающего, ну, ратующего за вхождение Косово во все ну, независимые европейские структуры и НАТО. Признаем ли мы Косово? Да, мы признаем Косово. И поддерживаем полностью. Thank you. One last question. Yes, Barbara. The microphone. Um. Добрый день, я буду сразу говорить по-русски, чтобы вам было понятно. Вопрос такой, есть ли у вас план, как вы будете приходить к этой независимости? То есть не просто, что вот у вас есть такое желание, но какой-то план. Вы будете там, военным путем, политическим? Как, какой план, чтобы это действительно осуществилось? Какой временной ну, промежуток времени, вы думаете, это может случиться? А есть ли у вас какие-то внутренние там, движения, протесты, медиакомпании? Ну, вот, что вообще происходит внутри на таком очень практическом уровне в плане движения к независимости вашей республики? Спасибо. Спасибо. У нас есть определенный план действий. Начнем с того, что мы организовались как продолжение правительства нас организовал в 2008 году. Но продолжаем мы деятельность буквально 3-4 месяца. 
Поэтому у нас все разрабатываются различные планы. У нас поддерживается тесная связь с татарами внутри Татарстана, но, к сожалению, протесты там невозможны. Это сразу все жесток пресекается. У нас были протестные акции, но, конечно же, там идут сразу аресты и избивания, и посадка в тюрьму на большие сроки. До сих пор продолжаются судебные уголовные дела. Мы будем действовать различными методами. Конечно же, пропаганда должна быть открыть глаза им на всю ситуацию, потому что там пропаганда работает 25 часов из 24, и с ней бороться достаточно сложно. Но есть эффективные способы, и мы работаем с нашим народом. Спасибо. Thank you very much, Aida. We will now move to our next online speaker. Our next speaker is Anna Fatika. She is the former Minister of Foreign Affairs of Poland, the former head of the Chancellor of the President of Poland, and a current member of European Parliament. Thank you, Anna. You have 15 minutes. Good morning, Hudson. Good morning, uh, dear representatives of Free Nations of Post-Russia Forum. Uh, do you hear me properly? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. Uh, it is really a privilege to, to speak during this uh, sixth uh, edition of, of the, the forum uh, and listening to, to, to all speakers preceding uh, my intervention. Um, naturally, I share, uh, because of long-standing uh, relations already, I share many of, of uh, Janusz Bugajski's uh, uh, views, uh, but let me return to, to, to current uh, uh, strategic uh, situation and, and start with uh, uh, obvious uh, statements. Uh, uh, we have to 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 uh, focus and engage in assisting Ukraine to win this uh, war decisively, win this war and and um, obtain full uh, territorial integrity. With Anna, we just lost your audio. If you could pause for a moment, we'll let you know when it's back. Sorry about this. Okay, could you um, begin again, please? And and start maybe um, 30 seconds ahead of where you just ended. I'm sorry, we still can't hear you. 
Hopefully we'll get it back soon, just one moment. We are so sorry, Anna. We will come back to you um, until we figure out this audio difficulty. We are going to now move to our next in-person speaker. So our next in-person speaker in the final in-person speaker for this first session is Rajana Dugar de Ponte. She is um, from the Buryad Mongol Erkheten Democratic Movement, and she is a member of the League of Free Nations. Rajana, welcome. Hello, uh, my name is Rajana Dugar de Ponte. I am a representative of the democratic movement Buryat Mongol Erheten uh, and um, a member of the Free Nations League. Um, it's a great honor and privilege uh, for me to take part in the six Free Nations of Post Russia forum held in the United States, uh, the land of the free. The President of the United States, Woodrow Wilson, was regarded as a hero in Eastern Europe for endorsing the rights of small nations in a world of great powers. He proposed an independent Poland, Czechoslovakia, and other nation states that appeared on the political map of the world after the collapse of Austro-Hungarian, Russian, and Ottoman empires. The process of formation of sovereign states continued after World War II as a result of the victory of national liberation movements in the former colonies of European powers. The year 2022 has shown that it is not yet time to abandon the ideas of fighting for the freedom and liberation of peoples from colonial dependence. Woodrow Wilson once said, the world must be made safe for democracy. Those words today sound more important than ever. Putin, a mad emperor of the last empire in Europe, has brought the world to the brink of a nuclear catastrophe. Moscow has launched a full-scale barbaric war against sovereign Ukraine, forcing colonized non-Russians to fight for the preservation of the dominance of the Russian organized crime group that has usurped power. Buryat Mongolia was invaded and subjugated by Russia at the end of the 17th century after a brutal war that lasted for over a hundred years. Territory of ethnic Buryatia is one of the most important strategic regions for Russia. <clears throat> uh, throughout history, the Russian state has pursued a deliberate policy of reducing the number of non-Russian indigenous peoples in the occupied lands. In the late 19th and throughout the 20th century, the Buryat population was affected by the Stolypian reform, First and Second World Wars, the Civil War, collectivization, industrialization, and Stalin's repressions. Putin's Russia persistently follows the same colonial track. Today, Moscow uses captive nations and indigenous peoples as cannon fodder in the war against Ukraine. 
for a Buryat, the probability of being mobilized and dying in the Ukraine war is 275 times higher than for residents of Moscow. From the beginning of the war, the Buryat people have suffered the highest number of deaths in the army, six times higher than among those in the central regions of Russia. After February 24th, 2022, thousands of dissenting people had to leave Buryatia. The exodus has intensified after mobilization was announced. The so-called partial mobilization has been carried out in Buryatia in extremely aggressive ways. Numerous experts have already called disproportionate mobilization in Sahaya Kutia and Buryatia ethnic cleansing and an act of genocide. But the war is not the only problem of the Buryat nation under Putin's rule. Our national rights provided for by international institutions, uh, the United Nations, the Council of Europe, and the Constitution of the Russian Federation are constantly violated. In 1937, Buryat Mongolian Republic lost one third of its territory and population when Stalin divided it into five parts and gave its western and eastern regions to the neighboring oblasts. In the mid 2000s, Putin eventually annulled the autonomy of two of these Buryat regions with the fake referenda. The goal has been to accelerate Russification of Buryats and change the ethnic composition of the region. In 2020, changes were made to the Russian constitution, making Russian the only state language. According to a UNESCO report, Buryat is an endangered language and can disappear completely by the year 2050. Lake Baikal is the main symbol of the Buryat people. It is the largest fresh water reservoir on the planet and is suffering an ecological catastrophe. This situation caused by the greed of the Russian state is leading to irreversible environmental consequences affecting the entire world. Buryati is being constantly robbed by Moscow corporations. 40 to 70 percent of natural resource taxes go to Moscow. The money taken by Moscow from our region is used to support the administrative and repressive apparatus of the Imperial Russian state, its law enforcement agencies, its army, Russian cultural institutions, and its education system. Currently, the Republic of Buryatia takes 81st place, which is one of the last in the rating of quality of life among the Russian regions. Russia has always had a severe problem of political representation of native peoples of Russia, but since Putin came to power, the situation went from bad to worse. The non-governmental sector has been destroyed. Many local NGOs for the development of civil society were declared foreign agents and had been banned. Buryat society is deprived of the most important tool of democracy, free media. A few Oppositional channels that are based outside of Russia do not give voice uh, to the representatives of the ethnic republics. Despite these difficult cir circumstances, there are various groups and initiatives to maintain our culture, our language, and our identity. Since the beginning of Russian aggression in Ukraine, our organization has released a lot of publications in all digital channels confronting Russian propaganda. We have explained to the people of Buryatia how they are being manipulated into participating in this treacherous war. Gradually, our social media channels gained lots of followers in Buryatia, and we had been able to start a discussion around the subject of decolonization, freedom of speech, and independence. We see a great need to broaden our reach, topic coverage, and frequency of content released to educate new free-thinking leaders. As we watch the flourishing of the national cultures, the economics, and the democracies in the freed republics of the former Soviet Union, we must come to the conclusion that only true sovereignty can save a people from assimilation and extinction. In May 2022, representatives of six national movements made a public statement on the creation of the Free Nation League, a political platform for broad and anti-imperial front of national movements, 
social, political, and civil organizations advocating the claiming of sovereignty by the peoples and territories of the Russian Federation. Free Nations League is a horizontal network that brings together organizations, movements, and individual activists who share its goals and views. Today, the League includes representatives of Bashkortostan, Buryatia, Kosakia, Erzia, Moksha, Oirat, Kalmykia, Karelia, Ichkeria, Ingria, Ingushetia, Saha, Yakutia, Tatarstan, and others. <clears throat> the Free Nations League gives all peoples and regions advocating independence the opportunity to stand in solidarity and act as a unified front in a common struggle, whether it be supporting our activists overcoming current problems and discussing the future of our countries. Buryati has enough human and natural resources for independence. We are focused on building economic and social stability in our region and establishing strong ties and mutually beneficial cooperation with our neighbors. We believe that China's influence on Russia is dangerous to the world peace. Therefore, it is important to form numerous democratic countries on post-Russian territory instead of a huge totalitarian Russia. Our priority uh, would be building a peaceful, democratic, stable society with the protection of property rights, the development of human resources capital, innovations, digital economy, and startups, and meeting all the necessary requirements for attracting global companies to Buryatia. We see ourselves in the future as trustful partners to the civilized democratic world. We appeal to the democratic leaders of the world with the following requests. We would uh, need a United Nations military peacekeepers presence when the Republic will announce its independence. We would need consultants from the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, the World Trade Organization, and the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development for assistance in the development of an investment program in the newly created state. It is finally the time to bring an end to the last empire in Europe and give new democratic states a chance. And for that, we would need all of the support that the civilized world can give us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any questions from the audience? Can I? Yes. Uh, thank you, Rajana, for your presentation. Is it okay if I ask questions in English? Okay. Uh, okay. You just said free Europe, and uh, but but uh, Buryatia, forgive me, is not part of Europe, right? It's uh, far more east. Uh, so, and then the, the name of your organization, Burat Mongolia, which clearly associates Buryats with uh, Mongolia, which is, uh, as far as I know, a larger country. Your neighbor, your brothers, uh, they believe the language is very similar. So, to me, again, compared with, uh, uh, in, I mean, in, in the Central Europe, it's like uh, Romania and uh, Moldova, basically the same ethnicity, same language, but different countries. So uh, the question is how you see the, I mean, the independence of Buryatia or Buryat Mongolia, as it used to be named. Uh, is it a sort of association with uh, the today's independent and democratic Mongolia? Or, I mean, how close you want to be to Mongolia and Mongolians? Um, in, in, in the future of Buryatia, how you see it? Uh, I, I'm afraid I didn't quite understand the first part of your question when uh, you asked me why I mentioned Europe or pre-Europe. I, I don't quite remember when I did that. Uh, perhaps uh, in the uh, list of uh, the organizations that might help oh, us, right? Just disregard it. Okay, it. okay. As for the uh, ties with uh, Mongolia, uh, we uh, are sure uh, going to develop very close ties uh, with uh, Mongolia being our closest um, uh, relative, I would say. And um, 
uh, our organization um, has already have uh, close ties to the Democratic Party, uh, Mongolian Democratic Party, and we are planning to um, deepen and broaden this cooperation. And uh, of course, um, when um, I mentioned about a possible involvement of uh, United Nations peacekeepers, I know that Mongolia um, actually uh, is one of the countries that participates in it. And I guess uh, in if needed, if, uh, you know, situation uh, gets somehow dangerous, uh, I believe we can appeal to Mongolia uh, for um, helping us in this difficult situation. Thank you. One last question from the audience. Okay. Um, the microphone will be coming right over here. Hussein uh, Oydopinar, um, Uppsala University, Institute for Russian Eurasian uh, Studies. Um, um, very short question. Um, it's all good that you are mentioning about collaboration, signing agreements. Uh, what is your home base? How much you are relevant in Buryatia? How much you are known in, among uh, your own people back there? What is your influence there? Uh, I couldn't hear well. I'm sorry. Uh, you couldn't hear well? I couldn't uh, hear what I'm saying is, uh, what is your base at home? Base, oh, I see. What, what is your relevance there? Mm -hmm. What is your impact? Mm -hmm. Are you able to communicate? Because we are all now in Washington, D.C., and I would like to hear more about how much influence mm -hmm. um, representatives of nations have in among their own people, which they appear to be representing. Mm -hmm. I see. Uh, currently, I'm based in the United States of America. I had to leave Russia in 2009. Uh, at that time, it was still, uh, I would say, a, a vegetarian time for uh, uh, activists. Uh, but uh, since I was involved in uh, ethnic activism uh, at the beginning of 2000s, in the middle of 2000s, it uh, somehow uh, became very uh, difficult for me to uh, continue operating there because the situation was getting worse. And um, so eventually I left the country. First I lived in Europe, uh, but then um, I got married actually and I moved to the United States. As for the involvement in the, um, 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 in, 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 uh, in the, uh, I would say life, you know, local life, um, we are, in contact with the activists who still are in Buryatia. And uh, of course, um, they are acting, um, I would say, uh, uh, clandestine, right? They, they, they cannot uh, reveal themselves right now because it is extremely dangerous uh, for people to um, uh, openly, uh, op openly um, act and openly uh, protest against uh, the Russian state, against the war. But uh, still, uh, we have these ties with our uh, members, members of our organization um, in Buryatia. And in also not only in Buryatia, Republic of Buryatia, but also in the uh, Buryat districts that were uh, cut off by Stalin and um, now they are parts of these neighboring oblasts, as I mentioned before. Okay, thank you very much, Rajana. So now we're actually gonna go to a 20 minute coffee break so that we can work out all of these technical issues and hopefully come back um, and have smooth sailing from then on. So we will break and come back at 11.55. And thank you to our first panelists.
Welcome to Zoom. Enter your meeting ID followed by pound. You have not entered any numbers. Please re-enter your meeting ID followed by pound. Enter your participant ID followed by pound. Otherwise, just press pound to continue. Please enter the meeting password followed by pound. Not entered any numbers. Please re-enter the meeting password followed by pound. You are in the meeting now. There are eight participants in the meeting. Yeah, and if they're prepared to let the opposition leader basically die in prison, um, they're not going to give up power lightly, I'm afraid. Um, yeah, of course.
Test, 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 test. One, one, two, two three. three. Test, test, test. test very test, fine, very fine. Very, very fine, yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Test, one, two, test, three, one, two, test. three, test. That's one, two, three. I can't. It's not. It's not. It's not. That's one, two, three. Oh, yeah. That's one, two, three. Yeah. That's one, two, three. Okay, thanks, folks. We have the audio okay, working thanks, in folks. here now. We have the audio working uh, in Goebbels here now. Is gonna go next. Uh, Paul Goebbels uh, is going to go next. Thank you for your patience. Uh, we thank sincerely you for your apologize for the audio issues, and then we'll go back to Anna. And then we'll go back to Anna after that. After that. Um, um, we, we should, should be, be rolling, rolling now, so I'm sorry about so that. We're going to get everybody back in the room. Thank you for waiting. Get everybody back in the room.
<laughs> Hello, Hello one one side, side, either way. Everybody, uh, in, Everybody person in person and online, welcome and back online. to welcome our back session. To our we will session. now move on, we and, now we thank move on and we thank you all for your patience through these technical difficulties. To Paul Goebel, to he's Paul Goebel. an analyst, he's writer, an analyst and columnist writer, and columnist with expertise, with expertise on Russia, and he is also a specialist on ethnic and religious questions throughout Eurasia. So welcome, Paul. You have 15 minutes. Thank you, Morgan. I very much appreciate uh, your understanding and allowing me to speak out of order. I'm currently under treatment for cancer with radiation, and so I'm under more time constraints than usual. I also very much appreciate being asked to have a chance to speak to this group, group. Uh, not only because there's uh, so much I can learn, because there's but also so much because I can learn. as someone but also who because went through the demise of the USSR 30-some uh, so, years ago, there are certain parallels uh, that I think I can call attention to that may be useful for others. Clearly, as this meeting demonstrates, ever more people when around the world recognize that the Russian Federation is on its way to the dustbin of history. My, but I'm most of these people, think I can unfortunately, push. and so I really? naively assume that the coming disintegration of that country will resemble what happened in 1991. 
While of course there are some elements likely to be in common with the events of 30 years ago, the future disintegration of the Russian Federation almost certainly will not be like the remarkably quick and easy divorce of 1991, but instead resemble the vastly more complicated, difficult, and in part reversed results of the events of 1918, when Russia first fell apart along ethnic and regional lines, only to have much of its territory reunited under Moscow's yoke because of divisions among its opponents and the facility with which the Bolsheviks exploited them. Understanding why the events looming on the horizon are going to be fundamentally different than those of 1991 and fundamentally similar to those of 1918 is critical not only for the peoples involved and the strategies they should adopt, but also and perhaps especially important for outside governments who are again going to face a far greater challenge than three decades ago, one that they need to meet in radically different ways lest the gains of disintegration be lost by a re forced reintegration made possible, as was the case a century ago, by outsiders doing just enough to contribute to the rise of a new kind of patriotism, but not enough to achieve what the outsiders in fact hoped for then or now. Obviously, these differences, the differences between now and 1991, the similarities between the present situation and that of 1918, and the consequences for both those immediately involved and those who want to help them are numerous and ramified, far too large to cover in a single comment as this. But there are at least five major reasons in each case that deserve to at least be mentioned and may serve as a warning against fighting the wrong war, as all too happens when politicians as well as generals get involved. At the very least, even these can serve as a cautionary notice to those who now assume that what they hope for will be achieved easily and quickly. Unfortunately, it is far more likely to be difficult and long-term than something that will occur overnight, as was the case 30-some years ago. Among the reasons why the coming year will not be like 1991, the following five strike me as particularly important. First, in 1991, almost everyone knew what the prospects were as far as the number of countries that would emerge and what their borders would be. There were 15 Union Republics, if one counts the occupied Baltic states among them, and thus there would be 15 countries. And the administrative borders they had at that time would become state borders at the assistance of both Moscow and the West. Now, no one has any idea how many states will arise from the demise of the Russian Federation, with numbers running from one, the Kremlin's preference, to more than 100. No one knows what their borders will be, and no one knows who will be in charge of particular places. That very complexity and its dangers lead many to adopt a status quo approach. But such an approach by definition only lays a delay delayed action in mind under the entire situation, as Putin's moves in the last two years in Ukraine and elsewhere show. Second, ethnicity is not going to be the only factor as it was in 1991. Regions and other groups are going to play a much larger role, either by separating or uniting. Their, the percentage of ethnic Russians is far smaller now than it was in 1991. And all this means that no one can say in advance what the principles will be for state organization, unless and until outsiders and participants alike declare certain ideas such as democracy and non-aggression as fundamental. State structures are going to have to be built from the bottom up rather than simply rechristened, as was the case in 91. Again, that makes the entire situation more uncertain and more complicated, and will dispose all too many to favor the status quo as perhaps the lesser evil. Third, at least in principle, the disintegration of the USSR took place according to the Soviet Constitution. The future disintegration of the Russian Federation will not have that advantage or alternatively that constraint. Because what happened could be presented as legal and hence legitimate, it was far easier three decades ago for those who rechristened themselves as democratic and national leaders to win out than it will be for those without that asset. But at the same time, the, the new leaders who do emerge likely will be more genuine than many of those who held on to power between Soviet pep times and the aftermath. Fourth, in 1991, Russia had a leader committed to not using massive force to preserve the status quo. Gorbachev was guilty of using force on occasion, especially in the Caucasus and the Baltics 
but he was not prepared to drown opposition in blood. Does anyone really believe that Putin or those around him are the same? And fifth, and perhaps most important, in 1991, the non-Russians had an ally in the leader of Russia, Boris Yeltsin, who wanted to escape from Kremlin control so much that he was prepared to have all the non-Russians leave in order for the Russian Federation to be on its own. Obviously, there are some Russians who think the same way now, but there is absolutely no one in the position of power in Moscow who does. Moreover, there are too few who do, even among those who are called the Russian opposition. And because that is the case, the challenge ahead is vastly larger. Among the reasons why 2024 will resemble in some critical ways 1918, the following five, it strikes me, are especially important. First, in 1918, the Russian state had disintegrated. It hadn't devolved to lower levels, it had disintegrated. And various groups, small and large, sought a place in the sun, forming their own republics and armies and both cooperating and competing with each other. The situation in the future seems to me far more likely to be that, like that than was the case in 1991. Second, 1918 was about regions and not just ethnicities. With national identities, far, uh, such regional identities far more important in much of the country than ethnic ones. If one looks at the way in which things played out in 1918 and the remainder of the Civil War, it was, ethnic, it was regional divisions far more than ethnic that mattered for the country as a whole. I believe that is also true now, and I, and I stand by what I've argued for some time, that regionalism is going to be, is going to play the role of nationalism in the next Russian revolution, which we are at the beginning of. Third, like in 1918, Moscow remains committed to recapturing the entire periphery, and outsiders, including the West, are divided between those who favor a weak but single state and those who fear a strong state that has gotten rid of what for many was ballast. Fourth, because outsiders were, were divided then, they collectively did just did just enough to power those Moscow opposed as foreign agents and to promote a, unintentionally a red patriotism, which ultimately allowed Moscow to defeat uh, most, but not all, of those who sought to form their own countries. Something similar can happen if a si similar set of mistakes are made. And fifth, the diversity of the structures first created from below and then destroyed by Moscow's reoccupation was so daunting that many outsiders viewed the restoration of order as more useful than it was, failing to see that the restoration set the stage for repression and imperial revenge by the Soviet Union and then by the Russian Federation after 1991. And finally, among the region, reasons that those outsiders who want to help the peoples of Northern Russia or Northern Eurasia achieve freedom, peace, and democracy need to recognize this very different comparison. The following five strike me as particularly important. First, the West needs to recognize its mistake in 1991 when it proclaimed just about everyone a Democrat and assumed, and this was the result of the collapse of communism and some change, intellectual changes in the United States in particular, assumed that the privatization of economic activity would solve everything else including weaning leaders from aggressive and repressive tendencies. If one wants democracy, rule of law, and conformity to international law, one must work to promote those things. If one assumes that the economy will do that on its own, as the West did 30 years ago, the results again will be what they have been so far, and they will not be welcome to many people. Second, for all the problems that the disintegration of the Russian Federation will inevitably involve, if the goal is to eliminate repression and impure revanchism, that is the only way forward in the case of many areas, many but not all. Hence, being for what some call secession is in fact the best way to achieve one of the most important goals of the West now. Short of that, the West must also work to promote general, genuine federalism for those parts of Northern Eurasia, which are not able to or do not want to go their own way. That will require a far a greater interventionist approach, but in, in my view, there is no other way. Third, the West, as well as the non-Russians and any regionalists, must recognize that there will be some Russian state left at the end 
of decolonizing and de-imperializing. That state must be a democracy, otherwise it will be a threat. And that is going to be something that the West is going to have to decide upon and decide how much, how interventionist it's going to be to make that possible. Fourth, the West must recognize that its role will have to be far larger than it ever was in the past and far more invasive as many in Russia will view it. Managing that without producing a backlash will not be easy. But failing to adapt, adopt that strategy will only postpone problems rather than prevent their reemergence. Had the West in, insisted on general federal, genuine federalism in the Russian Federation in the 1990s, there would have been no Putin and no war in Ukraine. It didn't, and both happened. And finally, fifth, the, the West must promote cooperation among Russians, among non-Russians, and between Russians and non-Russians, rather than assuming that this is impossible, or, and it must take the lead in having them talk to each other. If that doesn't happen, then there is a very real danger that 2024 will end not as in 1991, but as in 1918, and that would be a tragedy for everyone. If we're going to move forward, we need to understand just how complicated and difficult it's going to be rather than assuming that history is somehow on our side and that means we can ride we can ride this wave the fact of the matter is that our failures of 30 years ago and they were real failures despite all the hoopla that has been devoted to what the west did uh are we're now living with we're living with repression in russia we're living with uh in the invasion of ukraine we're living with a threat to the international order all of that could have been prevented had there been a serious effort to do more than declare victory and go home. Unfortunately, declaring victory and going home was a cheaper and easier option. Let that not be true again after Ukraine defeats Russia uh, in the current war. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. And now we'll take questions from the audience. Any questions? Okay, thank you, Paul, very much. We will now move thank you. to our next online speaker. And our next online speaker will be Stanislav Suslov. He is a representative of the movement of the independence of Siberia in the United States of Siberia. Stanislav, welcome. You have 15 minutes. Thank you. Uh, greetings, dear colleagues. I'm Stanislav Suslov, a representative of the movement of the independence of Siberia, the United States of Siberia. Due uh, to the limit time to speak, I will try to give a brief talk on some of the important points. Uh, some of my words uh, may show up uh, very radical to you, but without this, I believe, uh, we will not be able to defeat uh, Putinism. Putinism today is a mix of uh, is a mix of Stalinism and fascism in the uh, 21st century. We have talked a lot about how early Moscow is behaving towards uh, the uh, colonial provinces. Uh, it is time for us to move mm, on to uh, discussing uh, concrete offers. It is not yet possible to say exactly when the separation of the colonized provinces from the Moscow center will begin, but uh, this process is inventable because the so-called Russian Federation is now irrational. And believe me, Russian is more like a, a dead dinosaur that has already begun to decompose. Russian's uh, physical uh, decay is dangerous for the well world. Only the transform, transformation of the so-called Russian Federation into new independent countries will provide the world with security. 
Uh, the collapse of Russia's uh, banking system could be an important moment to speed up Ukraine's victory uh, in the war that Russia has started against it. Uh, Moscow uses uh, fast payment and payment system that operate in Russia to pay records in the Russian army and more. Their systems need to be blocked as much as possible. A financial collapse would turn the army's weapons against Moscow and the Kremlin. Also, any equipment for the banking sector should be blocked from the ship to Russia. The United States, European Union, Euro, European Union, now the United Nations need to make a solution and offer to speak to administration in the region of Russia now to prepare for independence. Uh, we would think that administration, one, one would think that administration are not prepared uh, to act on their own because uh, a point from Moscow. And some of them were personally appointed by Putin. But I want to remind you that this has already happened in history when the USSR was destroyed. At this point, almost all Kamenist administration magically became democratic. You will be hard pressed to find those administrators over the age of 50 who have not been a number of communist party or administrator in the Komsomol before. Uh, this means that these people have not, do not know, and will not in the future how, uh, have any um, fundamental convictions and don't care um, who they serve. It's Putin or some someone else. If the administration will know that they will get the vote, vote support, uh, I think it will be easy for them to prepare. But they need to know that uh, they will be helped and supported to break away from Moscow. Uh, if several regions uh, take independence at once, Moscow will not be able to do anything and they will have to act in several uh, directions, and it has less and less power. Uh, Bashkortostan, Kazakhstan, the Euro Republic, and the United States of Siberia, and others, uh, will be able to provide strong protection to uh, liberate it, the remaining regions of Siberia and the Far East. Um, they need to start uh, preparing teams for external monitoring and consulting now. I think that I already know it is necessary to prepare groups for talks with the administration of the regions of Russia and on behalf of the international community to give them guarantees for the security of their money and freedom. They will be given for exchange uh, for uh, securing public order in the region and protect nuclear objects and weapons. For the guarantees of the West will, be give, uh, them, will give them, uh, they will be bound uh, to do what I have just said. If they don't to do this, the region will not receive any international support. And they will be bound to begin the move of international uh, temporary control for the organization of democratic election. I would like to say a few words about the fact that um, in the new free countries, of course, in Siberia, laws will be passed that uh, recognize the uh, communist ideology and political party, as well as Putin's dictatorship, and the United Rush Party as a criminal organization. It is necessary for the Western world uh, community to make a clear to China that it cannot enter into a process of independence of the regions of Russia. A word about China, as it is very important for free Siberia and the Far East. 
trade with Russia accounts for only 3% in China's trade. It is almost nothing. Uh, China benefits from having Putin's um, weak Russia next to it, uh, that a few free and independent countries. China is born to listen, listen to <clears throat> those on whom it depends, its greatest trading partners, which are United States and the European Union. Unfortunately, because of limited speaking time, I want to say very short uh, things about the forum. Uh, after the creation of the new country, the United States of Siberia will be one of the first uh, to pass a law uh, on the payment of uh, the state share of reparation to Ukraine. It will also be mandatory to pass a law on restitution. It will also be mandatory to pass a law declaring the FSB and KGB and others as a banned criminal organization. A few words about the people in the so-called Russian Federation. When separating the regions, uh, we must also take into account that the uh, means of the large number of Russian citizens has uh, corrupted by uh, propaganda. Uh, for years, propaganda has been talking to them about the, how they cannot live without Moscow and how they cannot develop without Moscow. Propaganda is Russia is very dangerous and creates real anti-Western zombies. It is a, uh, it is a global degradation of Russian society. I draw your attention to the fact that it is a great mistake to hope that this process will stop if there is only a change of power in the Kremlin. Nothing will change from a change in power. Global security needs a deep and complete organization of the total so-called Russian Federation. If the international community doesn't understand after a territory, a temporary law uh, on uh, an army of Putin's, uh, Putinists will come to your homes where they will rape and kill your children and your family. And also, it is important to make sure that there is no possible way for Moscow's imperial propaganda to work. Unfortunately, Moscow propaganda channels are still now using European trans transported satellites to broadcast to Europe. Moscow propaganda resources are also not blocking the internet. We need to understand that the short time uh, commercial profit uh, can now turn into 10 times uh, the problems and losses in the future. If the international community of the West puts its money now into the process of decolonization of Russia region, nuclear dismantling and destruction, it will result in great profits in the future. If this moment is lost now, the losses will be many times greater than a possible profit for the world. Uh, and uh, and if, um, if any has uh, any questions, I would be happy to answer them, but um, but now, right? Uh, but not right now. Please send me a mail or some other way. The organization you uh, have my contact. Thank you very much. Thank you for your attention. That's all. Uh, thank you very much, Stanislav. So now we will move to our next online participant. We will go to Davor Dorjev. He is a member of the Congress of the Oria Khamur people in a specialist in foreign affairs. Davor, welcome. Uh, dear all, I am thrilled to pronounce a speech at this conference. On behalf of the Oria Khamur People's Congress, I am greeting all the participants, both off and online. The subject matter of my report is preventing the calamity in independent Kalmykia and lower Volga region. The structure of my speech will be the following. Firstly, I'll explain what I mean by the term calamity. I'll delve into the origins of this issue and, and the scale of uh, thereof. 
you are, you are invited to take into consideration the context in which Kalmykia and other parts of the lower Volga region will exist. Then I'll continue with a brief excursion into history. Uh, American Relief Administration activities in Pavolgia region will be touched upon. After that, we'll swiftly move towards those opportunities which international governmental organizations and NGOs uh, may provide in the event of the worst case scenario. Obviously, Kalmykia may not be a simple object, but a subject under international law ruled by a democratic power independent from, from the Kremlin. Various transport routes may be used to provide humanitarian aid to Kalmykia. This report will be concluded with an analysis of reasons why the world would find it advantageous to support the lower Volga region once its parts regain their independence. The title might be a bit provocative to some extent, though the issue is reasonable and should be examined thoroughly. When I say calamity, I mean a high risk uh, of a humanitarian crisis caused by existing problems in Kalmykia, including lack of potable water, electrical ener energy deficit, etc. According to the 2021 Federal Agency for Mineral Resources Research, as of 2021, uh, Republic of Kalmykia was dependent on the electricity flows produced by neighboring regions of uh, uh, Rostov Oblast and Astrakhan respectively. Although Kalmykia has a vast potential of developing alternative energy sources, including solar power, as of 2023, the Republic is still incapable of electrical energy self-sufficiency. As to potable water, uh, only 7.8% of Kalmykian population receives potable water from a centralized water supply. The foundation for the development of territories data. More than 90% of Kalmykia residents consume water uh, which contains minerals uh, with an excess of corresponding minimal allowable concentration standards, according to the officials of Kalmykia, obviously. These are realities in which oil of Kalmyks in Kalmykia live now. And it goes without saying that the situation is likely to worsen once we become independent. I claim that only overwhelming international support from NGOs and international bodies aimed at humanitarian aid may prevent the worst case scenario for the future of Kalmykia and lower Volga region on the whole. The risk oriented approach hints that existing supplies from Russian regions are likely to be halted in order to block uh, the order Kalmyk's movement towards sovereignty and bring us back uh, to what Russians call Radnaya uh, Gavin. It's a it's an infamous Putin's expression, home port. One may ask me if uh, the so-called Russian liberals would act as re reliable partners in this issue. I highly likely, uh, I highly doubt that, because uh, I take into account their current um, uh, rhetoric. In my eyes, it is highly likely that new Russian power in Moscow, whether liberal or conservative would take any measure to stop the rupture of South Russia, Lower Volga included, uh, up to the large-scale blockade of Kalmykia. It might be something comparable to the ongoing blockade of Nagorno-Karabakh, condemned by the national community. Let us delve into a historic example of international cooperation in the context of the to total failure of statehood in Lower Volga. In 1921-1922, the Great Famine, mostly orchestrated by the Bolsheviks, commenced in Kalmykia, Astrakhan, Stavropol, and other adjacent territories. The U.S. administration launched a comprehensive humanitarian aid initiative, the American Relief Administration, a state-backed NGO, which was entitled to provide starving people with food. At its peak, the ARA fed 10.5 million people daily. This initiative was funded by the American people, to whom I personally am immensely grateful. The model of the ARA functioning might be a great help to address the aforesaid issue adequately. Let me be clear. I'm not trying to convince you that my homeland would turn into something depicted by uh, the Walking Dead series. 
Neither am I saying that the Great Famine would happen again. No, I'm not talking about risks. As you may know, foreseeing and preventing crisis uh, is something experts must do. The current architecture of the international community dictates a certain direction for all such like humanitarian activities. Uh, the UN family of organizations includes uh, those bodies competent to coordinate the humanitarian aid supply to Kalmykia and lower Volga regions. I refer to Food and Agri Agriculture Organization, World Health Organization. If Moscow would commit a provocation against Kalmykia to hinder our liberation movement, the International Red Cross Committee is competent to provide diversified aid to individuals in danger, including health care, water supply, and humanitarian diplomacy. I am sure that US and EU institutions wouldn't turn a blind eye to the situation we're talking about. Then US and EU-backed ad hoc initiatives would be deeply involved with humanitarian efforts taken by the aforesaid structures. A careful listener might confront me with the following. Any humanitarian aid initiative bears a certain risk of misconduct or mere corruption. It's widely known that authorities might urge for help, but would refrain from conduct akin to theft or swindle. To prevent that, Kalmykia and other newly constituted neighboring states must be ruled by a democratic power independent from Moscow. A vote of trust, which would reflect the people of Kalmykia's will to, um, to become a free state, along with the foreign supervision over humanitarian aid distribution, is likely to prevent any inappropriate behavior of any official. Good governance is a pillar for any government, obviously, especially in a state of calamity. To fully immerse into the context of Kalmykia, my dear listeners, I'd like you to understand that Russian colonial power is reluctant to develop, to develop the economy of Kalmykia. There are plenty of opportunities within our region. Um, which might entail economic growth. For instance, in Lagan, a town located in the south of Kalmykia, near the Caspian Sea, federal and regional authorities plan to build an international maritime seaport. It should become an integral part of the intergovernmental project of uh, the Eurasia Channel, which would connect the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea, respectively. The effect on the Kalmykian economy um, could be enormous, as it would result in the creation of new jobs, higher tax revenues, and uh, impetus to the development of local, small, and medium-sized sized businesses. As of 2023, this project seems to be abandoned. This is a striking example of Russian authorities' willingness, unwillingness, I'm sorry, to promote the uh, development of Kalmykia because its participation in such like international projects would contribute to Kalmykia's political subjectivity, something inadmissible for Moscow. In my humble opinion, the poor state of critical infrastructure in Kalmykia on the whole is brought on by Russia's uncertainty about the ability to keep Kalmykia subservient. Uh, Janusz Bogalski, in his recent book, uh, Failed State, A Guide to Russia's Rupture, claims that Republic of Kalmykia has ample opportunities to leave Russia. Having a full understanding of that, Russia deliberately tends to inhibit the development of oil of Kalmyks as a nation. The aforesaid leads us to the following matter. What exactly Kalmykia would be in need of? How can these resources be transported to Kalmykia? These questions have their answers. Firstly, uh, residents of Kalmykia would be in dire need of potable water and electrical energy. The policy of terror which Russia might apply would definitely include the cutoff of these um, critical resources as I said earlier. Kalmykia is dependent on supplies from other regions, then the air relief with the use of Elisa Airport, Elisa is our capital, uh, which holds uh, an international flight license by the way, might be a way to provide the affected with the resources they would seek. If the political conjuncture would be uh, horrible, uh, the supplies might be carried out with the use of Astrakhan International Airport. One shouldn't forget about the Ola and the Astrakhan seaport, which could be also used for such purposes. 
I expect that they would remain under Astrakhan effective control, obviously. But to satisfy the needs of Kalmykian citizens, the humanitarian uh, aid initiatives should consider the supply of potable water, medicine, food, and power generators to keep the critical infrastructure at work. Last but not least, you may think to yourself at this point, quote, what's the reason for the international community to even consider the humanitarian supply to Kalmykia and Lower Volga? Truth is, the aforementioned routes, both maritime and the air routes, can also be used for commercial traffic. The influence of Kalmyk uh, and the uh, Astrakhan routes on the economies of the Caspian states and India is significant now, uh, and it will continue to grow. Imagine Russia is no longer capable of manipulating Kazakhstan, Iran, and uh, other adjacent states to promote uh, their corrupt policy of instability and unpredict unpredictability. I refer to Russia, obviously. I'm convinced that Order Kalmyk, uh, the only European Buddhist nation, by the way, wouldn't forget all the good the international community would do for Kalmykia. This might be a huge step for Order Kalmyk toward the extended pan-European family and the comprehensive integration into the European economic community. What I've just described is certainly a model. It, it is possible not to become a reality. As I've mentioned earlier, the international community, along with non-Russian national liberation movements, should calculate the probability of the worst-case scenarios among others which are positive. Uh, such models uh, must be based upon the risk-oriented uh, approach. The results should be taken into consideration by all the stakeholders. We're on the threshold of Russia's rupture, the major political event in 21st century. Kalmykia, my beloved homeland, will probably never have another chance to restore its independence, its statehood. Uh, then I won't hesitate to draw uh, the attention of the international community to plausible humanitarian crises which might arise from the old problem, unsolved problem. Thankfully, the West understanding of what struggles non-Russians are facing improves, albeit quite slowly. But it is in our power to turn the tables and guarantee the welfare of the soon-to-be post-Russia free nations. Please continue to support Ukraine because their fight is fair. Glory to Ukraine, and as uh, my Buddhist mantra claims, Om Mani Padme Hum. Thank you. Thank you, Davor. We have time for one question from the audience. Yes, right here. Bakhtiar, I'm from Kazakhstan. I would like to ask this question. So uh, I would like to see what are your views on the the fact that the uh, Astrakhan region is actually historically a Kazakh land. How are you looking at the future border with Kazakhstan? So uh, this question to a uh, previous speaker. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the question. As I as I said earlier, uh, I believe in economic integration, which uh, would imply no borders for, uh, for individuals, for uh, the flow of goods and resources, respectively. So uh, I doubt that this uh, question uh, would be relevant uh, once uh, we become independent. Thank you. Thank you very much, Devor. We will now go to an in-person speaker, Vladislav Inozantsev. He is a special advisor at the Middle East Media Research Institute. Vladislav, welcome. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, I'm glad to be here, and uh, I will try to uh, come a little bit back to the topic of this session, which was largely associated with uh, guarantees of international peace. Uh, and security architecture in, uh, in Eurasia uh, if uh, something happens to the Russian Federation this in its current form. So uh, listening to all the, uh, uh, all the speakers today, I would greatly uh, support and associate myself with uh, 
uh, Mr. Paul Goebel, uh, who, uh, admi uh, you know, who admitted a lot of problems uh, which can occur uh, connected with the Russian disintegration, and first of all, uh, who um, brought our attention to the very important and I would say obvious fact that what we have now in Russia and what can happen in quite a close perspective is very different of what happened in 1991. Uh, when Mr. Gorbachev uh, and Mr. Yeltsin presided over a largely peaceful dissolution of the Soviet Union. Uh, I would say that uh, the problems uh, Russia now faces are very much different from the problems uh, the Soviet Union faced uh, 30 or even 40, 30 years ago. Uh, first of all, and the major problem is that uh, just after 1989, when the last Soviet census was undertaken, uh, it was obvious that uh, the Russian population, the share of the Russians uh, in the Soviet Union fell below 50% for the first time in Russian imperial history. Uh, today, the share of the Russians in the Russian Federation is staying above 80%. And to dissolve such a mono-ethnic nation, a mono-ethnic country into different pieces would be an, uh, a task, uh, an adventure, which was really unseen in the global history. In except uh, under the foreign occupation. So therefore, I would say that uh, bec uh, besides uh, the, a lot of problems uh, of national republics, which can emerge and hopefully maybe will emerge, on this territory, it would be a big problem of the Russian Republic or Russian subject or Russian different territories, which will definitely uh, remain in, 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 uh, on this territory. And the relationship between uh, these territories and all the other national republics would be, I think, the global headache for the world. The second point is that, look, uh, I would say, uh, speaking here in Washington, yeah, or addressing the Western audience, what is very crucial to the whole issue is to outline uh, the role and the importance of the outside community, of international community, in uh, what may happen to, to today's Russia and what may arise after uh, some kind of Russian transformation or disintegration. Because from my point of view, the international community is definitely unprepared uh, to anything like this. Uh, and we already heard from different speakers today that after the independence is proclaimed, uh, one territory needs United Nations peacekeepers, another nation said that we will need economic assistant, uh, assistance and whatever. So my, po my, my point is that I cannot imagine uh, that the international community will readily accept this kind of development and will pour resources uh, in, in the remaining territories and will send uh, peacekeepers there. Uh, more, uh, of course, it was also mentioned by Mr. Goebel that Mr. Putin uh, doesn't resemble Mr. Gorbachev in any possible way. So therefore, uh, you know, if uh, Russia will uh, fall apart, uh, fall apart. It definitely will be you know, a huge bloodshed during this uh, uh, this process. So anyway, my point, my major point, is not about whether Russia can fall apart or cannot. My personal opinion is that it's very unlikely. But nevertheless, uh, I'm a uh, complete propo you know, proponent of de-imperialization uh, and uh, of complete transformation of this realm. Because the last empire should be somehow transformed. Uh, it should be the best way it should transform. It would be like uh, being transformed into a confederation uh, without uh, huge powers residing in Moscow. Uh, and most, uh, most important, to be transformed under the, uh, the control of the global community. Uh, in this case, what reminds me uh, of a successful story uh, is uh, the story of the post-war Germany. Because, uh, of course, now everyone uh, would like to speak uh, on Russia, uh, on, about Russia as a new fascist state. I already myself wrote about this, even being in Russia in 2015, and many times thereafter. Uh, but, and uh, there are a lot of parallels between you know, Hitler's Germany, Nazi Germany, and Putin's Russia, and many of them are actually very much uh, grounded. But the problem is that uh, the European and the Western community, uh, the difference of its approach uh, to Germany after 2000, uh, 1918 
1945 was that they became uh, wise enough to understand that Germany can be transformed only if it is invited and you know, included into the Western community and the rules are imposed on Germany and not saying that Germany is another normal country as it was said was the, uh, the Weimar Republic in 1918. So uh, from my point of view, uh, the most uh, reasonable and the most uh, realistic way to change Russia forever would be not to you know, alienate it from the West, but after the uh, Ukrainian victory, after all this political transformation in which can occur in Russia, because Russian history is going in a pendulum mode, it's sometimes it's very anti-Western, then it is you know, another perestroika whatsoever. And so the point, uh, my point is that after Ukraine wins this war, after Russia will be humiliated on, on, the, uh, on, on the front, uh, after it will encounter some kind of economic problems, I absolutely, I'm absolutely sure that it will not be, you know, uh, an economic disaster like it was uh, in the end of the First World War, by no means. But nevertheless, it would be a, a time of hardships and a time of rethinking of what has happened during Putin's years and maybe even during Yeltsin's years because I do not make a huge difference between Yeltsin and Putin. Nevertheless, so the Western nations, the global community should have a plan and should have a proposal for Russia to become more democratic, more law-abiding nation in, in a huge framework of Western institutions. And if you have this very problematic empire in, like you had Germany in, 19, uh, in late 1940s, you can then promote a federalization or a confederation mode. Because uh, in this case, it would be better for both the world and Russia and post-Russia, if you want, like to say, to manage this process. Because if, for example, Russia is a part, I, I would not say European Union, but a part of the Western community, and it should abide um, the laws and principles of this community, you should impose a, a policy which is really very similar to the policy of Europe of the regions, where, you know, the Catalonia or Scotland or any other region can have a huge autonomy. Maybe they want to leave, no problem. I, I'm not uh, you know, a Russian imperialist who say the Chechen uh, Republic yeah. cannot be independent. It can, maybe it should, because they, uh, they brought a huge, huge sacrifice on the altar of, the, of their independence. It, 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 it's, uh, it, it might be a good and uh, not only good, but a very just thing to have them independent. But I'm absolutely sure that it will not change into a rush of 89 or 93 regions because they're very different. Many of them want to be independent, many of them don't want. Moreover, a lady from Buratia said very honestly, and it was a very good um, uh, you know, speech, when she said that uh, Buratia Republic, was the borders were redrawn several times during the Soviet times. Of course, they were, and this is everywhere. So what are the new borders? Because in the same Buratia, maybe 30% of the population is Russian. Will they be expelled or not? How it will work? I can't, ex I can't understand. So from my point of view, the biggest problem today, one of the biggest problems, is that the West, some people in the West, they hail the disintegration of Russia as a new uh, security uh, you know, guarantee. Some others say it would be a nightmare, but no one actually tries to uh, present a, some kind of viable strategy of how to deal with this. With this, with this country after the Ukrainian victory. And I think this is an essential element of the global security problem for the 21st century. Because if Russia goes apart, falls apart, it might be, might be uh, peaceful, might be not. But nevertheless, you will have, you know, China and the Euros uh, just in a in couple of years. You want this? If you want, okay, go ahead. If you don't want this, because, you know, here in the United States, uh, the national security doctrine says that China is uh, the most uh, important advisory and the most important threat for the United States for the 21st century. You want to strengthen it? Okay, welcome. So therefore, it's necessary to have a deep and elaborated agenda of how the Western countries can help not a breakaway Buryatia or breakaway Chechnya, but how they can transform all this territory into something more viable and more civilized for the 21st century. Thank you.
Thank you. Questions from the audience? Yes, in the back. Okay, point by point. First, you said that uh, world have to uh, try to integrate Russia more in the Western society, right? And uh, what did West comparing with Russia, comparing what did West with Germany after Second World War? Sorry, but Russia not was occupied by any NATO countries. Russia don't lose any matter of territory as happened in Germany, when millions of German was deported from Poland, from Czech Republic, from different places, yeah? And Germany pay, I cannot say high price, comparing what they did. Russia don't pay nothing. After five months, when all world celebrating that Russia is independent, Russia is democratic, Yeltsin was <coughs> winning an election, and everybody was happy, what did after five months Russia? Russia started to special secret operation in Transistria and occupied this region, yeah? After that, it's five months, five months. After that, Russia started uh, operation in Abkhazia where Mr. Shoigu, Mr. Shoigu was responsible for all logistic things for Abkhazian so-called army and South Ossetia, yeah? And after that, as today said, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Klochkov, he came to Tajikistan and one day he killing somebody from government, next day he killing somebody from opposition and after a couple of weeks they started to kill each other and he just watching how, oh sorry, it's civil war. And today when you're talking that we have to give the chance, I think for Russian, yes, for Suzdal, for Voronezh, for uh, Tver, for Moscow, of course, it's a choice of Russia. Russian people, and it's a choice of world. But, sorry, it's not our choice. We are in Gushen, we are Buratian, other, other, other nation, it's 180 nations, all of them have to be liberated, released from this camp. Why? Because if you're talking about China, sorry, problem with China, everything, uh, we have to be together again with Russia under China. We don't want to be, we tire it. We're really tired to fight always. We're really tired to make, you know, uh, how to say, right. Sorry, I'm a little bit emotional because for me, when you're talking that world have a choice, uh, sorry, world have a choice. We don't have a choice. We small nation don't have a choice. And we don't want to die today in Ukraine. Now, now, situation became on the level when one nation, for example, my nation, Chechenian nation fighting on the both sides of the uh, front line. Part of us, l free people, it's his own choice, fighting for uh, Ukraine, for liberation in the future, part of this, uh, you call this part of Russia, we call it independent state. Uh, but other guys, without any choice, they collect them, give them rifles, and sending them die. They called meat Sturman, Mesnei Sturman, you know what is it, yeah? when they sending battalion and after 42 minutes, you don't have anyone who is not or not wounded or not killed. And if you look at the map, Moscow is wide, yeah? Not so too much guys, Russian guys from Moscow, but Buryatia is red, Tuva is red, Chechnya and other, other regions. And sorry, if we want to build normal future, we are small nation think that all those nation who living have to be released and have his own small, comfortable, democratic or not democratic, but independent countries. And Russia, people has to have his own Russian Republic. And believe me, I don't think so that China will be biggest problem than Russia. Because tell me when China attack any country for after Tibet, for example. Uh, China tried to do something in Vietnam, and we know how it's finished, yeah? When immediately Vietnam Army, and sorry, it's uh, not comfortable and not uh, available for us, you know, to take this decision to stay with you in democratic. It's, we don't trust, sorry, but experience. Thank you.
many cases, in many points I completely agree. First of all, when you talk about uh, Transnistria and uh, Abkhazia, I agree 100%. And I wrote several articles, both in Russia and here, saying that the Yeltsin regime and the Putin regime is a very con real continuation of Russian imperial revival. Uh, and uh, I was actually hated by many of Russian, you know, opposition Democrats uh, saying this because they were uh, quite important figures to use the Yeltsin time. Uh, the only issue, I also agree with, with you that you are saying that, you know, the small nations want not to, 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 to split uh, and to become independent is a very natural feeling. It's a very natural idea. But look, the problem is that one point, uh, one element is what we wish, and another element is what we can. So I want to put your attention on the very important fact that when Russians uh, waged their war in Chechnya, the Western world was okay, it was sympathetic to the Chechens, but it was nothing like, you know, the support for Ukraine, uh, which, which we can uh, see now, because Ukraine is an uh, independent, recognized, sovereign nation, and Chechnya was the part of the Russian Federation. I know it hadn't signed the, the Federation Treaty of 1992. So it formally was not a part of the Russian Federation from my point of view. But for the international community it was. Uh, and so therefore it was not so big support as it is for Ukraine. So I believe that if, for example, a kind of a civil war or national liberation movement erupts in the Russian Federation these days, it will not be supported by the West. With all my condolences, but it will not be supported by the Western powers because the idea of separatism is not very welcomed in the West, uh, in, the, in different sense. So my point was not about you shouldn't fight for this, or not about you shouldn't be independent, by no way. My point was to say that the Western community should elaborate his own attitude and his own program and his own framework of what to do with Russia. For example, there is no consensus what to do, for example, if the national liberation movement erupts in Russia. No Western politicians will say we will support it or we will condemn it. There is no consensus in the West. And it should be. Some of this should be achieved. Moreover, look, of course, I... Uh, Please know, wrap I, up quickly. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Okay, fine. No problem. Thank you very much. And I'm sorry to cut you off. But moving to our next um, in-person speaker, we have Dr. Anders Osland. He is an economist and former senior fellow at the Atlantic Council. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for the invitation, and I uh, warned uh, Pavel that I will uh, talk about uh, how Russia should be, be ruled. So it's uh, somewhat uh, similar to what uh, Vladislav uh, talked about, but I will not talk about the Federation or uh, uh, national uh, questions within Russia. But I will start in a similar position as he did. First, we should have a Ukrainian victory. That uh, is the most uh, essential thing. What is likely to happen after that? Well, uh, after the Crimean War uh, uh, or in 1855, uh, after uh, uh, the uh, Russia-Japanese War, and uh, after the failure in the World War I, we saw fundamental uh, systemic change in Russia. A losing war, you normally lose power in Russia. So we would expect Putin to go. Mm -hmm. I'm not uh, suggesting how, but of course the natural thing would be that uh, somebody close to him kills him. And uh, that would be a pretty ideal uh, solution. The earlier, the better. So what would happen next? I see two alternative uh, uh, scenarios. Uh, the bad one, which is probably close to Günther's uh, thinking, that is uh, uh, Serbia after Milosevic. That you have a sense of victimhood, and this worries me today in Russia. Uh, in what way are we guilty? Why are the West doing all of this to us, who haven't done anything? Uh, I, I, there's a worrisome tendency that the Russians don't think that they are guilty, which is exactly what the Serbs think. Milosevic was so uh, fine a man, and they supported him all the way when he started these uh, various uh, uh, mad hat wars against uh, other uh, uh, nations in Yugoslavia. So this is my fear. My hope that is August 91, 
when the whole thing just collapses. And that's my main scenario, that uh, uh, Putin has a personal authoritarian system. There are no institutions that are pr uh, protecting it. That when it collapses, it will collapse fully, and power will, as in 91, be lying in the streets. That's what I'm hope for, and that's my uh, main uh, scenario. I was working as an economic advisor to the Russian government, uh, the reform government, from November 91 until January 94. And of course, one thinks of what uh, uh, succeeded, I will not discuss that, and what uh, did n uh, not uh, uh, succeed. My uh, task was on the economic side, but of course, uh, one has to look up on the, the politics also. And I would uh, uh, suggest to you six different things. The first is obvious. Freedom, freedom, freedom. Freedom of assembly, freedom of um, uh, the media, uh, freedom uh, of uh, speech. That must come first, and it must be uh, 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 fully. Then a second issue is, um, is economic. There's one thing that must be avoided and that is hyperinflation. If Russia would break up, as the Soviet Union did, you need to fix the monetary system, otherwise you get hyperinflation. The world has recorded, so far, 58 hyperinflations. Not a large number, but half of them happen with the collapse of communism. 28 hyperinflations. All the post-Soviet countries ended up with hyperinflation. And uh, not surprisingly, none of them has had democracy surviving. Hyperinflation is a terrible shock. It turns around all morals. The, nothing uh, is fair any longer. So therefore, it must be avoided. How do you do it? Uh, you need to have uh, a strong central bank either in each new state, or you have one for all, uh, all of them. Uh, what you must not have is in the, when the Habsburg Empire broke up, it was only Czechoslovakia, but it instantly established its own currency and a strong central bank that voided uh, 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 hyperinflation. In the former Soviet Union, uh, uh, it was a complete mess. Uh, because uh, independent currencies were not established uh, early enough. The reformers in Russia, Yegor Gaidar, for example, wanted to establish it as fast as possible, but he could not get that uh, uh, through the, um, uh, the uh, process. So this is the, the first thing, uh, which, uh, or second thing, which is uh, economic. Then the third thing is prohibit the KGB. The FSB, as it's now called, and uh, the FSO. The way of solving it, we can see in the three Baltic states. Do away with all the old KGB structures, establish new uh, uh, counterintelligence organizations that you actually uh, need, but the domestic uh, uh, KGB is, uh, should not be, uh, uh, be allowed. Here, Yeltsin, uh, sensibly divided the KGB into five organizations. Putin has now put them together again. And uh, uh, Yeltsin sacked half the KGB officers, which uh, was not enough. Do away with all of them, otherwise you can't build a, a democracy. The KGB will come back. I say KGB intentionally, if you want them. And then fourth, hold early elections. This, I thought, all the time was uh, Yeltsin's big mistake. Yeltsin had been elected uh, president of Russia with 57 uh, uh, percent majority on the 12th of uh, June uh, 1991. Therefore, he, for good reason, thought that he had uh, a democratic mandate and that he could rule by decree. To rule by decree is very bad for many reasons. You don't get a constituency behind each um, law, and you get contradictory 
uh, decrees that are supported by uh, different uh, uh, people. And uh, uh, when there is no constituency behind each uh, law, as you get when the things are being discussed in committees in parliament and voted through in a parliament, then you don't get the respect for uh, the, the, the decrees. So therefore, it's vital to have early democratic elections. What happened in Russia was uh, uh, that uh, the red-brown, uh, who were not very strong uh, in the f uh, fall of 91, all of a sudden uh, turned up and became two-thirds of majority in the uh, uh, parliament by the summer of, uh, of uh, uh, 92. That's why it's vital to hold early parliamentary elections. And uh, the, sec the fifth thing that you need to do is to establish a parliamentary system. Because uh, we are now seeing that in the former Soviet Union, essentially all the uh, systems became presidential system, more or less, usually more. And when you have a presidential system, this is Juan Lin's uh, uh, classical uh, seminal article about uh, uh, presidential uh, systems, they tend to become authoritarian. And it's very difficult to get a presidential system uh, that, that functions. So we can see on the post-communist world, the democratic countries have a parliamentary system, the dictatorial countries have presidential systems, and the countries in between, like uh, Ukraine, uh, Georgia, Moldova, they have uh, uh, pre presidential parliamentary uh, systems. Uh, I should add um, uh, Armenia also. So move straight away to a parliamentary state sharply against divisive nationalism. Uh, the US and most countries want to have as much as uh, status quo for as long as possible. Uh, and uh, if you look uh, upon Africa, it took an enormous time for Eritrea uh, to be, uh, be accepted as uh, leaving uh, Ethiopia, uh, South Sudan, uh, it, it took, uh, was it 20 years of uh, civil war uh, b before South Sudan uh, was uh, uh, accepted by the, the US then. But by and large, countries want uh, uh, all nations uh, to stay, or territories to stay within uh, the, the country in question for as long as it was. It's not specifically about the US, it's about pretty much every country. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Right here in the front. Thank you. Uh, Anders, I have a the China question. And uh, pretty, I mean, it was raised by Slava, but uh, would interested in your opinion. Do you, do you think that it's uh, really a danger that China would sort of occupy the eastern part of today's Russian Federation? What do you think about it? I mean, because that, I mean, Russians are raising this issue all the time. Yes, I think so. I think that it's a, a, a direct uh, uh, concern. Uh, you can say that the world today has more countries than can be defended. The basic idea of a country is that it can defend itself. And that, or that it can be in alliances or that it uh, can stay independent. And uh, there are extremely few people uh, in the uh, east of, um, of the Urals. And uh, there are lots of uh, good resources there. We can see now that the Chinese are interested in Greenland. How many people do you have in Greenland? Well, a few tens of thousands and a lot of ice. And when the ice disappears, then the minerals come up uh, <coughs> to, uh, to the surface. I see that this is a, an obvious uh, 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 security uh, uh, danger. The Chinese do claim a lot of historical territories. They even put uh, Chinese names on various uh, uh, Russian uh, cities. Uh, and they show maps where a, a large part of Siberia belongs uh, to China. Uh, listen to them and believe uh, them when they say so. The other thing is that like Putin, but even so more so, 
the Chinese move deliberately. They don't do it uh, immediately. We hear all the time that they want to take uh, Taiwan, but we don't know when. But we don't uh, hesitate that they want to do it. They say uh, similar things about uh, large parts of uh, 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 Siberia. Believe them when they say so. Thank you. We will now move to our next speaker, who is a, a virtual participant. Vadim Sidorov is a PhD student at Charles University in Prague and is also ambassador of the Eastern Caribbean platform. Welcome, Vadim. You have 15 minutes. Uh, thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for the possibility to share my vision with you. Uh, since uh, the topic of our meeting is a uh, new architecture of whole northern Eurasia, uh, my uh, topic is uh, new architecture of uh, Baltic parts of peace. And uh, why this uh, uh, topic is actual because uh, in the situation of cruel war against Ukraine, we uh, have to remember the idea which can be uh, described as old but still bold. This is idea of the Baltic Black Sea Union, which was uh, which was uh, promoted by Belarusian National Democrats in the early 19th and which was supported by their colleagues in the Ukraine, in Baltic countries, and in Poland. And uh, we can uh, clearly uh, state that if this idea was realized, we would uh, already have uh, dramatically uh, another architecture of Northern Eurasia or of the Europe itself. And uh, here my colleague uh, Magometo Reeves spoke about, you know, imperial steps of Yeltsin regime in the early 19th. Uh, and I can say that uh, not refusing it, uh, that, that was a 1994, which was a turning point of uh, dramatical reimperialization of Russia. And there were two steps in that direction. First step is uh, obvious. It was a cruel, massive war against the independent Chechen Republic. But there were steps uh, before it, and uh, there were uh, elections in Belarus or in the Republic Belarus, which uh, helped Moscow satellite Lukashenko to take control under this very, very important country. Because if uh, in that elections uh, would uh, win the Belarus national national democratic leader Zenon Pozniak and Belarus uh, instead of uh, turning into the Russian colony and satellite uh, could uh, become the part of Baltic and Black Sea Union. The architecture of Eurasia also could be now dramatically another peaceful and uh, more secure. So how all this is uh, connected with the topic of post-Russia? It is because uh, we need to understand to understand this idea of the new architect architecture of uh, Baltic region. We uh, need to uh, fix the problem. The problem uh, today is that uh, Belarus is under the control of Moscow, and uh, Lithuanian Republic, which is a part of uh, NATO and European Union, but uh, actually it is surrounded from one side by Belarus, Belarus, which is a part of Russian Empire and not an independent state uh, de facto, of course, I, I spoke about it. And from the other side by so-called Kaliningrad region, which is uh, really a military exclave of uh, Russia in the European Union. Uh, and to understand uh, and to fix our problem, uh, you know, we need to do it because next time when we will have opportunity 
like we had it in the early 19th. Uh, we uh, need not to repeat our mistakes which uh, were done there. Uh, and to uh, not to do them, we need to understand how all this happened uh, during uh, the history of the uh, last 20th century and maybe more old history. Because the first uh, step, which was the most important uh, in the building of Russia empire, was the uh, defeat of the great uh, duchy of Lithuania, which was not, uh, you know, the kind of modern Lithuanian Republic, which is national uh, independent state, but it was a, a huge uh, multinational, multi-confessional uh, space of Baltic Slavic uh, nations. And uh, only after this space uh, was defeated, a uh, Russian empire could be established. Uh, but even, you know, after it, Russian empire, uh, Russian empire recognized uh, historical re reality of uh, that region. I mean, there were no, uh, as, as, as we know, uh, nation states inside Russian empire, but there were some symbolical entities. And uh, one of them was the uh, so-called Western or Northern Western region, uh, which uh, began in the Kaunas and, and uh, ended in the modern Smolensk region and uh, of, of Russian Federation, current Russian Federation. And uh, historically it included in it some, uh, some pieces of current Western part of Russian Federation uh, which were uh, organically connected with this space. And uh, that's why when the Russian Empire ruptured, uh, the founders of Belarusian independent states uh, following that pattern, they tried to include in the Belarusian, uh, the Belarusian National Republic uh, not only the current territory of the Belarus, Belarusia, but uh, also the parts of Smolensk region, the parts of Tver region, the parts of Skov region, which were organically connected with this space, and uh, Vilnius, which was a common place for Lithuanians and uh, Belarusians. And uh, we also know that same as it was with the great uh, Dutch uh, of, of Lithuania for the Soviet Russia, the struggle against the Marshal Pilsudski was the main geopolitical task. And uh, even this task for them uh, in, of struggle with Pilsudski himself uh, was, uh, wasn't reached, wasn't reached. Uh, they, uh, unfortunately, they could neutralize the important part of this uh, landscape, uh, which was an uh, independent Belarusian Republic. And uh, to reach their, that uh, task, they uh, used spoilers. It is an ancient, you know, instrument of Moscow politics. So they established spoiler Soviet Republic of Belarus to defeat real independent Belarus and to defeat uh, Lithuania, they established uh, a common Belarusian Lithuanian Soviet Republic, you know. But even in doing it, they uh, had they had to recognize those uh, historical and geographical patterns because the first Soviet Belarusian Republic uh, which was established by, by communists. Uh, it was established in Smolensk, and the Smolensk was capital of the Soviet Belarusian Republic. Uh, of course, after the reaching that point, uh, after the uh, defeating of real independent Belarus, they took uh, from Belarus Smolensk region, 
But even after that, they included a small inscription uh, together with parts of uh, uh, another western regions of Russia, not in the so-called uh, Central Russia. They included them in the western region. So uh, that's how they recognized you know, this uh, historical pattern of the great uh, Lithuanian duchy. Uh, and uh, that was the Stalin who dramatically changed the landscape and the patterns of uh, this region. So how he did it? Uh, after and before Second World War, uh, we know this fact of Molotov and Ribbentrop. Uh, Stalin, uh, when he shared, you know, uh, with, when, when he divided with the Nazi Third Reich uh, the territory of uh, Poland, uh, and he he was able actually to to control uh, uh, under the uh, Vilnius. Uh, he also uh, followed this uh, tactic. To use um, uh, to use uh, like uh, spoilers and uh, uh, manipulation to neutralize uh, his geopolitical enemy. So he left the Vilnius region to Lithuania in the aim to took all Lithuania, which he actually did. And uh, after Second World War, when they took the part of uh, uh, of Eastern Prussia, uh, which uh, later became the Kaliningrad region, they uh, didn't uh, they didn't join this region uh, to the Poland or to the Lithuania, which was quite logically from the geographical point of view. They even didn't uh, join it to the Belarusian Soviet Republic, which could be done using uh, Suvalki uh, space, but they uh, transformed, they uh, established uh, the Kaliningrad Oblast of Russian Federation Re Republic, which was absolutely unlogical you know, from a geographical point of view, because Russia itself has no uh, words with Kaliningrad region. So, uh, and uh, very important also point that they uh, they eliminated this Western region of Russia, which uh, was uh, established from the Smolensk region, Tver region, Bransk region, and other, and they included these historical parts of uh, uh, of Great Duchy Lithuania in the so-called. Central Russia, which was established uh, by Stalin and after Stalin, and uh, after what they uh, become to assimilate these historical regions in the so-called Central Russia. So uh, when we uh, speak today about the next possible chance uh, and uh, about the uh, realization of this idea and this project of Baltic Black Sea uh, Union in future, we need to, to understand that this uh, project can be logical only if it will include in itself all this historical uh, landscape of the Grand Lithuanian Duchy. Of course, that, uh, that, that doesn't mean that all uh, these spaces uh, have to be included in one state, which is uh, impossible in the reality uh, of new international law and itself. But there are new uh, regionalist movements, one of which I represent here, the Eastern Caribbean platform is a platform of uh, uh, regionalist movements of three Western Russian regions, which uh, see uh, themselves as a part of this Baltic Slavic region, uh, together with uh, independence liberated from the Lukashenko regime and from the Moscow influenced Republic of Belarus, uh, Lithuania, Poland. And of course, 
we need to understand that the Kaliningrad uh, problem has to be solved as well because still Kaliningrad region will uh, will be kept as a, a military purpose of Russia. It will be uh, essential to, to not only to Lithuania but to all European Union. So, uh, as this region. Uh, also historically and ethnically, demographically connected with this Baltic Slavic landscape because it was a historical Yatvagia and it was populated uh, by uh, people from Belarus, Belarusian Bel 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 Soviet Bel Republic and from the western regions of Russia. We need to understand that uh, uh, we have to solve this uh, problem completely and even if we don't have now the uh, opportunity to to solve it right now we need uh, at least to have vision you know how to do it logically in future thank you very much thank you very much So I have one quick announcement before we move on to our next speaker. For the sake of time, we will have you all grab lunches on your own and you can bring them out from that room into here and eat them while we continue our presentations. Um, so our next speaker is an in-person speaker, Varvara Shmugalova. She is the head of the Hybrid Warfare Analytical Group at the Ukrainian Crisis Media Center and she will also be sharing a presentation with us today. Um, my name is Varvara Shmugalova and I'm the head of the Hybrid Warfare Analytical Group at Ukraine Crisis Media Center in Kyiv. Um, ever since the uh, annexation of Crimea and start of the Russian-Ukrainian War, uh, we've been working on uh, uh, counteracting Russian malign information operations in Ukraine and also letting our allies know about the um, malign activities happening in their space and um, influences that Russia is making to the public opinion in their countries. Uh, we believe that information is power, and sharing the truth about Russian action and its nature is our front in this war. Um, can you guess what this is? My first thought that it actually looked like another planet or the scene from, like, you know, a Hollywood sci fi movie. Uh, but no, uh, it's Marinka, 29 kilometers from Donetsk. And this is the result of the Ruski Mir coming to my homeland. For the reference, this is Marinka before Russian occupants raised it. And what does Russia offer to its loyal subjects? So the first thing that comes to mind, especially to you know Westerners, is great Russian culture. Um, you know, um, St. Petersburg, Moscow City, Hermitage. Uh, when in reality, um, life in Russia. Uh, and Russian empire <laughs> is still closer to this. And this, uh, just for uh, the reference, the wooden barracks built in Arkhangelsk in 1930s, uh, they were not um, really rebuilt or fixed after that. The last uh, kind of renovation that happened were 50 years ago. Um, and um, this is how regular Russians live. So the only scenario that Russia offers and can deliver is destruction, poverty, inequality, and hardship. So unless you want your home to resemble this, uh, don't call on the Russian world. And um, I will uh, now present the main topic of my presentation, which is five reasons why Russia should dismantle. And the first reason uh, for that is that the only group of people who benefit from the status quo are actually Putin's regime and his oligarchs. The rest of uh, Russian subjects suffer from poverty, as we already mentioned, and we heard from other speakers today that living in a uh, not metropolitan Russian area is actually quite awful. And that happened because um, Russia accumulates all the goods and resources in the metropole, Moscow and St. Petersburg, draining them from the rest of the occupied territories. And this leads to extreme corruption, social injustice, stratification, and poverty. Uh, 
So right now you see on the slide just a few um, stats that I collected. I'm not gonna name all of them, but uh, just one of the ones that really uh, probably sound bad for <laughs> Westerners that uh, only every 10th Russian um, doesn't have a toilet at home at all, and then every fourth Russian doesn't have a sewerage system, right? Um, also, uh, Russia is the one of the largest suppliers in natural gas in the world. Uh, however, um, in the rural areas, only 20% of the households are gasified. Um, and just to no, uh, mention that Russia actually would rather burn the gas as it does now because of the sanctions rather than to give it to its own people. And uh, uh, another one is that Russia is among top five countries uh, with the highest rate, rate of HIV spread, uh, and it's actually uh, overtaking Tanzania, Uganda, and Kenya on this matter. Moving on, this is where all the money goes. This is a palace in Gelenjik that belongs to Putin. Everyone probably knows about it because of Navalny and uh, uh, their uh, you know, film about that. And moving on to my next point is that there are no human rights or rule of law for the 145 million people who currently live on the territories of Russia. Um, unlawful fines, arrests, repressions, are, and prosecutions are um, an expected norm. So uh, as you can see in uh, 2023, Freedom House actually uh, rate Russia as not a free country. And uh, it, it's at historical law of 16 points of 100. That means that Russia has neither political rights nor civil liberties. It does not have the electoral process, functional government, freedom of expression and belief, or rule of law. That brings me to my next slide um, about all the cases and people who were prosecuted, unlawfully arrested, or put in prison just for speaking truth in Russia. Uh, also, Russia spreads its violence and unlawfulness everywhere it can reach. So after the liberation of the right bank, bank of Kherson region, 20 tortured chambers and places where Ukrainian prisoners were kept by Russian military were discovered. Five of them were in Kherson. Um, some of them were specifically dedicated to kids. Um, also, the commissioner of the Rada for Human Rights reported that they may be about 150,000 children who were illegally stolen um, out of Ukraine by Russia. Russia actually por uh, reports that that number is about 700,000, but we believe that it's a bit inflated. Uh, most of the children were stolen from occupied territories of Donetsk, Kherson, the Parisia, and Crimea. Uh, and we can go on and on about that, but just to mention that uh, over 68,000 war crimes were already reported as of March 2023, and the number of these crimes will go on and get higher the longer the war comes. So um, the manipulation of the law to suit those in power or the absence of law altogether cannot exist in a free and equal society. Next point is that Russian metropolitan politics and actions towards enslaved nations could and should be classified as genocide and therefore must be stopped. And we've heard from a lot of people that represent these nations today that this is indeed happening. And the elements of those genocide is abolition of indigenous cultures, languages, and identities. And we heard that some of those regions already lost their languages and their culture. Uh, it's a forceful assimilation and economic exploitation. And by economic exploitation, I mean the extraction of resources without reasonable investment into regional or local economies, infrastructure, and social programs. And coming to the last point in this is actually ethnic cleansing. Use of Russian-Ukrainian war as an instrument of that cleansing. Indigenous communities experiencing way higher level of poverty combined with the absence of social lifts for indigenous people created an incentive to enslaved nations to, enl to enlist in the army, which resulted in increased losses in colonized communities. Establishment of a new propaganda narrative that all the war atrocities in Ukraine are, are committed by uncivilized indigenous people, not white European Russian soldiers, is also really circulating a lot uh, within you know, Russian community and uh, in Ukraine that even more underlined the issue that Russia as an empire sends the you know, enslaved nations to die in Ukraine and then use it as a reason why actual Russians are not that bad. Um, that brings me to the uh, next point that indigenous nations cannot survive, preserve their language, 
culture and identity under the Russian Empire. And uh, this is just a few narratives that Russia often use, like imperial narratives, to push its agenda. You can read them. I'm not going to voice all of them now. I'm actually going to stop particularly on the one that is, is oppression of minority rights. So this narrative were used by Russians a lot uh, in Ukraine, but also in other countries. But uh, this propaganda narrative um, want, like, were used to destabilize the situa situation. So uh, specifically, they claim that so-called oppression of the rights of Russian-speaking people uh, is oppressive, they try to similarly frame the narrative about the Hungarian minority in Ukraine, when in fact, in Russia itself, the right of minorities are mostly ignored or frowned upon. Russia used the same colonial tools against Ukraine, both during their imperial and Soviet periods. The efforts to destroy Ukrainian identity and statehood failed. Um, therefore, we can view the current war as an act of revisionism that will also fail in the result of metropole destruction. Enslaved nations of northern Eurasia should use the Ukrainian experience of successful resilience to liberate themselves and establish sovereign nation states. Decolonizing the post-Russia space and creating sovereign nation states and regional econ economic alliances is the only way to ensure the future of this indigenous people. That brings me to my last point, actually. that. Russia is always has been the main destabilization factor in the region. And uh, as you can see in this infographic that I again wouldn't like explain in all details, but we're talking after the collapse of the Soviet Union when Russia presumably were already kind of democratic federation. The only year that Russia was in peace and didn't fight anyone and didn't uh, participate in any military conflicts is actually 1998, as you can see. And that's enough to prove the point that Russia is always the bad guy. They are the reason that all this happens in, Ukraine, in the region and in the world. And therefore, only the full elimination of such actor from the international arena can ensure the peaceful and progressive development of the region. And just to summarize my points, and I'm welcoming your uh, questions if you have any, this is a citation of the prominent Russian fighter for the freedom, Valeria Novodvorska, that she said in 2014, already after the annexation of the Crimea, temporary annexation, Russia is an empire. There is no empires of good. There is only evil empires. Let us all ensure that the last empire of Eurasia will finally fall. Thank you so much. Thank you. Questions from the audience? Yes, in the back. We should have a microphone coming around. Thank you. Uh, that's OK. The microphone's here. Hello. Um, I'm wondering if you could explain to what extent this view on the need for the dismantlement of Russia is a consensus within these Ukrainian civil society organizations? Is this basically the unshakable consensus as far as you can tell? And um, to what extent do you perceive US policy as aligned with the achievement of this goal? And what, if anything, ought to be done additionally in pursuit of the goal that you're advocating? Thank you so much for both of these questions. Um, the first part is yes, uh, among, A, this is our like state policy and the official uh, position that the only way for Ukraine to really be safe is for Russian empire to cease to exist. Because throughout the history, ever since the Russia established as a country, like between us and them, we, we only one can survive basically, right? Because Russia, Mm, is par parasiting on our history. It's uh, trying to steal our identity via, you know, appropriation of Kiev Rus historical parts. So, as long as Russia exists in a form of empire, and this is the only form that Russia ever existed, there is, there is realistically realistically no Russian beyond imperial. In my personal point of view, it will be an existential threat to Ukraine. So among civil society, you know, media, organizations in Kyiv and in Ukraine in general, we do have a consensus that Russia and Russians are our enemy. They always been. They are oppressors and we are fighting against them. And our um, ultimate goal is that Russian empire should not exist. Now coming to your second question about 
how U.S. policies align with this and how U.S. can help for this process to happen or to be less um, bloody, <laughs> so to say. Um, I don't think U.S. policies really align with it, and we can see that because uh, they're not supplying enough weapons and enough speed for us to fast fin finalize this war. And in my personal opinion, it's because they still didn't decide what's going to happen next and what part do they want uh, to support because it's uh, kind of um, obvious that if Crimea will become Ukrainian again, let's say tomorrow, that will provoke Russia, like regime in Russia to disassemble or something going to happen and we don't know what's going to be next and U.S. didn't make their mind if they want to support this or they don't. And in my personal opinion, they need to make their mind like yesterday and then start working it because uh, they need to prepare to what's going to happen with nuclear powers, right? Like, how do we denuclearize former Russian empire, right? Like, what will be the procedure? How is it going to happen? Um, you need to have different media campaigns to directed at those possible new free states, like establish communications with them, find leaders, understand like how society works in there. So in my personal opinion, US government doesn't do literally anything to facilitate or aid this process as of now. And it will be great if we can have some discussions in between Ukraine, European Union, um, and the plans of how this should move on. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now we will be moving on to our next speaker, who is a virtual participant. Cheromir Stojkovic is the leader of the Democratic Alliance of Free Serbia. Are you with us? Okay, I'm here. Wonderful. Uh, do you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Okay. You have 15 minutes. Okay, I don't see you, but I guess everything is fine. Yeah. <laughs> okay, as uh, you know already, my name is Tony Stojkovic. I'm calling from Serbia, and I want to tell you that uh, Serbia it is currently an occupied country, just like all the countries of Eastern Europe were during the Soviet Union. Let's remember that uh, Moscow rose nations from Vladivostok to East Berlin, not only with tanks, not only with weapons, but finally with this information operation. First of all, it's ruled by intelligence and psychological operation, which evolved into what we call these days uh, hybrid operation. Uh, Russia rules Serbia by hybrid weapons and hybrid actions. And now, the, the Serbia is occupied socially, politically, emotionally, intelligence-wise, media-wise, informatively, with in, informationally, and also psychologically. Uh, by strategic corruption and a powerful intelligence operation, Russia became owner of the Serbian oil industry. Uh, 2008, and with that, to uh, Russia starts to control money twice as large as the military police and intelligence budget of Serbia combined. Uh, when with that money, when that money is combined with Russian intelligence operation in Serbia, anything is possible, and including the fact that today Serbs talking about Russian interests more than their own. Uh, this happened because Putin started to control numerous media. He, he succeeded by uh, combining his geopolitical interests with local political corruption. In this way, political parties in Serbia began to work in favor of Moscow's geopolitical interests, and Moscow returned the favor with corruption and intelligence operation and informational operation, but also with information attacks that destroy democracy in Serbia and liberal politics. That is uh, so in Serbia, democracy and political freedom only exist today in fragments, in fragments, in fragments because of Russia, hybrid operation and big and huge influence here. Media that have 80% of the market uh, are in uh, one way or another under the strong influence of Serbia. They, they broke up fake news and propaganda. Propaganda uh, 
uh, that has been going on for 15 years now. The barriers of that propaganda are Russian agents. Uh, so when you start thinking about Serbia, let's uh, start think about alternative history. So what would happen if Adolf Hitler or and Joseph Goebbels, uh, what they will, uh, that, what they would have uh, achieved in Brittany if they had 80% of media in 1939? What would Putin achieve in the United States if he controlled? CNN, ABC, CNBC, CBS, NBC, New York Times, Washington Post, Chicago Tribune, and many other media. That is actually the situation in Serbia, and it's a very, very safe situation. Uh, so in that situation, how many Americans will support Putin? So that is basically the situation in Serbia, and we have that situation for at least 12 years now. And Putin involved numerous uh, journalists, uh, editors, and university professors in this uh, through what they call strategic uh, corruption. So for me, this is everything. This, uh, when, when I, when I uh, see all this, I'm uh, calling this, uh, and I invent that term, uh, hybrid occupation. So in Serbia, we don't have pro-Russian government. We have a government that is installed here by Russia. And we don't have pro-Russian population here. We have population which is brainwashed by Russia and uh, operation of Russia here. As an uh, as an activist here, I have uh, I can testify that I have uh, and I, I have and I had numerous attacks. Some were informative, some were psychologically, many uh, were economic, uh, some were also physical. I have received hundreds of death threats just because I have taken a hard line against Russia aggression since the beginning of the war in Ukraine. My own people threatened me, me and my family with death just because they support Ukraine in the war with Russia. There are many insults organized uh, by public space with the goal to undermine my business and to have a um, economical impact of my activities. My office introduced sanctions against Russia in the March 2022 in order to, dis to distance ourselves from Serbia policy toward Russia and organized attacks on my business have not stopped since then. And this is now creating huge financial problem and as such. So this is actually what we have uh, now, in Serbia, thanks to Russia. Uh, there with you is also, I believe, Mr. Challenger, who recently had a similar experience with threats coming from Serbia. He can testify to you how it looked and uh, how unpleasant it was, even though he was in Austria at the time and not in Serbia. We, who are fighting against Russian influence, uh, live with those threats here every day, and with that, we are also attacked existentially. My October group, which dealt with counteractions against Russia favored influence, influence and which named uh, and publicly, publicly uh, announced the names of the eye agents of Vladimir Putin regime in Serbia, will have to stop its, uh, its activities because all of that, because the support in Serbia to fighting. Russian influence and Russian hybrid attacks and occupation is very low. Um, so this is how we will probably stop our activities. Many have stopped in the previous decades because Russia, through its influence, has always made, made a constant attack on anyone in Serbia who, who, uh, who will advocate for a policy that should bring Serbia into EU and especially in NATO. So the, the influence of the surrounding, on, on the surrounding countries, the importance of Serbia uh, is uh, big for security in Europe, but also uh, for the USA and NATO and the entire West. Our democracy here is very young, it's fragile, uh, and if Putin is in Balkan, it is like being a drug dealer among children. There is no peace while Putin is in Balkans or where or uh, if uh, Russia
industrial influence exists in the Balkans. There is no heel, uh, while the drug dealer is among children, and uh, there will be no progress uh, until we have, un until we don't change, until we change those situations. So many things can be done, and I think they must be done in order to have security in Europe when Ukraine defeats Russia. So the West uh, must interfere in internal policy in Serbia and Balkans because Russia uh, gets involved a long time ago. Hesitation creates war in Ukraine. Hesitation will create another kind of problem in Serbia and the Balkans. So stop, so stop hesitating. Uh, Anti-hybrid center must be created in the Balkans. One huge, nice, rich, juicy, is the autonomous of uh, the United States. You are our ally. You have saved us from the Nazis and from the communists, and you are now saving Ukraine and Europe from uh, Russia, and we need you in Europe more than ever. So please invite the European Union as a union, as a political entity itself towards NATO. This is also the next logical step of European unification. So that's the road ahead. 10th of January, we have already a basic treaty between the EU and NATO, a big, big step for our defense integration. And this must be the logic also to continue to have uh, then the future settlement of the general, let's call it European peace order, the Eurasian peace order. And of course, here today, I'm very honored to be invited the second time after the speech in the European Parliament in January to the Forum of the Free Nations of ex-Russia. And ex-Russia is the term I would like to brand, like ex-Yugoslavia and ex-Soviet Union, it's ex-Russia, and that's the future of that region. And we have to denominate it as a terrorist uh, federation, as a terrorist state, as it is. We had just heard exactly what uh, is the situation. And I have here a very detailed action plan what to do, because the colleague before said we don't have a plan. I have a plan. <laughs> you know, I have a very clear plan. And we do it exactly as with ex Yugoslavia. Here is basically how we do, basically we suspend Russia from the UN, we kick it out of the Security Council, and then we integrate it in the Council of Europe, as it was until recently. It's no problem for the 31 new states to be in the Council of Europe as well, into OSD. And then we have a very detailed uh, action plan like we did it with ex-Yugoslavia in the Regional Cooperation Council in SEFTA and with uh, currency stability with DCFDAs, we exactly know what to do and together we manage the ex-Soviet Union, we manage the ex-Yugoslavian situation and we will manage the ex-Russian situation very successfully. So. Some small moments in history because some people say it's unprecedented and <laughs> it was never done. Austria and Hungary, uh, we started a war against Serbia. I have apologized in, in January in the European Parliament to my friend Chedomir for that terrible crime. And we were punished by America by dissolution. <laughs> we were punished and it was justified. So there is no reason for uh, basically keeping Russia alive artificially after what they have done in 2022 and still doing today. So the history of federalism, that this was an option before the war. Austria also had plans for a federal, uh, um, federalization. It was in 1910, but not in 1918. <laughs> so I was also personally in 2017 writing a lot about the federal Russia. That was all a nice idea until 2022, but no longer. Now it's time to dismantle Russia into new states. And it is absolutely with historic precedents. To the leaders of the new nation, I say exactly learn how Mr. Masaryk did it. You have to change the American opinion. This is absolutely critical for the success of all these nations. Don't copy what Yugoslavia did. Don't copy what Romania did. Don't do internal conquests internally. That is the wrong way. It's the exact dissolution according to the Yugoslav model which has to be used here and replace the evil empire with seven better new states. Of course, Yugoslavia was a um, very bloody dissolution war. We can avoid this if we prepare it better, if we accept the reality of new nations. As the Austrians, by the way, have uh, very much said in the beginning of 91, in uh, Alice Mock has said that very clearly, the faster we accept the new nations, the better. 
but there was a lot of resistance in the West because of some idealism of Yugoslavia, the same as we have it here today, also seen by some representatives, but that's absolutely wrong. We need here better new smaller states and they will work much better. With America together, uh, my dear mentor and friend, Erhard Busek, who passed away last year, we set up a system for helping the new states how to cope. That is called the Regional Cooperation Council and uh, the Central European Free Trade Agreement. And of course, 20 other organizations to teach regional integration to the new countries, how to work with, uh, uh, together better. And that exists today, that mechanism. I have lobbied for five years for Ukraine to join that. Unfortunately, it was still today not uh, possible because in the international community, there is a line of thinking, oh, the ex-Soviet Union is different than ex-Yugoslavia. We have to keep them separated. Oh, you know, it's all very different. And in Ukraine, everybody said, oh, we are very special case. We are not like Macedonia. Don't treat us like Macedonia. And uh, this was all a bit messy. It is time to end this kind of divisions of the regions. We have just one European Union, one NATO. If you want to join us, this is the way. And we have established a mechanism for stability and regional reform, which is working extremely well. Dr. Busek has uh, managed that. And in all sectors, we have all these uh, institutions like the transport community, the energy community. This will be extremely helpful for the new countries to learn from the beginning how to work together. And it's working this mechanism, so I'm calling to use that. As we have discussed already, I put the pictures here, the US and the EU will not uh, actively support independence of the new nations for the fear of uh, stability. And we have seen it that James Baker went to Yugoslavia and uh, George Bush, he went uh, to, um, uh, to Kiev to advocate um, keeping these uh, failed unions alive because everybody was used to them. It was practical to talk to one guy at the top to manage the situation there. But this is all the wrong policy. But don't expect active encouragement from the West because uh, that is not going to happen. You have to create uh, facts on the ground. You have to declare the independence. You must be ready and show that you can do responsible statehood. And then, by the way, America was the greatest supporter of Croatian independence once it was under threat and once there was a war by Serbia against uh, Croatia. America will help you once you have created the facts, once you're in threat, as America is now helping Ukraine in this uh, war. So lessons for ex-Yugoslavia and for ex-Russia, prepare the world opinion. This is what this conference is about. This is very important. And exact structure on which institutions you will be part already from the beginning. Here is again OECD, the Council of Europe, uh, EU free trade agreement. So you will have a regulatory economic framework, which Professor Aslund has mentioned is so important. Yeah? Aspire to be global partnership of NATO. Aspire to join the Central European Free Trade Agreement, the Regional Cooperation Council, OECD membership, and of course the EU Customs Union and uh, the Eastern Partnership can be easily extended for all the new countries and currency back to the Euro. So that's the economic reconstruction plan for any of the countries which is emerging. And it's very clear because exactly this we did for Macedonia, exactly that we did for Bosnia, and it exactly works very well. And please recognize Kosovo, by the way, immediately. So in all this to happen, and I call here in America again for more military support for, uh, the, uh, for Ukraine, and America has still decided not to send military airplanes to Ukraine. This is a very big mistake. I call for the United States of America to send F-16 and F-15 fighter planes uh, to protect the tanks which are now going to liberate Mariupol. So this is very important. Yeah? If we somehow for some kind of fake restraints, we don't uh, support Ukraine fully for the liberation, we will pay a heavy price. Imagine a failure of the counter offensive now will have tragic results and will encourage uh, Russia for more aggression. So it's very important to liberate Mariupol and to provide more military equipment from the EU, from the European partners, but especially in the terms of air superiority for the Ukrainians. This is absolutely vital and nobody can really understand what's going on with America. You have liberated Kosovo, <laughs> you have liberated Bosnia, and now you have this kind of uh, meal, piecemeal approach towards Ukraine at this uh, absolutely vital, crucial crisis of our time. I'm really astonished that this is not uh, 
uh, done up to now, and I hope uh, the next months will see some better results. Here, uh, on the global scale, what is important? We have to kick out Russia out of the Security Council of the UN, and this has never been deserved that Russia has inherited the Soviet Union seat, and this must be done now, and India must be inside. We have to basically make an agreement with India to join the Security Council and Russia, because Russia actually has only one-tenth of the Indian population. So here, the logic is very clear. A more complicated topic, in one minute explained. We have um, the issue what exactly to do with all the new states. Some of them can join the European um, framework, some not. This is the association of uh, a Northwestern Association of States. It's the model of ASEAN. ASEAN is the association of Southeastern European states. So I call to prepare already for all Buratia and uh, Saka and the others to have a new form of uh, international federation established. This is very important. And here, many of the Asian uh, states of, uh, in Russian Asia will join exactly that federation. And the fall of Russia is imminent of Putin's regime, exactly as it was in Yugoslavia. So I have uh, made a very detailed video about how this has to happen. And there will be the 2024 presidential elections. They will be faked. Putin will manipulate them completely, as it was in Milosevic case in September 2000. And then on the 5th of October, there was the revolution breaking the Milosevic power. And exactly the same has to happen in the case of Russia. For March, uh, the fake election, uh, a Puro's victory of Putin. And then in the summer, I, 2024, I expect a revolution in Russia to come. I still have one second to say something. I have here a clear, that's especially for my American friends, for the UN reform. This is very important. The EU must be in the UN Security Council and uh, nobody else. The French seat must go to the EU and the uh, in, uh, Russian seat must go to India. And here, basically, also then the Association of Northwestern Asian States must get a seat in the UN Security Council. We, we must put the UN reform on the global agenda. That's absolutely important. In the first war year, we have achieved about 10 good things, but there are about 40 institutional issues which we have not solved. And if we don't uh, manage our world system better, then absolutely we will not be uh, very successful, but we can. Our system works, our global system works very well, and you are welcome to join it. I call for the independence of the 41 new states, and then the integration in that institutions is working very well. And I want to thank you very much for this opportunity, and please uh, challenge all people who tell you something about neutrality and support Austria, Kosovo, Ukraine in NATO. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Gunther. Our next um, presenter is Edward Lucas. Edward is a British journalist and publicist and an ex-correspondent for Central and Eastern Europe for The Economist. Edward, are you with us? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. You have 15 minutes. Well, I apologize in advance as I have to leave to do a radio interview in about uh, 12 minutes, so I shall um, make the most of my time. So we've heard it extraordinary insights from the captive nations of, of, of Russia. Um, I want to tell a slightly different story, which is a story of catastrophic and continuing failure by people like me and my colleagues, the journalists, analysts, the diplomats and decision makers in the West. And the result of our failure is that at least 100,000, probably more people are dead, millions are traumatized. We have a trillion dollar bill for damage from the war in Ukraine, and this is continuing and it will, may get worse. And of course, it was entirely avoidable um, if we had um, understood the lessons of 1991 properly and what we were dealing with, as my friend Paul Gable explained, um, we would be in a different position now. I'm not convinced, I'm not, I don't know, how can I know whether Russia will disintegrate um, or in what way it will disintegrate, but I am absolutely convinced that the urgent need is decolonization. Um, my friend Alexander Etkins has written an excellent book on this. Uh, he describes Russia as the only country whose rulers treat their subjects the way other countries treat their colonies. So the way the Kremlin treats Russia is the way that Belgium treated Africa or Britain uh, treated its colonies in the Indian subcontinent and so on. 
And this is a huge mental shift for us in the West and one that we are not prepared for. We weren't prepared for it in 1991 when the Soviet Empire was breaking up and we're not prepared for it now as the internal Russian Empire is breaking up. It's a stunning fact about Russia's war in Ukraine that still many people found it a surprise, an aberration, an interruption to the natural order of things. And it should have been anything but. It was clear from the early 1990s onwards that we had a serious problem with Russia's understanding of itself. As my friend Timothy Garson Ash, the Oxford historian, um, has repeatedly said, empires don't just disappear. They break up and it's usually a pretty painful experience and it takes um, a certain amount of time. And we thought in 1991 that because the Soviet political system had broken and the Soviet economic system had broken, that that meant that the Soviet imperial system had broken. And that was just not the case. It took a huge blow, but the a fundamental imperialist idea did not die. Um, some people here may remember the Karaganov Doctrine of 1993. Um, this was an advisor to uh, Boris Yeltsin in the days when people thought that Russia was basically a friendly country. And Karaganov said that the Kremlin had the right and the duty to intervene in other countries on behalf of Russian speakers. And of course, the term Russian speaker has no basis in international law. I'm a Russian speaker. I guess most people on this call at this conference are. But it's not a political category. Um, it's as slippery and dangerous as Adolf Hitler's use of Volksdeutsche in the 1920s and 30s. It's the basis of an ethno-nationalist approach to international and indeed domestic politics that spells disaster and it's behind Russia's seizure of Crimea and its backing for the um, insurrection in the Donbass. Now, we've come to understand belatedly nearly 30 years later, that this idea of Russian speakers as a political category is wrong in the context of the Baltic states, of Ukraine, of Central Asia and elsewhere. What we've yet to understand is it's also wrong inside Russia. It's just another pernicious excuse for the Kremlin's domestic imperialism. And why is this? And there's so many answers. But we are aware, I think, now of the epistemic privilege of Western decision makers and that the agenda setters in the West um, over the last 30 years were more powerful than the voices of the Cassandras in the East. We didn't listen when people like Leonard Mary, Václav Havel, the Countess Landsbergis, Mark Lahr and others warned the West of what was afoot in Russia in the Yeltsin era and in the Putin era. Uh, we've also seen the enormous power of the smooth-talking Russian propagandists and particularly their Western accomplices backed by very powerful lobbies and well-financed public relations firms. And we've sort of understood this now in the Western political context. What we have yet to get to grip with is the epistemic privilege inside Russia, the unquestioned dominance of Moscow-centered cultural and historical narratives. So we don't just need to decolonize Russia in a political sense, we need to decolonize it in a cultural and historical sense. And we all um, in the West need to decolonize our understanding of those processes within Russia. Now, to help the process along, I think I've identified seven, um, what you might call the seven deadly sins of the Western attitude to Russia. Um, the first and biggest is ignorance. Now, it's one of the effects of the Iron Curtain that elites, particularly in Western Europe and North America, had only the haziest ideas of the languages, history, and culture of the captive nations. You really know that it was Czechoslovakia, what was Poland, um, that Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania were occupied countries who still maintained their de jure um, statehood. Um, we did know one thing, and that was that Russia was really important. Um, we knew that Russia was a cultural superpower. We knew about war and peace and Tchaikovsky and Kandinsky. And that really filled all the available mind space in the West for any understanding of, um, of what was happening on the other side of the Iron Curtain. And we thought the countries of Eastern Europe were backward and muddy and cold or even comical. And their languages were incomprehensible and unpronounceable. And perhaps the epitome of this sort of Western Orientalist view of the so-called East European region would be the Borat films and the um, ridiculous mockery they make of Kazakhstan. Well, if you think that's bad enough, just imagine what it's like when you're dealing with the nations, the countries, the languages, the cultures inside Russia. Because that's where things, the, the depth of ignorance get even deeper and even murkier. We have more or less 
now in Western Europe understood that Estonia and Latvia and Lithuania are different countries with different languages, that the Czech Republic is different from Slovakia. We understand that the countries of the Western Balkans are, are different, that this doesn't make sense just to talk about ex-Yugoslavia or Eastern Europe or even the ex-Soviet bloc. We have still to make that cultural leap when it comes to understanding about the countries, nations, languages and regions inside Russia. Do we know where the Kuban is, what the, what the um, cultural and historical peculiarities of Siberia are, the fact that Siberia didn't have serfdom, this really matters. Do we understand the way in which the Russian Empire expanded to the Caucasus? Today is Circassian Flag Day. I wonder how many people um, remember the, um, in any sense, the historical, notice the historical echoes of that enormous genocide of the Circassians. 170 years ago. I'm very glad that we have a Circassian speaker later on. My friend Oliver Bullock wrote a great book about this called Let Our Name Be Great about the Circassian Massacre, which tra tragically happened just before the onset of mass communication. So there were no moving pictures, no photographs, no nothing about it. So it um, has a, a story that has to be recreated only from the archives. So we need to make that huge mental leap and understand, yes, these languages, these people, these histories, they really matter. There really is a place called Tatarstan, and guess what? They speak pretty much the same language as the Bashkirs, and the reason why that's different is because of Soviet nationalities policy. We need to be able to look at the map of the Caucasus, map of, of, this, of the Russian, so-called Russian Far East, and see that behind this kind of Soviet legacy of cartography um, is another landscape and one that we don't fully understand. So the ignorance is enormous and of course ignorance begets arrogance. Um, we believe that we know best. In fact we don't. We believe we can fix things. We can't. We believe that what we know doesn't know, we, we don't know doesn't matter and of course it does. The arrogance begets naivety and I fear this very much in the post-war uh, environment which I hope we will face soon that whoever is in charge in Moscow will take advantage of Western um, arrogance, ignorance and naivete and say, watch out, Russia's going to break up. Um, that will be terrible for you. You'll get loose nukes, refugees, disrupted supply chains and all the rest of it. So please break the stability. Give us what we want and we will keep a lid on this boiling pot. This is a kind of echo of the tactics we saw with Andrei Kozarev in the early 1990s, Yeltsin's foreign minister, who was so used, um, so practiced at saying, give us what we want, otherwise the bad guys uh, who are just around the corner will take in. So I fear that naivete and ignorance and arrogance about the real structure, the real history, the real geography, the real culture of Russia will allow whoever's in the Kremlin to try and uh, play this reset card, say, give us a chance we'll keep things together. Um, there's also complacency. Um, we don't think it's going to happen because um, we don't want it to happen and therefore we think it, it won't happen. Actually, stuff happens all the time that the West is totally unprepared for and we are stunningly bad at predicting it. And there's also stubbornness, um, the refusal to admit that we're wrong, and there's intellectual and moral cowardice. So all these factors um, play a role. Um, we need to have a fundamental understanding that our approach to Russia, the Western line on Russia, has been dramatically wrong for three decades. And actually, we got the Soviet Union pretty wrong as well. And that leads to very hard questions for decision makers who are going to have to put their hands up and say, we got it wrong, we made terrible mistakes, we're paying a terrible price as a result, and um, we should take responsibility for that. But the biggest sin of all, I'm afraid, and I've mentioned several, is greed. Mark Twain said it's really hard to persuade someone of something when his livelihood depends on not understanding it. Most of the people dealing with Russia after the collapse of the Soviet Union had a personal financial stake in things going well, and being hawkish or gloomy was a career killer. And that affected the coverage of Russia. It affected our understanding of Russia. It affected our policymaking towards Russia. Because being critical about Yeltsin and being critical about Putin for many years was bad for business, and business didn't like it. They didn't like it the way they deployed their advertisements. And I remember as the economist bureau chief in Moscow in the late Yeltsin, early Putin years, being told if you write all this stuff about Russian imperialism, it puts off our investors. It disheartens 
our decision makers back in London. Why are you doing all this stuff? It's so bad for business. And there were threats. There were threats of withdrawing of advertising, complain, complaining to the editor-in-chief. And of course, The Economist was great. They stood up for me. There was another tactic of using slaps, strategic lawsuits against public participation, the threat of expensive lawsuits. Now, the good thing is that we don't face that anymore because most Westerners are no longer thinking they're going to make a lot of money in Russia. They're not making money now, and I think even the Germans have realized it's going to be a long time, if ever, before business gets back as usual. So this gives me hope. At least that giant distorting factor of greed is no longer um, influencing our approach to Russia and to post-Russia. Unfortunately, the other things, the arrogance, the ignorance, the cowardice, the stubbornness, and so on, are still there. So we have a huge amount to do. You have a huge amount to do as the representatives of the captive nations and the regions and the endangered cultures of Russia. We have a whole lot to do here in the West to wake up and understand that our, our approach to Russia and our understanding of Russia has been so incomplete and so ignorant. So I wish the organizers of this conference well. I have been invaded, tortured, exploited, and destroyed by Russia, and it is time to put a stop to it. Before the Russian invasion, Buryat Mongols lived around Lake Baikal for many centuries. In the 18th century, after 138 years of bloody war and countless Buryat lives lost, the Buryat people were eventually occupied by Russia. The official Soviet history taught to us claims that Buryat's joining the Russian Empire was peaceful and voluntary. However, we can now see how Russia is destroying the Ukrainian people and their state. Throughout Russian history, this has always been called peaceful and voluntary unification. And it is in this way that Russia has annexed all indigenous peoples and their lands. Buryats have their own writing, writing, language, culture, economy, and religion. Buryat Mongolia had always been an important part of the Mongolian world, connections to which are now erased from the memory of Buryat Mongol people. For example, in 1958, the name Mongolia was removed from the name of Buryat Mongolia region. Russia has been colonizing us, trying to destroy everything about our identity. Tsarist Russia first, then communist Russia, and now the Putinist Russia. The imperialist policy has been the same. During the repression, repressions of 1930s, those who knew how to write in Mongolia and were punished by execution. Since, since 1970, Buryat language is not studied in school, and now most Buryats do not know their language. The result of Russian poli policies is that no indigenous people have any need to speak their native language, because in the Russian constitution, the Russian language is declared to be a state-forming language and the use of any other language is not approved by Russian society. In 2005, UNESCO officially included the Buryat language in the Red Book of Endangered Languages and pre predicted its complete disappearance by 2050. There were attempts to resist colonization, but they were harshly punished from slaughtering entire villages in Tsarist Russia times to passing recent laws by which my speech here can be punishable by life in prison. While being a Russian colony, Buryatia has consistently ranked among the poorest regions in Russia in various quality of life metrics. Although Buryatia is rich in natural resources, most of the profits go to Moscow, and large mining com companies are registered in Moscow. Buryat lands contain half of Russian zinc reserves, one third of lead, molybdenum, and tungsten, over 40% of cadmium, around 40,000 tons of uranium, 400,000 tons of lithium, more than 100 gold mines, and over 30 other ores. 
Additionally, Buratia has Lake Baikal, our treasure, the deepest lake in the world, which is included in the UNESCO World Heritage List and contains about 20% of the planet's fresh water reserves. In 2020, the Russian state adopted amendments to the law on the protection of Lake Baikal, which allow Russian railways to carry out large-scale logging for the expansion of the Baikal-Amur and Trans-Siberian railways. The adopted amendments allow for clear cutting to increase the capacity of the railways until December 2024. There are many similar examples of environmental violations when it comes to Moscow revenues. While Buryat resources are always welcome in Moscow, Buryats themselves are subjected to discrimination at all levels. And the most valuable asset, the human capital, is used as cannon fodder in criminal imperial wars, which uh, ensure a perpetual population crisis. For example, about 100 years ago, the population of Mongols was 650 thousands, while the population of Buryat Mongols was 300 thousands. Since then, population of Mongolia increased more than four times. It's 3 million, 3.4 millions, while number of Buryats increased by just 50%. It's 450,000. In the Russian Empire, Buryatia was a target of mass influx of Russian peasants and prisoners. Soviet collectivization destroyed countless families and their way of life. After the, the repressions of the 1930s, the number of Buddhist monks in Buryatia decreased from 23,000 to just 600. In 1937, uh, Buryatia was divided into five parts by, by Russia. As a result, Buryatia lost 40% of its population, and Russians became the majority. Whatever century it is, whatever government and political system is in Moscow, one thing was unchanged. The purposeful, systematic annihil annihilation of Buryat culture and replacement of it with things Russian to make sure the land of once conquered become Russians forever. The war in Ukraine became a new shameful page in the history of Russia and Buryatia. Buryats are sent half of world away to fight the immoral war Buryats have no stake in. If you live in Buryatia, you have a 65 times higher chance to die in the Ukraine war than if you live in Moscow. This war is Moscow's pet project, but when it comes to dying, they prefer somebody else to do it. While they engage in lofty rhetoric about everybody's debt to their motherland. Even worse, the blame assignment is also skewed. Somehow Buryats turned into the villains of this war, while it is well documented that Buryats had nothing to do with most atrocities. Maybe this is because all real Russians are kind and gentle and cultured people and are not capable of killing civilians. So when it happens, it must be somebody else who did it. Russia has always been an aggressive empire who prioritized gaining new territories over everything else. Just look at the world's, world's map. The prospect of Russia do not look promising even after the end of Putinism. The imperialist thinking is deeply ingrained into the Russian conscious. So that people, including most anti-Putin, pro-democracy politicians, do not even realize their imperialism. Even aside from the people who are openly imperialist and chauvinist, most regular people consider it matter of national pride that their country is so large and powerful. They have, no, they have not even started to ponder by which means their country became so big. Haven't started to realize what their terrible posterity 
and the magnitude of the crime which had been com committed against numerous indigenous people of what is now called Russia. As far as most people are concerned, the problem of indigenous people in Russia doesn't exist. Even many of democrat uh, democratic opposition leaders who risk their lives fighting for freedom and democracy in Russia somehow do not think that indigenous people of Russia have their right to control their own life and destiny. The most which is allowed to us is to be a part of federation. But we know all too well that there is no federation in Russia. Enough is enough. We don't want to be a colony. We stand for a fully independent Buryat state. We want to build a state based on democracy, human rights, economy, freedom, and fair laws. We want an immediate stop to the war in Ukraine, return of all occupied territories, and trial for all war criminals. We support the right of other indigenous people of Russia to independence. We realize we cannot do it alone, because the moment we want to become independent, Moscow will send its tanks to our cities, for sure. We need to unite with other people of Russia in this fight. Independence is the only way for Buryats and all indigenous people to survive. The only way to keep our culture and dignity. Independence will mean a lot of work building the new country. And we want to ask for the support of the international community. We need laws which will leave no room for autocrat governors, corruption and militarism. We want to nurture Buryat culture and we want to treat with great care the rights of all other people who consider Buryatia their home. Russians, so Soyots, Evenki, all 167 nationalities living in Buryatia. We want close ties with all our neighbors, including Mongolia. If it's based on mutual interest and respect. It may be painful to realize that Buryatia lost many of its territories due to redistricting by Russia. But first of all, we want peace and friendship with our neighbors. We want to avoid any territorial dis disputes. We would like to ask for international help in the early stages of building our nation. We believe we can become self-sufficient fairly quickly due to rich resources which will no longer go, longer go to Moscow. But we need help and support and the critical, at the critical moment of declaration of our independence and early stages of nation building. Some of the documents what demand independence for Buryatia are the Charter of the United Nations, the Declaration of the Granting of Independence of Colonial Countries and Peoples, United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Ind Indigenous People, Universal Declaration of Human Rights, U.S. Law PL 8690 on Colonized Nations. Ladies and gentlemen, remembering Martin Luther King's words, I dream that one day this nation will rise, rise up and leave out the true meaning of its creed. We hold this truth to be self-evident that all men are created equal. As a Buryat, I have a dream that this criminal war against the freedom-loving Ukrainian people will end as soon as possible with a total and crushing victory for the Ukrainian people. And Buryatia will be the first to sign a peace treaty with Ukraine and become, become an independent and peaceful state. Thank you. Thank you, Marina. Are there any questions from the audience? Okay, thank you very much. Our next participant is Luke Coffey. Luke is a senior fellow here at the Hudson Institute. Uh, thank you, Luke, and you have 13 minutes.
13? 15. Oh, gosh. Okay. <laughs> I don't know where After that came from. After the technical difficulties this morning, I don't even deserve time, uh, uh, I think. Anyway, um, uh, first, I, I want to thank all the participants and people attending this event. It's great to see such interest uh, and to hear some of these very passionate uh, remarks and and views. It's 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 great to hear hear that here in Washington D.C. Um, I'm giving my my views here as uh, as an American uh, commentator, as a think tanker, someone who writes policy papers to hopefully inform policy prescriptions on Capitol Hill or in the executive branch. Uh, so keep that in mind. We've heard some very passionate views from different uh, groups uh, inside what is currently the Russian Federation, but. I'm going to be taking more of an outside a U.S. American uh, point of view. My starting point is that I do not believe the Soviet Union collapsed in 1991. I think it's actually still collapsing today. I think 1991 was the beginning of the collapse, and history has the ability to condense time. So when historians 200 years, 300 years from now, or writing about the collapse of the Soviet Union, they will describe and write about all of the events we have seen over the past 30 years. And perhaps they will identify February 24th, 2022 as the most consequential moment in the collapse of the Soviet Union, if not the final moment in this collapse. Um, just look around the, the region, you have uh, the ongoing uh, fighting and skirmishes between Armenia and Azerbaijan, the occasional cross-border land skirmish between Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan, of course, Russia's 2008 and continued occupation of Georgia, uh, 2014 in Crimea, 2022 large-scale invasion of Ukraine and the ongoing war there, and then all the other bits and pieces around uh, the Russian Federation, but also everything that's going on inside the Russian Federation and has gone on inside the Russian Federation. And just the testimony and the, um, the views that we've been hearing today, all of these combined show that the Soviet Union is in fact still collapsing. So when it comes to this, uh, I, I like to share the, the goals of the United States in the event that we see the final collapse uh, of the Soviet Union and the complete breakup of the Russian Federation. What, are, what should America's goals be? What are the assumptions that we can make now to better plan for this possibility? And then what are the questions that policymakers need to be asking now instead of asking you know, months or years after we see the, the, the final collapse of the Soviet Union and the breakup of the Russian Federation. And the reason why I think this is very much possible is because of what's happening in Ukraine. Uh, I do believe if the Russian military is militarily defeated inside Ukraine and Ukraine is able to restore its 1991 borders, uh, the, the consequences for the Re Russian Federation will be great. And I bet in 10 to 15 years, the Russian Federation we see today on a map will not look the same um, then as it, as it does to us now. So in terms of the, of the goals uh, the, the, in the event that this happens, the first goal for American policymakers is to not let idealism trump and be realistic about Russia's democratic prospects, at least in the short term. We should learn the mistakes of the 1990s when we thought that we should, uh, or we, when we thought we could uh, play a role in transforming Russian uh, democracy, Russian society, the Russian economy. We should be humble in acknowledging our limitations uh, in this, uh, and we should um, we, we should not uh, let idealism uh, cloud our thinking. Uh, we should also do whatever we can to contain any spillover uh, outside of the current borders of the Russian Federation of, of any fighting that might, that might take place inside uh, the Russian Federation in the event of a, of a collapse. Uh, this, this might mean uh, picking sides. This might mean uh, boosting the, uh, the uh, military and security and border security capabilities of the countries around 
the periphery of the Russian Federation, that we should do what we can to prevent the spillover of fighting. Another goal is to account for this stockpile of Russian weapons of mass destruction, including the 6,000 nuclear weapons. I don't have an easy answer for this. Uh, I don't think anyone does, but we should be thinking about it now, not whenever it becomes a, a, a major problem. Uh, another goal should be to spread stability on Europe's periphery by expanding Euro-Atlantic integration and deepening bilateral relationships. Um, Euro-Atlantic integration over the years, at least since 1949, has been one of the greatest drivers of uh, peace, stability, economic prosperity, and democracy, and it could continue to, to do so uh, well into the future. We could see an opportunity for a big bang round of enlargement uh, because Russia would, n in the event of a collapse of the Russian Federation, the, it would no longer have this de facto veto that it currently has on countries like Georgia or Ukraine or Moldova, for example, joining uh, these Euro-Atlantic in institutions. And, and the, especially the EU should be planning now on the required institutional reforms that would be needed to bring in new members. I mean, one example off the top of my head is with Ukraine. Uh, if Ukraine joined the European Union tomorrow, it would become, I think, the Union's fourth most populous country in the European Union, fourth or fifth, which completely alter the way voting is done and uh, how QMV is qualified majority voting is done and the way seats in the European Parliament are allocated. And then you add Poland to that, block, Romania to that block, and you start to really see the center of, of gravity in Europe shifting east in practical terms. And I don't know if Berlin and Paris are really going to like this. They may say now oh, we want Ukraine in the EU, but are the institutional reforms taking place now uh, to, to make that a reality? Uh, the United States should also have a goal of, of maintaining a superior military presence and strength in Europe. Uh, there, there are some who believe that uh, what, when, when Russia is defeated in Ukraine, the U.S. can pack up and leave Europe. History tells us that Russia will be back. Uh, the peace dividend that we thought existed in the 1990s turned out to be a fantasy, and we should not fall for this trap again. And finally, the, the, goal, uh, the last goal I have is when possible, we should have the goal of holding those accountable for, in Russia for, for those who committed atrocities in Ukraine, and I know a lot of work is being done on that specific issue today, so I'm not going to dwell too much on that here right now. In terms of the assumptions, I have uh, seven uh, planning assumptions. You know, we don't know what a breakup of the Russian Federation will look like. We don't know what the final collapse of the Soviet Union will give the world, but we can have certain assumptions, make certain assumptions to help us help us uh, plan. The first one, the first assumption is pretty obvious, setting here today. And that is Russia will fragment even further. Uh, the 15 states that emerged after uh, the start of the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991, I describe that as the safety glass breaking. So that window, for example, if it shattered, it would break in kind of like a safe, almost a neat way. It wouldn't be perfect, but you know, it would re be relatively safe. If there's another round of shattering, it's not going to be safety glass that breaks. It's going to be very unpredictable. It could be very dangerous, very sharp, uh, and you'd, we have to think very carefully how, how we deal with that. But I do think there could be further fragmentation of the Russian uh, Federation. Um, another assumption to make is that Russian regions uh, will have significant populations of unemployed minorities uh, uh, ethnic minorities that are combat veterans. Um, we've already heard multiple examples today of the disproportionate burden that Russia's ethnic minorities are taking in Ukraine. Um, if there's a defeat in Ukraine, they're going to come home to nothing but a lot of combat experience and uh, perhaps a new drive and motivation for self-determination. So we should assume this to be the case. We should also assume that China and Turkey will try to play a role in maximizing their influence in, across the Eurasian landmass where Russian influence might be res uh, receding. We should also assume that private armed groups will proliferate. That's one of the things we've noticed in Russia recently, in Ukraine specifically, groups like the Wagner Group. Uh, more of these groups will be popping up 
You hear of examples already of Gazprom creating a private military group. I, I heard that uh, Defense Minister Shogu has also created his own uh, private military company, which is a very curious thing for the defense minister of a country to do. Uh, but nevertheless, you're going to have this proliferation of these armed, independent, or at least independent from state institutions, these armed groups. And they will play a role in any power struggle in the future. The other assumption is to assume that, at least in the short term, whoever replaces Vladimir Putin is not going to be Thomas Jefferson. We have this idea, this hope, that there's just this moderate liberal Russian opposition leader who's going to sweep in and reform and just make everything great. Maybe that'll happen in a couple of generations. I just don't see uh, it happening anytime soon. And then f the last assumption ties on to my point I made about America maintaining military superiority in Europe is that Russia will be back. We should assume that you know it could take 15 years, 20 years, whatever, but Russia will be back. Now, I'm very conscious of the time. I have four minutes. I have seven questions policymakers should be asking now, so I'm going to go quickly through these. The first question we should be asking now, what should the U.S. be doing with our international partners to um, develop a response for the calls of independence and self-determination that we are bound to hear by certain parts of the Russian Federation? And how do we recognize these calls for self-determination and independence in a way that is best aligned with U.S. national interests? Because remember, I'm speaking here as an American policy maker and in line with international law. There are answers we can develop, but we have to start thinking about this now. Second, um, how can uh, we keep, uh, how can the U.S. work with its partners to keep that internal fighting that could likely erupt inside the Russian Federation, keep it contained? And this is where we have to work closely with countries in the region, uh, countries that are not in NATO or the EU or the, that don't have any desire to join NATO or the EU, well, we should be having better relations with the Central Asian republics. We should be more involved with some countries in the Caucasus to help them improve their security sectors so they can do a better job at containing any fighting that might take place. Um, we need to think about that question about the proliferation of uh, weapons of mass destruction and the accountability of the weapons of mass destruction uh, in the event of a breakup of the Russian Federation. Uh, we should think about what NATO and the EU needs to do about those issues of institutional reform that I mentioned earlier, about a possible big bang enlargement, about the future of these organizations. We need to start thinking about that now. Uh, we need to think about how the U.S. and its partners can coordinate an economic and, reconstru and a reconstruction assistance uh, package for the regions that are currently under Russian occupation and will be liberated in the event of a collapse of the Russian Federation, Abkhazia, Shkinvali, Transnistria, you know, a huge chunk of, of, of Ukraine, uh, and in any regions inside the Russian Federation that uh, do break away or do seek independence, you know, what can be done uh, to, to help with the economic situation and reconstruction? That would be very important, especially early on in any major uh, crisis resulting from the, the breakup of the Russian Federation. Um, what does the U.S. need to do now to coordinate uh, an international or regional, regional response for existing border disputes in the event that the Russian Federation collapses? Uh, I'm thinking the Northern Territories, Japan and Russia, um, even Estonia. Um, I'm sure many in this room are aware, but you know most policymakers in Washington are unaware that Estonia has no legally agreed border with the Russian Federation. They have a de facto border, but it's never been ratified in the in the Duma. Uh, so there are other examples. There are some islands in the Caspian Sea that are disputed between Kazakhstan and Russia. So, for example, what you know what can the U.S. do to lead an international effort to try to resolve or prevent? these existing border disputes from becoming major uh, problems. And then finally, what can the U.S. and its partners do to roll back Russian influence in other places around the world <clears throat> where Russian influence might uh, wane in the event of a collapse of the Russian Federation? Here I'm thinking uh, the Middle East, 
I'm thinking perhaps Central Asia, certainly Sub-Saharan Africa. We should be thinking about this now, not, uh, not months after uh, we need to be thinking about it. So I'll stop there because I realize I used most of my, I used all of my 13 minutes and um, I just used all my 15 minutes right there. So thanks, Kennedy. Thank you, Luke. Any questions from the audience? Yes, in the back. Hello, I'm going to interview from Ingushetia. Thank you, very Thank you very much. It was a very nice speech. You know, it was a very interesting question. And my question is, uh, previous uh, with the speaker in Azemsev from Russia, he said that uh, don't think about separatism because nobody in the Europe or in the United States will support it and will like it. But actually for me, as a non-Russian person, yeah, uh, I'm not scared. As for example, Jefferson or George Washington who create this country, they're not created to make happy people in Belgium or in France, yeah? <laughs> because for us it's a question of the, our freedom of our future. And second question, uh, what do you think? It's, it's, we have to care about this. We have to sit and think that how we can make happy or be, I don't know, how, how understand him, you know? Are you agree with that? I, I, with who? With this guy who before you told the told this is Inazemtsev, sir Inazemtsev. He said that West Europe Union and United States never support separatism. They don't. Oh like yes, it. yeah, oh yeah, yeah. Because yeah. Of, yes, I understand mm -hmm. that. Well, yes, yeah, publicly the U.S. government is not going to do this, um, uh, but we have a couple of points to make. Firstly. Many people fail to understand the foreign policy making role that the US Congress has in our presidential system of government. Having the appropriations and the authorizations authority for funding, the US Congress has the ability to make US foreign policy, certainly shape and edit US foreign policy. So I think a lot of the advocacy, a lot of the education now needs to be done on, on Capitol Hill. And then like we saw, the, uh, President, Bush's, the President Bush's um, uh, so-called chicken Kiev speech was mentioned earlier, um, but then that was quickly overtaken by events, and then Americans were catching up. Uh, so behind the scenes, uh, uh, you know, we need to be working with the executive branch to at least get them thinking privately about answering some of these questions that I outlined today, because it could be a real. Uh, uh, it could be a new reality, and we have to be prepared. But I do agree with the previous speaker. You, you'll never get this to be a policy of um, the, the U.S. government. And in fact, you know, I don't advocate personally for regime change in Russia. This is a matter for, the, for you all, for the, the people of Russia to determine, not for me sitting here thousands of kilometers away in northern Virginia or Washington, D.C. But... Uh, the responsible thing is for American policymakers to be planning uh, for this possibility because it is real. Thank We're you. We're here for this. <laughs> yes, exactly. Thank you very much. And we will now move on to our next participant who should be online with us virtually here. Um, Andrew Salmanis is the president of the Institute of Russia's Regions and captain in the reserve of the Lithuanian Armed Forces and a founding member of the Lithuanian Republic Freedom Party. Andrus, are you with us? Great. Welcome. You have 15 minutes. Uh, I represent uh, here from the uh, Institute of uh, Post Russia Regions, but also a committee of uh, Independent Confederation of Siberia. Uh, last year in December, um, during our forum, uh, which was in, in, in Sweden, uh, we signed and declared a declaration about uh, independent uh, Siberian Confederation. Uh, as everyone understands, um, it wasn't the um, re real declaration, but like uh, more, more like pre-declaration, pre case you can say so. But anyway, we declared uh, announced. Uh, the declaration and um, at the beginning of, of uh, this year as uh, I think uh, all of you know uh, online referendums uh, were organized in a few regions of uh, post Russia one of those uh, one of uh, those regions 
uh, Siberia, and um, of course it's um, it is not not um, uh, legal, not legal, but not not um, not referendum by by law. But anyway, it was uh, uh, very very many people uh, took part in this referendum, and the result is uh, willingness uh, willingness of people to uh, to declare. Uh, new independent states, including uh, including uh, Siberian Federation, or Confederation, uh, people will decide uh, which which form will be. So um, that's exactly what, what I I want to talk about Siberian Confederation. I I call it so. Have different names like uh, United States of Siberia. Um, uh, of Siberia, but, but I think it is name is uh, not, not most important. In my vision, it is a uh, confederation, right? Because uh, quite different uh, countries and uh, in future states, um, I hope so, will uh, join in one confederation. But uh, what is confederation? It is not a state, not a state formation, and cer certainly not something above. A both state. Confederation is a process, movement, action, but not an institution, not an organization. Specifically, it is a mechanism and a process of communication between independent and co equal uh, states. It should be in the uh, um, um, ideal case, I think so. And uh, in my Firmly, opinion it has to be no capital of confederation. Why? Because uh, every country, every future state will have own capital, and the uh, confederation doesn't need one one capital, and no central government, no no president, because it's confederation. We will not elect any central civilian government. We will solve everything only by mutual agreement. And why no capital and why no president? The Siberian answer is very clear. Because Siberian people are free people. Okay, maybe not are, maybe they have to be like this. But uh, on history of uh, Siberia, it is uh, like a record that uh, on, on the mentality of Siberian people, uh, freedom and liberty. Uh, because Siberian, Siberian people are quite uh, quite um, similar to to America. Uh, of course, it is, uh, cannot say it hundred uh, percent um, equality, but uh, it, it is something something uh, very similar, more or less. And uh, in place of uh, one common parliament. Siberian Confederation will have only uh, parliamentary assembly, and of course, uh, in the future, I don't know when, but for sure, will join European Union and, and NATO. And uh, Europe has to be, as as was uh, mentioned uh, many times. By, by many many people and politicians, Europe has to be from Atlantic to Pacific. And through Siberia, European Union can join Buryatia, Mongolia, and uh, other countries. Maybe for someone it, it seems uh, not very realistic, but I, I believe it is absolutely realistic in the future. But the uh, question is how to build new states and new nations with the people we have now. Uh, it seems very, very, very difficult. How to build something ideal from, I don't want to say from, from nothing, because there are a lot of very, very good um, uh, people, uh, not only in Siberia, on all, all the world, but uh, Everyone from uh, us know 
what is situation now in uh, all territory of Russia, and what to do. With this, it, it, it's a very difficult question. But I have two answers. Okay, maybe there are more answers, but at least. Uh, Vitaly Ginsburg uh, thought uh, a very interesting idea about presumption of uh, conscience and intellect. People are a priori good, a priori intellect. But uh, because of uh, diff uh, different uh, circumstances, of course, they can change both to, to worse, uh, but also to better side. So, and uh, we all wish make those changes to to better side, of course. And the uh, uh, second thing it can help to change a situation to, to change society, to change nations, to 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 um, optimal to better side. It, it is external monitoring. Uh, I think it is necessary condition. Well, but this external monitoring um, can happen only in case if uh, future states uh, will will call uh, will call this monitoring. Uh, there are no no forces and no no wishes from outside to to do something. Uh, um, not not by willness of of people, of course. And uh, people have to do by own will, not from outside, but by own will. I mean, in post Russia, uh, understanding what happened, analysis what happened. Recall, recovery, regret, reparations, and only then, only after those things, building new prosperous nations and states. And I believe also United Nations uh, will change. Okay, will not change. It is no sh chance to change to United Nations in place of. Uh, uh, renovation of um, uh, United Nations. Uh, I firmly, I have firm opinion. It's much better to create new organizations, new organizations like United Democratic Nations. So, and the uh, United Nations we have now, this organization will um, slowly disappear and, and and become absolutely not important as as it is uh, now. But in future, more and more and more not important. And in place of this organization, we will have United Democratic Nations. I think this is the only way. Not to reform United Nations, but create new organizations. And uh, the conclusion I, I, I'd like to say about, about, about our Institute of Post Russia uh, Regions. Well, I am president of this institute, and um, we have um, a lot of co-workers and um, very big uh, experience. It's uh, um, in general due to uh, Vadim Stepa, creator of this institute, and um, we call to 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 use our forces and our possibilities. Um, in this branch. So, thank you for attention. Thank you. Any questions from the audience? Thank you, Andrus. We'll now be moving on to our third um, panel. So, could we please have Magomed, Veselina, and Nikita, and Oleg will be joining us soon, um, take the stage. And Ilya had to leave, so we actually will be moving, I guess, 15 minutes ahead of schedule for the remainder of the afternoon. So that means.
that we will be um, starting our next panel with Magomed Tereyev. He is a journalist, a representative of Committee for Ingushin Independence, and we welcome you to the stage. Thank you. You have 15 minutes for your opening remarks. There is a people, maybe we will continue without people. It's a little bit strange. <laughs> <laughs> she is from my fan club, you know, <laughs> it's okay. But she's only one. Yeah. Yeah, we'll be here. The prospect that is not unlikely. Why is this prospect not unlikely? And here I would disagree with uh, Inazemtsev, who thinks it's unlikely because there is this monolithic Russian people there. Um, this is also another uh, argument. Uh, but the question is always, how exactly did this uh, census, how how exactly did the census, um, you know, come to be? Because we know that there was a sizable population of Ukrainians before the invasion and only recently. And now, according to the most recent census that was conducted even before the invasion, Ukrainians disappeared. So what happened to them? Uh, evidently, some people are being recorded as Russian, even though they might not identify themselves as Russian, for instance. So uh, the prospect of disintegration of Russia is not unlikely because of the full-scale war that is eating up resources, people, um, and of course the growing you know, dissatisfaction with the lack of uh, successes on the bat battlefield, right? Uh, there, there is of course uh, a huge pressure of economic sanctions that is adding to the prospect of potential disintegration of Russia. Uh, national elites, uh, intelligentsia of the colonized nations continue to envision the future for their own people, which of course they have every right to do so. And sometimes and often this includes forms of independence and sovereignty. And because the discourse of history and border revisions in Russia right now is very powerful because the Russian government set it forward, actually. So Russia constructed the breakaway republics in the body of Ukraine so-called LPR and DPR republics, as we all know, Luhansk People's Republics and the Donetsk People's Republic, in the mockery of the Ukrainian state that existed in the year of 1918. There were no LPR and DPR before the Russian invasion of Ukraine in 2014, and Russia crossed the border with tanks and denied its military presence, trying to portray the invasion of 2014 as people's uprising. All this talk about breakaway republics in relation to this quasi-statelets uh, pose a reasonable questions. Why do LPR and DPR uh, have the right to, to define themselves supposedly, right, according to the Russian uh, propaganda within the state of Ukraine? But let's say Tatarstan, who actually conducted the referendum in 1992 and voted for independence, doesn't. Unlike Luhansk people and Donetsk people, Tatar people actually exist as an ethnicity. Therefore, it's kind of easy, easier for them to uh, take a step and become also a, a national and citizenship and identity. This powerful discourse of independence and self-definition of the people is not some armchair invention. Rather, it is a powerful discourse set in motion by Russia itself from 2014 in regard to Ukraine and in 2008 in regard to Georgia, where similarly Abkhazia and South Ossetia got so-called military support from Russia on their way to independence, not to mention Transnistria, similarly a breakaway area in Moldova that appeared after the collapse of the Soviet Union. So uh, this discourse is coming from Russia, uh, and uh, all of these entities and military-occupied territories, such as parts of Kherson and Zaporizhia districts in Ukraine, uh, according to the propaganda, have the right to define their own belonging and statehood. So 
why wouldn't the potential states within the Russian Federation not have a similar right to define themselves as separate from Moscow one way or another? Uh, it doesn't work like that. People begin talking about it and they begin envisioning different futures and there is no way out of it, you know. And of course the system of the vertical power and the great centralization of Russia that Putin built himself over this uh, 20 years, including um, you know, stopping of the election of the governors and most recently the mayors of big cities, it doesn't help. Because when you have the re-elections regularly, at least there is not that much concentration of power in one hand. So the system where Russia is overly centralized is untenable and nobody could object to the idea of the Russian decentralization, the local governments that uh, actually locally decide where those money that they earn are gonna be spent and so on. The objections, however, co come triggered by the word decolonization and these objections fall into several categories, nuclear weapons, threats of civil war and ethnic cleansings, waves of refugees, fall of resulting entities into dependence of China, and peculiarly enough, the dangers that the decolonization of Russia presents to the, to the West, the decolonization of the West. So let's look at these objections uh, and see uh, what are they. Nuclear weapons. The question is for many, who will come in possession of those nuclear weapons and whether they will fall into the ownership of various warlords. This is what one often hears from people who object to the decolonization of Russia. And as many of these objections, they belong to the world that no longer exists. Why? Because we already have these nuclear threats. We already have 200 something nuclear uh, threats issued by the Russian government, by these warlords that are in the Kremlin. It uh, virtually makes no difference whether the, those warlords or are in the Kremlin or somewhere else. We already have this situation. Um, we identified this worry and now we have to work with it. Rather than saying Russia has nuclear weapons and therefore we cannot imagine a better future for the entities that comprise it, we must realize that when the time will come to fix the results of the Rus Russo-Ukrainian war, there might be a window of opportunity that will open uh, when newly emerging leaders of the various states will be willing to trade nuclear weapons for various advantages. It is time to talk now about what will be offered in exchange for those nuclear weapons, perhaps suggest that newly forming entities in Russia may be offered the lifting of sanctions and the establishing of economic and democratic relations in exchange for giving up on nuclear weapons, their share of reparations, and so on. So for that, the, the West must be open to communicate with somebody else apart from the established Russian government. So, yeah, this course must be held on the, the denuclearization of Russia in particular and the world in general. The talk must be about how it is responsible for, to denuclearize and that in the question of international security to denuclearize Russia. Uh, the discourse must unfold in this direction. It is much easier or it could be easy to denuclearize the emerging entities as opposed to the Moscow Center, the Russian Federation. Um, of course, that the West disarmed Ukraine um, and in exchange of some memorandum and the vague words of security and support didn't help. So it does present a huge obstacle for the future denuclearization. This is something to be thinking about. The next objection to the decolonization of Russia is that in the process of decolonization, a series of civil wars and ethnic cleansing will emerge. Many predict that the dissolution of the Russian Federation, unlike the dissolution of the Soviet Union, will bring along a bloodbath. Um, however, again, like with the threats of uh, nuclear weapons falling in the hands of local warlords, this um, statement often is based on the assumption that there must be some a white man, or in this particular case, the Russian man, uh, you know, Slavic looking Russian something, somebody who represents the totality of the nations on the international stage, 
and who um, kind of has to control. And otherwise, without them, without this layer of control, uh, you know, local people or, you know, colonized nations will not be able to agree with each other upon simple things. So at least there is this colonial assumption in the foundation of it. And at least those authors who write against decolonization, they must at least acknowledge that this assumption dictates um, some of the things that they say. So the USSR, as, um, the USSR's dissolution was actually not peaceful. Uh, the idea that it was peaceful overlooks the barricades in Latvia in 1991, creation of Transnistria in the barrio of Moldova, and the 2004 and 2014 Maidans in Ukraine, to name just several episodes. So I very much agree with the idea that um, the collapse of the, Russia, of the USSR is unfolding, and the Russo-Ukrainian war might be considered like a belated big war as um, you know, coming out of the collapse of the Soviet Union. Uh, critics of the decolonization often point out the role of the leader that is extremely important during the pivotal mo moments and that Yeltsin famously said words to that effect, let them take as much sovereignty as they could carry. They say Putin is very unlikely to greet the collapse of the Russian Federation in a similar vein, which would mean civil war. Again, we need to remind ourselves that Yeltsin's statement was an attempt to preserve the Union falling apart. After the collapse of the Soviet Union, many other unions emerged in place, such as the Commonwealth of Independent States, Collective Security Treaty Organization, and so on. So on. Resisting the dissolution on part of Moscow's government would have made it impossible. If Moscow resists the new stage of the dissolution, uh, that would lead to further fracturing. Maybe the leaders in Moscow will not be able to grasp it, as they evidently failed to grasp that the attack on Ukraine will not be a blitzkrieg. Maybe the collapse of the Russian Federation will result in tensions. One way to minimize these tensions is talking about uh, these prospects, which is exactly what we are doing here, and which is exactly what I suggest we should continue by organizing the think tank that will be focusing specifically on the many issues of Russian decolonization. As Ruth and uh, Benedict, a famous anthropologist said, we need to make the world livable for human differences. Decolonization is a process of restoring justice. In the world of colonialism, it is very difficult to imagine what decolonization may look like or what it can bring. The fear is that decolonization must bring the same violence that decolonization brings. However, this must not be the case precisely because decolonization is the opposite of colonization. If we can have a revolution of the mind, a revolution in the streets may not be necessary or come smoothly. This is something we have to be thinking uh, through a lot more, which is why the think tank of decolonization of Russia is necessary. Thank you so much. Thank you. A quick question from the audience. Yes, in the back. Uh, Rajana Sugarda Ponte, uh, Democratic Movement, Buryat Mongol Arhatin, and uh, Free Nations League. Um, I um, support very much the idea of uh, uh, this think tank uh, because um, actually uh, we, uh, representatives of national regions, ethnic regions in, in Russia are sick of tired, sick and tired of being misrepresented or unrepresented at all. And we don't want uh, Mr. Inaziemtsev patronizing us, saying that, you know, we would not survive, we need to preserve uh, confederation because otherwise, and also the, uh, we don't want such experts to uh, explain to the Western world uh, that uh, they somehow have this expert knowledge about all our regions and they need to listen to them. We need actually to be heard, finally. And uh, that's why I think that this forum gives us this great opportunity to discuss our problems and to uh, actually 
be heard, speak and be heard. And uh, I would really uh, would like to maybe later dwell on this idea that uh, uh, the, uh, m m Ms. Arlova uh, just uh, suggested. Thank you. Thank you so much for your support, Rajana. I appreciate it. And I think one of the things that this think tank must be working on is creating the, de the program of de-imperialization of, uh, of the mind. You know, if, yeah, so uh, the thing is the writers of these articles that I've been reading about decolonization who voice all these objections, and I'm not taking those objections flippantly, we need to think carefully about them. Uh, they very rarely, if ever, interview for their pieces indigenous populations of Russia, indigenous peoples, colonized nations, and so on. And this is not just a mechanical, um, you know, uh, pointing out of the lack, okay, you didn't interview those. But the thing is, you cannot really write a piece about, you know, black people in America or women without interviewing you know, black people or women, and somehow it is considered acceptable still to talking about Russia to just uh, interview Russians or Russian politicians, ethnic Russians, and I think this is precisely what this think tank should uh, you know, rectify and amend because the leading role must belong to the indigenous people for once you know, in this particular structure. Thank you so much. Thank you. Our next participant is joining us virtually. Um, Dr. Mustafa Jambek is the Secretary General of the Council of United Circassia. And um, Mustafa, are you with us? Yeah, I am here. Uh, thank you for this opportunity. Uh, I'm Mustafa Jambek. Uh, greeting you with respect on behalf of the Council of United Circassia. Uh, today is our national flag day. I would like to congratulate to all uh, Circassians uh, national flag day. We hope our flag to fly really soon. For the beginning, I want to make a comment about uh, what uh, Mr. Gobel said about uh, ethnicity. The station may be different in uh, in the U.S and in the European Union, but at the rest of the world, ethnicity works. Ethnicity is functional. I am here because of we Circassians are tired of the behaviors of ethnic Russians. Additionally, I agree with Mr. Torizhev, uh, we have similar problems. Well, uh, we all know how Russia is a huge threat for the earth and the humanity. In the past, my nation faced a brutal face of the Russians and resisted uh, their aggression for decades. Circassia has never stopped being an eyewitness of several genocidal practices during the entire Soviet Union and Federation periods. Even after the spread of the universal values throughout the world, it seems nothing changed in Russia's mind. Russia's history is based on three main essences, killing people, plundering resources, and lying to the world. If you read the history of Russia, you can see many examples about what I said. If you want to have a clear vision about the circumstances, we have to make our assessments according to irrefutable trust. These are the Russia's trust. Russia is holding countless nations, cultures, and language under pressure and continuous classification. This madness must end and the nations must be liberated as soon as possible. I don't want to take your time with well-known issues and want to proceed with our projections for the post-Russia era. We are aware of the risks which may be occurred after Russia collapses. First, nuclear weapons can be handled by uncontrolled groups. 
as uh, prior uh, speaker uh, implied, uh, we have to deal with this. We have to face with this problem. We know handling and transferring these weapons is not so easy. Nevertheless, a research and program should be implemented by the experts. However, I want to imply that Russia is already an uncontrolled outlaw structure. I don't want to name it as state. It is already not possible to trust and feel in safe while Russia is holding a horrible quantity of nuclear weapons. Second, a significant amount of people will try to immigrate or seek asylum. This is an inevitable result of crisis in general. In this context, I can make a suggestion according to specific circumstances of Russia. Russia is the largest country with its West territory accounting for almost one in seven of habitable areas in the world. It seems impossible holding this territory for decades with its 143 million population. Anyway, numerous safety areas can be established within Russia and all the asylum seekers or irregular migrants can be led to these areas. Safety can be provided by the UN or the NATO. Such operations were managed in the past. Mostly third country territories were used before, but in this case, Russia's own territories can be used with an international agreement. Western countries have to support minorities of the Russian Federation to gain their independence because currently many Russian Federation citizens have already left the country and most of them prefer to settle in Western countries. West has to support these nations to make them stay in where they are now. Russia is collapsing and this must be held under control. Will the, will the West wish to manage this situation or willing to face shocks? Third, China or India can occupy valuable natural resources of Russia. It is a claim discussed by the experts, but this is also a manageable issue. An international union should be founded, led by the UN, with the participation of Russia's border neighbor countries and representatives of the post-Russia republics. A consensus can be issued, which indicates how the resources and the length of the territory will be used and by whom. This consensus must give priority to the people already living in the region and regulate prevention, illegal capture or use of the resources. In the other hand, it can create a mistake for China. If it occupies large areas of Russia, uh, only cancer cells grow out of control. This option can weaken China too. As you can see, humanity can find a way with international collaboration to cope with the biggest threat for itself. Russia is the most serious threat for the Earth and the humanity. Russia must be weakened as much that it won't be able to create a threat even for its own neighbor or its own people immediately. We are obliged to do that for the sake of humanity. First, we have to decide how we want to live, dealing with, with the threat of a plunderer and illegal superpower, or protecting our children from the biggest genocide machine. If we can give a decision, then we can find a way. I want to continue with some post-Russia projects which ignore Circassians and historical tracks of Circassia. Circassians were living between Black Sea and Don River before Russia invaded our ancestors. 
Russians killed our ancestors, burned their homes, villages, and forests, destroyed their farms to occupy the region. As you can see, this is an obvious genocide. Ethnic Russians and Cossacks were settled to the places where Circassians were living for centuries. Unfortunately, it is a fact that Cossacks had a key role for the success of the Circassian genocide. This is inevitable. If the Russians had not found reliable settlements to protect the places they occupied, Russians would not they have dared to advance further. Cossacks were their reliable partners who made the genocide and exile possible. There was no Kazakh existence in Caucasus before 1822. Kazakh population increased in Circassia commensurately while Russia was decreasing our population brutally. In 1856, Russia founded the Kuban Oblast, which population was mostly Kazakh and ethnic Russians on the territory of Circassia. If someone steals something and gives it to you, can you say it is mine? It is really hard to understand how Kazakhs feel so relaxed while they are talking about independence on the territory of Circassia, while their history was full of blood and tears. Kazakhs must accept their responsibility at the Circassian genocide and try to invent peace between these two nations. If you listen to to the speech of the representative of this idea in the previous forum, you can see that the speech is like a confession of the Kazakh's role at the Circassian genocide. Being rival to the Circassians with absurd arguments is not beneficial for Kazakhs. We don't demand anything which is not ours, but it seems Kazakhs demand the land which were taken from us forcibly. We want to make a new beginning together with all Caucasus nations, but everybody has to accept the rights of Circassians, which are coming from the history and from the international law. The borders and historical territories of Circassia can be easily seen in reliable historical records. Additionally, According to Article 3 of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, we Circassians have right to self-determination. Circassians are indigenous people of Circassia. Kazakhs are not. Kazakhs were systematically transferred to Circassia. Everybody must see the difference. Today, Supporting the idea of Kuban Republic literally means saying that Circassian genocide was right. We don't want to believe any person to support Circassian genocide, but this attitude means so. Making plans or imagining dreams on Circassia without Circassian obviously means seeking way to laundering degree genocide and the plunder. Some Ukrainian officials seem supporting the Cuban Republic idea, but it seems they have forgotten the existence of Russians, ethnic Russians, in the east part of Ukraine. It is much older than Cossacks' existence in Circassia. How should we assess a person who supports the Cossacks to be independent in Circassia and objects? the Russians in Ukraine to make a decision to be tied to the Russian Federation with a referendum. If Kazakhs are right while they, they talk about independence in Circassia, Russian settlers in Ukraine have also right to talk about their future. We do not accept both groups have such rights. Additionally, Kazakhs, Greeks, and Armenians have their independent countries to settle as an alternative. We don't have any independent country to settle even though we face vital risks such as wars and disasters. 
We don't have any single school on earth, and we are not supported by any state to protect and to grow our culture, our language, and national identity. Additionally, we are not represented by any state in, in the international area. Therefore, most of the people have no clue who the Circassians are and where Circassia is. It means we don't have any chance to survive outside of Circassia. We need our home, homeland, Circassia, to survive. It means supporting another occupier in Circassia is helping the death of Circassian culture, language, and their identity. Nobody should be partner of this crime by supporting the Cuban Republic idea. We invite all parties to stop supporting this unfair and baseless idea. We will never accept any occupier state or organization on our homeland. Everybody should see how we are determined and we will never give up our homeland while we are struggling against the second biggest power on the earth. We are willing to work together with international partners and Caucasian ethnic minorities in the frame of universal values. However, we are expecting to see our historical and legitimate rights respected. Circassians will gain independence sooner or later, and Circassia will be free wholly. This is certain. Circassians could keep their homeland and their national identity for centuries against Romans, Mongols, Genoese, Ottomans, Crimeans, and Russians. For the last two centuries, we struggled with many vital problems, but somehow we could reach today with our unique culture, language, and habits. We are not desperate or helpless. Greeks, Serbians, Bulgarians, Albanians, and many other nations gained their independence after 400 years, 500 years of captivity. I assure you, the Caucasian nation will also be free. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mustafa. Our next speaker is Nikita Andreev. He is from Sakha and the Free Yakutia Foundation. Nikita, welcome. You have 15 minutes. Uh, hello. Uh, hi, my name is Nikita Andreev. I'm representative of Free Yakutia Foundation. I'm a member of Free Nations League. Um, Russian world, or Ruski Mir, uh, came to our land about 400 years ago. They came with powder, guns, and cannons. They killed all men, women, and children that didn't obey them. They forcefully changed our religion. They changed our names. They make us pay heavy taxes. 400 years passed by, but it didn't change much. But instead of poor pellets, we pay now with gold, diamonds, oil, and gas. And that's how the foundation of empire was built. So since then, the main idea of Russian empire is expand by getting new territory, conquer new nations, and exploit natural resources on a new land. Even after Russia, Russian empire fell in 1917, the idea of world domination didn't disappear, but grew up even bigger, Finland, Poland, Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, and other countries, they couldn't resist the power of Soviet war machine. However, it was not enough for the USSR. You remember Cold War days and tension between our countries when USSR was so strong and powerful. In 1991, the whole world felt safer when USSR collapsed. Russia once again lied and played a role of a democratic country, but not for long, and now it's showing a true face. Based on historical facts, it is just a matter of time when we'll see new expansional war. We are all lucky that Russia is corrupted and incompetent, poor, so it's stuck in Ukraine and didn't go any further. Russian-Ukraine war proves that Russia is still hostile. We all remember two Chechen wars that's terroristic act of Kremlin 
with a lot of civilian casualties. And I don't understand why Western countries uh, didn't put heavy sanctions that time, but instead they give cheap loans and access to technologies. And I'm glad that now, finally, that whole world is awakened and sees Russian empire real aggressive face. Okay, now the main idea of my speech. Okay. So while Russia has big territory filled with natural resources, has money for rockets, bombs, battleships, and tanks, Moscow will not hesitate to use it. The solution is easy. No money, no guns. Russia without big territory and endless resources is not going to be dangerous in future again. And if we all want the peaceful future for our children, Russia has to be divided. Um, life in Republic Saham is not easy. Winter time temperature goes down 80 degrees below zero. Just our existence is already a challenge, but living under Russian oppression makes it 100 times harder. Corruption, broken infrastructure, poor people, all mineral extraction taxes and other financing goes to Moscow. Our regional government in Yakutsk are appointed by Putin, so they are all puppets of Kremlin. Moscow wants to control everything, even opposition. So FSB or KGB makes sure that only politicians that loyal to regime can be in charge. We don't have our voices. We don't have real representation in parliament. People don't have power. So Moscow draining all our resources leaving behind broken land and polluted rivers. Northern summer lasts only three months. However, there is catastrophic wildfires every year because there is no money for preventing firework. In 2021, there was a world record wildfires and carbon monoxide pollutions in the Republic of Saha. Did Moscow help us? No. On the local communities, including children and women was uh, fighting the wildfires without any special equipment. Why would they risk their life? And the government didn't defend our rights before Moscow, didn't help with equipment, and there was no medical help either. It is why we don't trust our government. But despite all of that, we are survived and prevailed. We save our culture, our folklore, our language under Russian Empire to, through oppression of Soviet regime. In 1991, we wanted to be free, but Moscow lied to us again and made false promises about democratic federation. And now, thousands of civilians, men, forced to fight in this criminal war. That, that's it, we are done with criminal lies. We go separate way. My people are kind and hardworking. We do respect Mother Nature, and we're ready to be part of the democratic world. We are ready to be, um, to be free from Moscow oppression. Once again, like we did in 1917 and 1991. We wish to have our freedom again, but without support of Western countries, it will be very hard. Um, we want to say thank you for all people that's standing against this evil empire. Big thanks to Ukraine and uh, soldiers and civilians. Uh, you guys are awesome. We want to say thank you for the host for this opportunity to speak up. So nobody even checked my text, what I did. <laughs> so big thank you. And I want to say thank you for audience, for your attention and for your future help and support. And we want to thank you for my comrades. You guys are very bright and brave. Uh, it gives me strength in these dark days. So today, world is big and dangerous for a small nation. It's changing very fast. And I want to make sure that my people have right for a future. And I don't see this future with Russia. So thank you. And I want to finish with wise words of Ronald Reagan. Freedom is a fragile thing, and it's never more than one generation away from extinction. It is not ours by way of inheritance. It must be fought for 
and defended constantly by each generation, for it comes only once to a people. So we are ready for fight for our freedom. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions from the audience? Yes, in the back. There were already discussion today about China and its role in, you know, east of Russia, east from Ural's Mountains. So, you and Yakutia and your friends, your colleagues, what do they think? Do they afraid Chinese occupation if Russian Federation collapses? Um, it is, I would say that we are going to be a Chinese colony, even under the Russian occupation. So if you know, right now we have like our resources not only goes to the Russia, but now it's only also goes to the China. It's uh, drinking water, it's the energy resources, it's the lumber and gas. So do you guys know about Sila Sibiri, right? That's a big gas pipe that um, moves millions and millions gallons of gas from straight from Yakutia to China. So I think that we are already not just colony of Russia, we already as colony of China. But I wanna say that people of Yakutia do not, um, do not agree with China in a lot of things. For example, the Uyghur, Uyghur people of Russian. So it's like we see it as a danger for us. We are, um, we have democratic point of view. So I would say that Western European and American um, moral standards are closer for us, even though we are nearby the China. So in the, in the future, we would love to have cooperation with the whole world, uh, but we are, uh, we are like democracy. So I want to be with Free countries. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes, Gunther. Yeah, this is an excellent speech. I wish three countries like that. And my question is about the neighboring republics. Have you already agreed with them how to uh, arrange the borders and to have a peaceful relation with the other potential states in the future to do the nursing up of the border? Uh, you know, I think that uh, that was the, one of the politics of the Soviet regime when they mixed up the administrative um, borders. So I think they did it in purpose to so local people won't have a peace. But to be honest, we don't have beef with our neighbors. Uh, we just were sitting there <laughs> having, having good conversation and we have nothing to divide, nothing to fi fight for. I'm pretty sure we're going to be good neighbors and after we getting our independence each by, by each differently, we are going to have some kind of alliance. That's uh, my, that's, that's how I see it. Thank you. Is that answer for your question? Yeah, I mean, the, the question is because we have heard about the Asia and Sudan, for example, before. Mm -hmm. And the question is, would you have similar potential conflict lines or you are? No, we don't, we, don't, we have so much land. <laughs> So it's not going to be a problem. Thank you. We'll take just a one minute break to set up our last group of panelists here, and then we'll begin with our next speaker. Thank you.
Okay, our next speaker is Hussein Olapiner. He is a researcher at the Institute for Russian and Eurasian Studies at Uppsala Univer University, and he is also an academic advisor for Central and East European Affairs at the Foreign Policy Institute in Ankara. Um, welcome, Hussein. You have 15 minutes. Thank you, thank you. Um, yeah. <clears throat> It's, it's a long day and uh, very uh, fast uh, moving agenda. Uh, lots of interesting talks and uh, lots of information. Um, um, well, certainly uh, I, there are many ways to organize such events, but uh, I guess I would, I would, after all, I would consider organizing in a different manner. Uh, but I will come back to it. But first of all, of personal uh, relevance. I'm not representing any, any of the nations. I'm born and raised in Turkey. I'm a, I'm a scholar in uh, Ukrainian studies. Uh, my expertise is in Cossacks. Um, and then I study uh, Crimean Tatars. I study Ukrainian-Turkish relations. Um, um, but uh, one personal connection is that um, my great grandmother comes from uh, Circassia. Uh, she was uh, and her family, uh, the survivors of, of uh, uh, the uh, war of the Russians escaped to uh, the Ottoman Empire. Um, so uh, that is one uh, bitter history uh, uh, which we know of and the previous speaker have uh, mentioned, uh, mentioned about it. Um, um, so um, this story is uh, um, changed, time frames change, uh, the narrators are changing, uh, but pretty much the pattern in relation to the uh, Russian Empire, the Imperial Russia, um, then the Soviet Union, then the Russian Federation, kind of uh, carbon copies itself through the time. So we open up different stories of different people who came to in contact with uh, the Russians uh, eventually ended up uh, experiencing uh, similar, similar fates. Um, history tells us uh, that uh, carbon copying of, of fates uh, continuously. So um, this is the end of the day. I don't want to be a, a boring scholar talking technical things, even though I could. Uh, I will plug in just to prove that I can bore you to death before you go home and take a rest. This is my last uh, article, Re-Imperialization of Crimea, uh, Russian Crimean Tatar Relations. So I will not do it. I, I have mercy uh, on you. Uh, but what I will say is uh, some, some uh, observations of <clears throat> today's talks, and um, I would like to maybe uh, energize uh, the efforts and, and thinking uh, in, in, in maybe in different uh, organizational manner. Um, that my uh, observation is that uh, talking of decolonization, we couldn't really uh, observe how uh, that might take place. Um, how should it be like? Um, I think there is more uh, ground there uh, to think about and talk about, to say what, what it is and what it should be like. Um, and second observation is that um, how reconstruction of post-Russian space should take place. Um, listening to some representatives, uh, it sounded very interesting in, in some ways, uh, like um, a representative uh, from Königsberg uh, claiming Prussia, uh, United Siberia. Uh, well, some of uh, um, um, visual thinking is good. Sometimes uh, positivity is interesting, but there should be a, a calculation of um, who is going to claim, where is the legitimacy of that sort of piece of territory claiming independence and how you can go and negotiate that you should be recognized as a political entity eventually in the end of the day. Some other countries has to come and recognize you. Um, uh, so this is one of the issues uh, that we have to uh, think about. Um, another issue is um, uh, I think there is a great uh, 
uh, need for understanding glo global politics, uh, balance of power, uh, and the current stay, uh, standing of the world powers and what they look for, uh, what they are interested in, and within uh, that power game, if there is a space for uh, discussion of uh, new um, liberation of captive nations of uh, Russia, and if there is a space in international politics for new actors to emerge. Um, well, I have ideas about it. I will maybe eventually tell them, but this is one of the issues we have to further consider. Um, um, again, some of the observations uh, that I have had is that um, um, th listening to representatives of nations, um, I couldn't really, uh, some of them get close to giving some concrete uh, steps, points, um, but uh, usually I'm vague, left uh, without much realizing what is there, is that um, they fail to give how much relevance they have vis-a-vis uh, -vis their nations, um, what sector of their own nation they represent, uh, how much they communicate with their uh, own nations, how much their own nation. There are some obvious uh, things that are working even now, like tourism or agriculture. But also, I would like to mention that Kubain will be a very good place for the remote workers because, I mean, uh, if you work remotely, if you earn your money uh, remotely, and there are a lot of people like this nowadays, um, you want to live in a good climate, in a good ecological situation, etc., uh, without, uh, with very good crim criminal level, I mean, very low criminal level. And all of this, Kobania already has. Then, um it can be very very important very uh interesting even for international business not only for remote workers finally i want to say one thing you cannot uh build a silicon valley in alaska but you can make it in california because of climate because of nature because of ecology because of everything like this uh the last thing to mention about the economy uh, is that there are a lot of engineers, a lot of IT specialists, and specialists in general, in, in, in general, right now in Kubania, and a lot of them are living abroad, like me. I'm IT specialist, I'm IT engineer, and I don't live in Kubani. I could live there, I could bring money from other countries to Kubani. Maybe I wouldn't do much, but if there are thousands of people like me, you could imagine it. So let's talk not only about good things, but what happens if Kuban steal parts of Russia? Well, first of all, it will be the continuation of the Russification, because even the liberals don't recognize Kuban as other nations, so-called Russian liberals, because um, they can recognize it about, for example, Chechenians, uh, about Tatarstan, about Dagestan, about even Yakutia, but Kuban for them is just Russians like them. So it will be the continuation of the Russification. What does it mean? That it will destroy all the culture, all the mentality that Kubanians still have even now. And it means that in 15 or 20 years, when Russia decides to attack Ukraine or other country, again, there will be several more millions of soldiers for Russia. The important thing that I'd like to mention, I'm already finishing, that uh, first we really depend on Ukraine. All the scenarios of independence of Kubania depend on the destruction of Russian army in Ukraine. So we really depend on Ukraine. We also need international support Unfortunately, as I mentioned about the genocide, about the Russification, about the uh, repressions that Kubanians had, many Kubanians are not ready to speak by themselves, but they will thankfully receive the international support. Because we need freedom, we need the end of this occupation. Uh, 
and thank you very much for watching. Slava Ukraini, Slava Kubani. If anyone has question, I'm listening. Thank you. Do we have any questions from the audience? Yes, Barbara. Um, your presentation. I just have a really brief, brief question regarding your, um, you know, similarities or not similarities with Ukraine. Um, a lot of older maps actually show Kuban as like a part of Ukraine, and you say like, can you just elaborate on? Do you think that we have something in common? Do you identify as a different nation? If there is something in common, what is this in common? And uh, in general, when you will become independent, do you? want to be uh, somehow affiliated with Ukraine or you just want to be a separate country? Just clarify, like, what's your position in regards to, you know, cooperation and uh, stuff with Ukraine? Thank you so much. Well, here I can say, uh, like, my personal position and the position of the movement when I, when I participate, because they, they, can, they, are, they can be a little bit different. First, um, about my personal position, I believe that Kubanians, Kubanians and Ukrainians are pretty similar, but not the same. It's like, for example, uh, if we speak about, I don't know, maybe United States and Canada. Can we say that it is the same nation? No, but they are pretty similar. If we speak about um, Kibania and Ukraine, first of all, Kibanian Cossacks and Ukrainians have the same native language. It is Ukrainian, actually. We have pretty weird dialect of Ukrainian, but it is Ukrainian language. Second, we have a big part of culture from there, like Kubanian music, it's actually, it's actually Ukrainian music. Uh, but if we speak about some other parts of culture, they are very similar to Circassians or even to Turkic people. So it's uh, like a mix of several cultures. Uh, what I believe, well, I would prefer uh, Kubania be independent, but very close to Ukraine state. Um, but uh, if we speak about official position, well, we want to make a referendum, of course. We want to ask people what do they want. After, well, first of all, we need to um, restruct, rec reconstitute the uh, legal status of Ukraine, of Kubain, sorry, uh, that was before the Russian occupation. After this, we have to ask the people in Kubain after the public discussion, after the debates, etc., what do they want to do? They want to be independent state, they want to be part of Ukraine, or maybe they want to go back to Russia, because we, we cannot uh, say that there are no people who want this. There are some people, but I think that we will be able to um, explain that it is not a good option. So this is the position, like, we will let people to decide, let Kubanian people to decide. But I believe that the future of Kubania is the independent state, part of European Union, part of um, North Atlantic uh, Union, <coughs> and very close uh, to Ukraine. Thank you. I thank think you. we have one last question. Um, OK, thank you. Um, yeah, to me, it's in, in, indeed uh, awkward uh, to listen to this. We are discussing about the imperialization and uh, the fact that Cuban Cossacks emerged where they are is, is basically they served well to the Russian Empire and they were allowed to uh, settle there. Um, so this is not your historical land. It never belonged to you. I, I tell you this as a, a historian and as an expert in, in, in Cossacks. So it's, you know, what, what do you have to say about this? Basically, uh, what you claim is your unique uh, homeland where you want to establish independent Kubania is uh, controlled by partially Crimean Tatars and Caucasian people. Well, and, okay. and, um, and, and for the thanks to uh, some of the Zaporozhian Cossacks turned into Black Sea Cossacks and served Imperial Army very well. They ask for resettling in, in Kuban. This is how you ended up there. Well, um, first of all, uh, if we speak about um, like indigenous population of Kubania, in which, in which century should we stop? 
if you speak about um, so I, I will start with something not so good and then with something better so um, do we stop in the for example 16th century when Kubania was populated by uh, Circassians or do we go a little bit further when it was populated by Alans or do we go that still exists by the way or do we go a little bit further when there were uh, some other populations, etc.? This is the first question. My opinion about all of this, that um, that's why I'm saying Kuban and not, for example, something like Kozakia, because I don't believe that Kuban um, belongs to uh, Cossacks. For example, if you speak about myself, yeah, for the most part, I'm ethnically Ukrainian, but I also have, of course, some uh, Caucasian roots, native Caucasian roots. I also have some uh, Asian roots, um, some Turkish roots, etc. And I think this is like this for the most part of Cubanian population. Uh, compare the um, descendants of uh, Cossacks from the Borisia. Uh, with the um, actual Kubanians, it's not like, I, I mean, it's pretty different nation. I mean, if, even if you see uh, the national costumes, the, main, the national, um, like, um, traditions, etc., it's already different. Also, I always said that uh, the official language, uh, there should be two official languages of the future uh, Kubania, and it is Ukrainian and Cherkessian not only Ukrainian. I also say that, for example, uh, well, sorry, I'm now telling my own opinion, and I'm not sure if it is the same opinion for the movement where I participate, but in my opinion, all the Cherkessian people who was uh, sent to Turkey, to Ottoman Empire in some moment, should have the possibility to go back to Kubania and to get the citizenship of Kubania right at the same day when they actually arrived very fast so Kuban is not Kuban should be independent but it shouldn't be the let's say land of only Kubanian Cossacks it should be the land of Kubanian Cossacks Cherkessians and other nations who always populated Kuban also I uh, would like to invite the Cherkessian people to the dialogue because I think that only with the dialogue we can resolve these questions and only Together, only resolving this question, we could actually get uh, our freedom and become independent from the real occupant, who is Russia now. Thank you this very is my much. Opinion, opinion. Um, thank you. We will move on to our next panelist now, and thank you, Vladimir. Um, our next panelist is Denis Ukrumov. He is a representative of the Free Ingria Socio-Political socio Movement. Welcome, Denis. You have 15 minutes. Спасибо большое. Я буду говорить по-русски для разнообразия и потому что должен же кто-то говорить по-русски на форуме свободных народов пост России. Большое спасибо за то, что предоставилась возможность выразить позицию нашего движения на программу деимпериализации путинской России. Коллеги отправили меня с целью убедить присутствующих офлайн и онлайн в том, что этот взгляд не так однозначный, как принято считать, может быть, в э, странах развитого мира. Ну, приступаю. Э, наш форум проходит в США. Это важно и символично минимум по двум причинам. Э, первое, потому что Соединенные Штаты – это страна, которая поставила принцип человеческого многообразия на службу своему народу, многообразия гендерного, культурного, этнического, какого угодно, и страна в этом преуспела. И, во-вторых, потому что сегодня момент начала движения свободных наций пост-России по пути демократии, прогресса, по пути своего суверенитета зависит в первую очередь от Соединенных Штатов и других развитых стран. Значение, которое США оказывает на весь мир, политическое значение, культурное, переоценить невозможно. Путь к процветанию свободных народов пост России лежит в русле, проложенной вашей страной. 
И помогите нам, пожалуйста, встать на него как можно быстрее, потому что советский имперский вектор приведет нас к катастрофе, которую, от которой не, удастся, которой не удастся избежать никому. Любой серьезный проект имеет в себе ответы на три главных вопроса. Для чего создается проект? Какие методы он использует в достижении своих целей? Кто им руководит и пожинает плоды? Советский Союз, который распался, и это, по мнению господина Путина, является геополитической катастрофой 20 века, создавался исключительно для мирового господства. Исключительно для мирового господства. Он достигал целей при помощи насилия и лжи, управлялся верхушкой коммунистической партии, контролировался госбезопасностью и армией. Выходец из спецслужб единолично управляет Российской Федерацией до сих пор. Насильственно согнанные в социалистический рай народы были друг к другу пришпилены штыками и контролировались госбезопасностью. Ни о каких добровольных волеизъявлениях речь не шла и не могла идти. Империя, как колосс, должна иметь две ноги для устойчивости. На штыки можно опираться, сидеть на них нельзя. Поэтому требуется не только кнут, но и пряник. И вторым фактором, который придавал устойчивость социалистическому колоссу, были некоторые цивилизационные достижения, которые распространялись среди своим гражданам. Они не могут предложить, ни те, они не могут предложить ничего, кроме объедков со стола олигархов. Зато с насилием, как в отношении собственных граждан, так и в отношении ближайших соседей, в Российской Федерации все в порядке. Действующий президент Соединенных Штатов назвал господина Путина убийцей. Это совершенно справедливо. Последний год возглавляемая им Российская Федерация массово убивает людей. Пришло время империю разрушить. Наш взгляд на... Наш, наш взгляд следующий. Имперское государство демонтируется, населяющие его народы освобождаются от диктатуры центральной власти и определяют свою судьбу самостоятельно. Все, причастные к преступлениям путинского режима, становятся объектами правосудия. Территории и попорные права соседних государств восстанавливаются в полном объеме. Создаются и реализуются Программа возмещения причиненного ущерба, налаживание культурных и экономических связей, восстановление добрососедских отношений. Если можно говорить о лозунгах, то нас, наш лозунг звучит приблизительно так. Освобождение, правосудие, примирение, покаяние. И мы уверены, что такой проект не только в интересах граждан России и ее ближайших соседей, но и не в последнюю очередь в интересах Евросоюза и Соединенных Штатов. Перейдем же к главным вопросам. Для чего расформировывается Российская Федерация? Говоря языком бизнеса, для извлечения выгод и прогресса всех участников этого проекта. Я хотел бы прибегнуть к матрице Эйзенхауэра. Что у нас будет, если нечто произойдет? Чего у нас не будет, если это нечто произойдет? И, наконец, что у нас будет, если не произойдет? И чего не будет, если нечто не произойдет? Давайте разберемся, что будет при сохранении Российской Федерации со сменой правящей верхушки или без таковой. Мое мнение следующее. Будет продолжение активной фазы войны с Украиной на неопределенный срок. Будет перманентный ядерный шантаж, будет нарастание людских и экономических потерь. Будут перспективы эскалации конфликта вплоть до ядерной войны, будет вовлечение в него новых сторон, вероятность экологической и гуманитарной катастрофы в Европе, не контролируя эмигра... реконтролируемая миграция в Европу и Соединенные Штаты. Равновероятно также и замораживание конфликта по палестинскому сценарию. Как следствие будет территориальная неопределенность, напряженность между коренными народами и диаспорами беженцев в Европе, будет длительная нестабильность европейской экономики. И это не все. Будет обострение ксенофобии и национализма и в Российской Федерации, и в Европе. Будет использование этих неизменных инструментов различными политиками праворадикальных и ультранационалистических течений. Будет вмешательство во внутренние дела и подрывная работа спецслужб во всех странах, которыми заинтересуются Россия и Китай. Будет 
нарастания раскола старых и новых членов Евросоюза и информационная война. Будет изменение оборонных доктрин и бюджетов стран, граничащих с РФ, усиление и имеющихся наемнических парламентарных, парламентарных организаций, нарастание противоречий в НАТО и ООН, провоцирование кризисов на Ближнем Востоке и в развивающихся странах Африки. И, наконец, будет потеря Российской Федерации, Республики Беларусь, государственного суверенитета и их полный переход под управление Китая. Будет нарастание противостояния Китая и США. Что мы потеряем, чего у нас не будет при сохранении Российской Федерации? Не будет прекращения войны, не будет полной остановки всех боевых действий, не будет определения справедливых размеров репараций и порядка возмещения ущерба, не будет его фактического выполнения. Не будет контроля над ядерным оружием, не будет гарантий их нераспространения, не будет гарантий невмешательства конгломерата России и Китая во внутренние дела суверенных государств. Не будет длительного мира в Европе. Не будет возвращения беженцев и насильственно перемещенных лиц в места их постоянного проживания. Не будет урегулирования межэтнических конфликтов и территориальных споров, демографического, демографического роста коренных народностей. Не будет уменьшения миграции. Не будет от, отказа от политики национального превосходства и эксперс, имперской экспансии, которую фактически проводит Российская Федерация в отношении ближайших соседей. Не будет свободного рыночного развития экономик Украины, Белоруссии и России с привлечением западных капиталов, технологий, современных методов управления государством и так далее. Не будет расширения НАТО и Евросоюза. Не будет укрепления авторитета США, Европы и ООН в глазах мирового сообщества. Не будет консенсуса развитых и развивающихся стран в отношении основных принципов их дальнейшего развития. Что же у нас будет, если Российская Федерация будет расформирована? Будет несколько новых национальных или территориальных государств, строящихся на основе демократических ценностей и ориентированных на сотрудничество с коллективным Западом и друг с другом. Будут новые рынки для внедрения западных технологических гуманитарных инноваций, свободные от коррупционных схем центральной власти. Будет расширение культурного, этнического, гендерного, религиозного многообразия, того самого, что во многом определяет сегодняшнее успех Соединенных Штатов. Будут правовые системы, отвечающие локальным потребностям государств, их внедряющих, и способные гибко подстраиваться под и веление текущего момента. Что же мы потеряем, если расформируется Российская Федерация? Не будет войны в Украине и в Европе. Не будет угрозы военных конфликтов с приграничными и иными государствами. Не будет необходимости развития развитых стран, Оказывать военно-техническую помощь Украине, которая сейчас ощутимо влияет на их экономики и на их обороноспособность. Не будет потока беженцев и криминала из Восточной Европы на Запад. Не будет проникновения туда агентов российских спецслужб. Не будет гражданской войны в Российской Федерации по принципу «все против всех». И, как следствие, не будет перехода всей территории страны под управление Китая. Четыре пункта я обозначил. Если их обобщить... Тезис звучит следующим образом. Если мы не разрушим империю, она разрушит наш мир. Вопрос номер два. Какие методы мы используем для достижения своей цели? О, время меня прижимает. Мы будем пользоваться для этого методами политической борьбы, а их всего пять. Агитация, пропаганда, саботаж, диверсия, террор. Дважды подчеркиваю, мы не террористы, мы никого не призываем к террору, не прибегнем к нему сами и никогда и сделаем все, чтобы его избежать. Но товарищ Путин в своей борьбе за власть прибег к террору самых первых дней. Никому не надо это доказывать. Режим Путина держится на терроре и лжи. Необходимо его снести. Для того, чтобы это сделать, нам нужна помощь в следующем. Путинский режим держится на многолетнем промывании мозгов своему населению. Нам необходимо противопоставить этому промыванию свою программу. Нужна своя агитация, своя пропаганда. При всем уважении ресурсы Христа Гроздева и господина Навального – это ничто по сравнению с ресурсами развитых стран. Если пропагандистскую машину международных информационных 
корпорации хоть как-то ориентировать в этом направлении, результат будет достигнут. И идеи получения свободы и независимости в российских регионах будут укореняться все сильнее и сильнее. В этом случае недостатка в местных активистах, которые будут выполнять акции прямого действия, недостатка не будет. Путинский режим не может контролировать все, и в условиях истощения всех ресурсов точка инициации может возникнуть где угодно. В Татарстане, Башкирии, Туве, в Приморском, Калининграде, где угодно. В этом случае США и коллективный Запад должны немедленно заявить о признании права народов на самоопределение и жестко заявить о готовности любым способом пресечь попытки Путина силовым образом вернуть себе отделившийся регион. Если момент будет упущен, Российская Федерация станет полностью китайской колонией, и такое развитие событий станет невозможным. О, я еще успеваю. Кто, руко... Кто же руководит проектом и пожинает плоды? Это очень простой вопрос. Главный на любом этапе проекта тот, в чьих руках больше инструментов для достижения целей. А сегодня все, все инструменты, все ресурсы находятся в руках развитых стран, поэтому с первую скрипку играют они. Никто не должен проливать свою кровь за нашу свободу. Ни украинцы, ни европейцы, ни американцы. Мы стремимся к свободе и добьемся ее. Когда придет время сражаться, ведущая роль перейдет к нам. И вознаграждение получит каждый, кто принял участие в проекте. По иронии судьбы, сегодня произошли три важных события. Господин Байден знающие, что мистер Путин – это убийца, принял решение баллотироваться на второй срок. Сегодня 30-летний юбилей с того момента, как в Ленинградской области прошел референдум о независимости нашего региона от центральной власти. К сожалению, этот референдум силы не имел. И, наконец, самое важное, сегодня мой день рождения. Я, я хочу сказать от всей души всем, Людям, которые сейчас сражаются за свободу и независимость Украины и всем моим коллегам, кто борется с тиранией в России. Я хочу сказать слова Уинстона Черчилля. Не сдавайтесь. Никогда не сдавайтесь. Никогда. Никогда не сдавайтесь. Благодарю за внимание и прошу задавать вопросы. Yes, in the back. Какие реальные в нынешней ситуации факторы могли бы приблизить разрушение России? С точки зрения Ингерманландии, наше расположение оставляет мало надежд на то, что вспышка произойдет именно у нас. Этот регион не лучшим образом расположен для этого, и за него Путин будет драться когтями и зубами. Но такое уже сегодня, как мне кажется, совершенно возможно, например, в Приморском Калининграде. Дальше сработает эффект домино. Путину придется либо отзывать с фронта какие-то части, чтобы наводить порядок внутри, если он это сделает в одном направлении, это автоматически ослабит его позиции на других направлениях. Возможны и другие варианты, конечно. Как только в центральном аппарате Российской Федерации произойдет какой-то коллапс, я надеюсь, что Всевышний приберет к себе этого мерзавца как можно быстрее и как можно более мучительным способом. В этот момент в Российской Федерации начнется политическая турбуленция, но, к сожалению, это уже фактор объективный, он зависит не от нас, а от нас зависит борьба. Ни в коем случае нельзя упускать ни единой возможности. К сожалению, я считаю, что сделать это мирным путем не удастся. Спасибо. Если есть вопросы, я готов ответить. Спасибо большое. Я, с позволите, тоже. Спасибо большое. Я, если позволите, тоже буду говорить по-русски. Меня зовут Павел Сулендзига. Я представитель народа УДГ. Мой народ живет 
на Дальнем Востоке, в Уссурийской тайге. Я хотел бы вам немного рассказать о коренных малочисленных народов Севера Сибири и Дальнего Востока, защитой прав которых я занимаю, занимаюсь последние годы. Я могу сказать, что на сегодняшний день в Российской Федерации официально 42 коренных малочисленных народа Севера Сибири и Дальнего Востока. Из них 7 народов имеет меньше 1 тысячи по численности, и 12 народов имеют численность меньше 2 тысяч. Мой народ, народ УДГ, это примерно 1600 человек, это всего 4 деревни. И э, я сразу хотел бы сказать, что, конечно же, да, мы должны быть реалистами и четко понимать, ни о каких созданиях своих собственных государств речи идти не может. Такова наша судьба, нам придется быть в составе каких-то государств. Будет ли это Россия, будет ли это а, новые государства, которые образуются на руинах России, но это факт. Да? И поэтому, исходя из этого, конечно же, мы строим в том числе и свою стратегию, и свою тактику. Я могу просто привести пример, что... Мой народ до примерно конца 70-х годов это было 8 этнических групп. Да. Это группы удыгейцев, которые жили по рекам. И одна группа называется Намука, она же, эта группа а, переводится живущая у моря. Да. И вот примерно с конца 30-х годов по конец 70-х годов Осталось из восьми групп осталось только четыре. При этом никакого, скажем так, прямого геноцида, уничтожения моего народа не было. А случилось очень просто. У тех групп четырех, которые исчезли, у них вырубили тайгу. И они просто дальше не смогли заниматься тем, чем они занимались все время, и они вынуждены были уехать со своих мест. Часть из этих групп переселились к нам. Я представляю группу БКНК, то есть это удыгейцы, которые живут на реке Бикин. И вот таким образом наши, вот, мои удыгейцы исчезли. И понимая вот, все, что произошло, уже была, слава богу, возможность у нас осознавать это. Вот история, современная история жизни моего народа, начиная примерно с конца 80-х годов, это борьба за свои собственные территории. Потому что наши территории, у территории, которых, которые остались у четырех групп, это абсолютно богатые природными ресурсами территории, на которых есть золото, лес, уголь, различные биоразнообразия и так далее. И, конечно же, 90-е годы, когда Советский Союз развалился, наши территории стали лакомым пуском вот для этих, как я их называю, варваров от цивилизации. Я могу просто привести несколько примеров по своей, своей группе, группе Бикинг. Нашу территорию сначала отдали южнокорейской компании Hyundai по межправительственному соглашению. Мы долго отбивались, мы отбивались, и в итоге... Нам удалось решить эту проблему, когда я, будучи председателем своей общины, в 90-м году в багажнике машины пробрался на встречу с Ельциным, да, когда он прилетел в Владивосток. Я попросил депутатов Верховного Совета, чтобы они меня привезли на эту встречу, потому что мне отказали во встрече. И мне удалось схватить его за руку во время его приезда. И в итоге он мне назначил встречу, и потом... Он дал поручение Яблокову, я тогда впервые познакомился, познакомился с академиком Яблоковым, который был его советником по экологическим вопросам, и было принято решение отдать нашу территорию нам. И после этого у нас было определенное затишье, но дальше Министерство обороны 
вдруг решила построить дорогу, разрезав нашу территорию ровно наполовину, потому что сказали, что эта дорога важна, потому что отношения с Китаем очень тяжелые в 90-е годы были, и нужна дорога, вторая Хабаровс-находка, которая будет нанести военное значение и так далее. Мы тоже начали с этим бороться, и нам удалось победить. Мы отстояли, мы выгнали военных строителей, и дорога не была построена. Потом золотопромышленники приходили, потому что губернатором стал их представитель. Потом губернатор Даркин решил забрать нашу территорию и издал указание, в котором запретил нам по нашей территории ездить на буранах и на моторных лодках, а предписал нам ездить на оленях, на собаках и, и охотой заниматься луками и стрелами. А так как мы нарушаем это, значит, мы нарушители. За что нас нужно наказывать? Нам удалось и от него отбиться. Я почему рассказываю это, вот эту историю? Потому что понятно, что такая маленькая численность нашего народа, она, я думаю, вряд ли позволила бы нам победить вот в этих битвах, если бы не поддержка. Нам удалось обратиться к местным жителям, которые понимали ценность э, Бикина, ценность нашей тайги. Нас поддержали угольщики, которые приезжали на отдых к нам. Нас поддержали ученые, экологи, правозащитники и так далее. Поэтому э, нам удалось отстоять вот, малым числом. Я к чему об этом говорю, э, я потом скажу, да, вот, э, сделаю вывод. У нас был случай, когда, когда мы вели переговоры по нашей территории с правительством Приморского края. Один из чиновников на, на, на этой встрече заявил, а вы знаете, что Сулинзига сейчас просит реку Бикин, а дальше он хочет захватить пол Приморья, да, что ни в коем случае не надо ничего им отдавать. На что я ему сказал, вы знаете, если вы нам поможете захватить пол Приморья, да, то я вам половину еще отдам вам лично. Потому что понятно, как, как мы можем захватывать только силой. У нас всего в нашей общине 800 человек. То есть они придумывали разные да, причины, уловки, чтобы ничего нам не отдавать, не отдавать нашей территории. Один ученый договорился до того, что он сказал, что вообще у дегейцев в Верховьях Бикина никогда не охотились, никогда не жили, что впервые на Верховье Бикина пришли русские староверы. А, на самом деле это была ложь, да, у Дегейтс там всегда жили, просто потом пришли русские староверы, и они там вместе уживались. Но на что я ему сказал, да, что если вы хотите да, рассматривать, рассматривать вопрос от, отдачи нам наших территорий с исторической точки зрения, я готов, да, и мы готовы, ну, у Дегейтс готовы, но тогда с исторической точки зрения отдавайте пол Приморья, потому что наши стойбища, по всему Приморскому краю были, пока вы не пришли. И поэтому э, э, вот в таких условиях нам приходилось бороться. Я могу привести еще один пример, когда меня вот на этих встречах обвиняли в национализме, в шовинизме, еще в чем-то. И э, мы придумали даже такой ход, когда у меня в моем национальном совете было два депутата украинца, Вознюк и Писарец. Возник у него жена Удыгейка, да, он был депутатом избран, и мы ездили на эти совещания, я молчал, выступали они, да, и где заявляли о том, что отдавайте территорию удыгейцам. И это сработало, потому что обвинить их в удыгейском национализме невозможно, да, они не удыгейцы, они просто требуют, чтобы удыгейцам отдали землю. И... Я к чему вот это говорю, да, рассказываю эти истории, потому что в такой же ситуации, как мой народ, находятся вот эти 42 коренных малочисленных народа. Они очень малочисленны на своих территориях, даже полпроцента нет от общей численности всех территорий и так далее. И поэтому, естественно, да, даже если будут демократические выборы и голосования, то есть они никуда не будут избраны. То есть подавляющее большинство избирателей, они их не выберут. 
И поэтому это большая проблема, которую необходимо решать, да, которую необходимо находить возможности решения этой проблемы. И э, я могу сказать, что мне кажется, что при решении вопросов по коренным малочисленным народам да, можно взять либо опыт Советского Союза, который потом перенял Китай по автономиям, создание автономии, и э, опыт Соединенных Штатов и Канады в создании специальных, либо если в Канаде, провинций, да, либо в Соединенных Штатах резервации. Я э, писал диссертацию по резервации, она очень хорошо изучала этот вопрос. Есть много да, различий. Но самое главное, что в настоящее время мы знаем, что создание резервации – это трагическая история на странице, э, трагическая страница в истории США. Но в настоящее время необходимо признать, что резервации играют положительную роль в вопросах самоуправления и многих других вопросах, связанных с коренными народами. Конечно, здесь есть очень много проблем, но... Э, этот опыт, мне кажется, он вполне возможно применим с учетом наших реалий с коренными малочисленными народами. Я хотел бы также сказать по поводу вопросов деколонизации. Мне кажется, что этот вопрос на сегодня в Российской Федерации на повестке, если не номер один, то номер два точно. Потому что то, что сейчас происходит да, в Российской Федерации, то, что сейчас Россия творит в Украине, да, то, что в целом, как себя ведут россияне и так далее, становясь преступниками и убийцами, мне кажется, очень многие не задают себе вопроса, почему это происходит, а если задают и отвечают на него, вопрос деколонизации для многих людей стоит на каком-то непонятном месте, потому что, по моему мнению, никто не понимает, что такое колонизация, деколонизация, вообще как с этим жить и что с этим делать. Но, по моему мнению, этот вопрос, почему он очень важен, потому что к тому, к чему пришло российское общество, российское государство, это все начинается со лжи и обмана. И первое на повестке, да, ложь и обман, это как Российская Федерация собирала, захватывала все земли, которые принадлежали нашим народам. Это вопросы колонизации. И если этот вопрос не поднимать, это получается, будет продолжаться такой же обман. Да, это означает, что Российская Федерация там, или русский народ будет опять ходить по тому же кругу. И поэтому, мне кажется, вопрос деколонизации – это вопрос очень важный, его необходимо обсуждать, находить пути решения деколонизации и, исходя из этого, конечно же, строить вот, политику в отношении будущего коренных народов. В данном случае я, конечно же, имею в виду не только коренные малочисленные народы, но и все коренные народы России. Я как-то написал, да, была статья, к сожалению, в Российской Федерации, никто на эту статью не обратил, и эту статью написал ученый, он себя называет русским националистом. Он, кстати, был одним из тех, кто написал донос на вот, одного из лидеров поморов в Архангельской области. И вот он разразился статьей в средствах массовой информации в России, эта статья была его ответом на решение Государственной Думы Российской Федерации, которая Госдума приняла в ответ на принятие украинского закона о коренных народах. Вы помните, да, в прошлом году украинский парламент принял закон о коренных народах Украины. После этого Путин выступил, он назвал этот закон фашистским, при том, что он показал себя абсолютно безграмотным, да, ну, он, каковым он является. И Госдума дальше принял, приняла постановление, где тоже назвала этот закон фашистским, плохим и так далее, и так далее. Почему русских не признали коренными народами в Украине. И вот этот русский националист, он Путина решил не трогать, понятно, 
почему, но он решил тронуть Госдуму, и он написал эту статью, в которой пишет, что вы, депутаты, не совсем плохо соображаете. Зачем вы требуете, чтобы русский народ был признан коренным? По международному законодательству коренные народы – это дикари, это дикие народы. Да. И дальше он говорит, это такие как Чукчи, да, там, а, еще он назвал несколько представителей коренных народов, он назвал представителей коренных народов Амазонки, там еще в других странах. Он говорит, это вот они коренные народы, а мы же люди цивилизованные, мы народ цивилизованный, мы не коренные народы да, по международному законодательству. И вот это вот э, так называемый великорусский шовинизм, да, нацизм, который сейчас Россия творит в отношении украинцев, это вот сегодняшнее лицо, к сожалению, России. Thank you very much, Pavel. Do we have any questions from the audience? Можно я буквально два слова еще? Хорошо. Я, 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 вы знаете, вот почему я рассказывал как раз вот по поводу того, вот тех историй по поводу моего народа. Мне кажется, что сегодня Всем представителям, ну я не знаю, кто-то, может быть, не хочет называть себя россиянином, но из России важно понять, что у нас есть два момента, которые нас объединяют. Да? Первое – это мы хотим, чтобы путинский режим исчез, был снесен или еще как-то, в общем, чтобы он исчез. И второе – это победа Украины. И мне кажется, да, что вот эти два момента, которые нас объединяют, на сегодняшний день представители движений коренных народов, российской оппозиции, те, кто там называют себя либералами или, может быть, э, э, патриотами России, но против путинского режима, я считаю, очень важно объединяться для того, чтобы вот на плат этой платформе, да, потому что если не объединившись, мы так и будем, к сожалению, да, в большей степени говорить и, наверное, пытаться рождать какие-то проекты, но это нас не приблизит, не приблизит к нашей цели. Спасибо. Поблагодарить Украину за то, что это было первым государством в мире, которое заговорило о правах и защите как коренных малочисленных 